Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thanks very much for joining this conference today. We are very pleased that we are now able to organize this whole conference with the theme of one country, two system and cross-border legal harmonization today. I'm Zhao Yun, the head of the Department of Law. Uh, today, I'm sure that all of you have known that the topic itself is very timely and very meaningful. As this year is the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR. Much has changed in the past two decades, and we have witnessed even closer economic relationship between mainland China and Hong Kong. That it will be most important to explore issues that are related to the process of legal integration, harmonization, and convergence. Let me first of all invite our Dean, Professor Fu Hualing, to give the welcoming remarks. Professor Fu is Professor of Law and holder of the Waring Chan Professorship in Human Rights and Responsibilities. He holds an LLB from Southwestern University in China, an MA from University of Toronto, and a Doctor of Jurisprudence degree from Oscar Hall. Professor Fu's current research focuses on the rights of human rights, lawyering in China, and its implications for political and legal reform in China. The, the uh, politics of anti-corruption enforcement popular justice and a critical reassessment of the rule of law reform in China in the past four decades. His other research areas include the constitutional status of Hong Kong, in particular central local relationship in a Hong Kong context and national security legislation. Let's welcome Professor Fu. Good morning. Um, welcome to, the, to uh, our first uh, face to face, uh, face to face uh, in person conference. Uh, we've been waiting for almost uh, two or three years. So, so uh, thank you so much uh, for your participation. We decided not to have hybrid uh, mode, so that uh, you cannot watch the video on your pajamas. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Um, for joining us um, this Saturday morning. The Greater Bay Area, the GBA, is a, is a great concept. It is also very significant. So significant that um, Hong Kong's future in part would uh, rely on its success. Just imagine the power of the mega cities, the manufacturing, technological, financial, uh, entertainment capacities in, in this region, our international connectedness, the size of population and the uh, market. The faculty with our two centers are uh, delighted to host this uh, event uh, to mark this special occasion. This year is the 25th anniversary of um, Hong Kong's reunification. So why this conference? So we have, you must have attended many GBA related conferences, uh, I personally attend probably a, a, a dozens of such conferences. What, what, why we do it? It's one of the first we did. We think we could make a unique academic contribution uh, to uh, uh, do some heavy lifting if possible uh, with all the experts and the practitioners uh, today to uh, 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 share their knowledge and uh, insight. Here, let me just uh, uh, raise three uh, questions. Now, first, there should be a common market uh, in the EU term uh, economic community in this region. To realize the huge potential uh, in this area, there must be common market in goods, service, capital, person, and I would add uh, information that can move freely uh, without undue restrictions and prohibitions. But the common market will exist in a unique political context, that is one country, two system. How to build a common market within the framework? One country, two system necessitates divergency. A common market demands convergency. So is it oxymoron? Second, there should be common legal rules. 
for a common market to exist, there would be a need for common legal rules and protocols to facilitate the movement. Otherwise, the transaction costs, the coordination costs would be extremely high to defeat the purpose of the GBA. We have a three set of legal rules and the practices. Uh, almost everything is different. Uh, then which rules would prevail in this particular region? Third, I would argue that the best legal rules would prevail and will be applied in GBA. The question is, would Hong Kong be absorbed into the mainland OPEC? And we have to adjust our rules to the mainland standard. Or alternatively, can we uplift the legal standard in the entire region um, um, uh, to Hong Kong's existing standard? I recall a, a very senior official, I think his, it was a uh, Han Zhen, our um, uh, uh, vice prime minister in the central government, said at the very beginning of the GPA uh, initiative that international standard would apply in the GBA area. That's the first point. Second point, Hong Kong standards are international standard. I was expecting the third statement, if you carry the argument to its logical end, that Hong Kong standard would apply in the GPA area. He didn't say that expressly. No. Um, before we reach a full-fledged legal harmonization, as our, the title of a, a, a conference states, um, there are three options, which I will go through very quickly. First is arbitrage, right? There will be juris, uh, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage, foreign shoppings, rule shoppings, uh, uh, given the diversity so that the best system in the region would, uh, would survive. Or, or uh, after the competition, right? So we could argue arbitration would come to Hong Kong because we're very good at arbitration. Maybe maybe a certain type of divorce would go to Shenzhen. There's one. There's some would argue that uh, the Chinese law is more friendly to to wives. Maybe that's the case. Um, so so we can't go on and on. So so to, to our now so the, uh, uh, so legal regulatory competition. Um, uh, that of course creates certain chaos, right? Um, especially in the, uh, uh, the one country to system context. The second option, of course, is intergovernment coordination to enhance cooperation, which we have been doing for the past uh, few decades. So uh, um, the government from different uh, regions would sit down to negotiate what is called the arrangements and a wide ranging uh, and socioeconomic uh, uh, issues with the, the coordination of central government. The third option is a sort of a, a federal or uh, central arrangement at the space between convergency and the divergency. Where convergency may be the uh, trend going forward, there are objective reasons to make a distinction and the important substantive differences will remain but at the same time, unless there are clear and unconditional prohibitions of convergency, it is always possible to locate areas where common principles, rules can be identified and applied in the GPA. Today, we, we have uh, our leading experts, researchers, and practitioners to share their thoughts on those cutting edge issues that continue to excite us. Let's discover what is possible and where the limits lie. So thank you and hope you enjoy the presentations and discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Dean Professor Fu has given us a very clear pictures about organizing these major events today. Uh, as he has just mentioned that this is the first physical conference uh, after, the, well, during this pandemic era. And we are very pleased that we have already picked up a few topics for discussion in this specific uh, uh, period of time. 
we know that uh, GBA is very important, and also, of course, uh, legal integration, economic integration become more and more important. The cross-border legal relationship is increasingly important issue for us to discuss. Uh, but at the same time, when we look at the situation in Hong Kong, we are looking at quite a lot of issues about the rule of law. We need to look at the development of rule of law in Hong Kong and how about the situation in our neighboring countries. So today, uh, we are very honored to have uh, uh, President uh, C.M. Chan, President of the Law Society of Hong Kong, despite his busy schedule, was able to join us and give his opening speech today. Uh, President Chang is a president of the Law Society of Hong Kong. He is qualified to practice as a solicitor in Hong Kong and England and Wales. He is also a civil celebrant, registered financial planner, and chartered tax advisor. Mr. Chang is a general counsel of investment company, a part-time consultant of a local law firm, and the head of the Center for the Law of Law of the Hong Kong Policy Research Institute. He currently serves on a number of statutory bodies, including the Land Survey Disciplinary Board Panel, the Law Reform Commission, the Trade and Industry Advisory Board, and the Advisory Body on Outcome-Related Fee Structures for Arbitration. He is also an external examiner of the Department of Professional Legal Education of the University of Hong Kong, and the School of Law, City University of Hong Kong. So now let's warm welcome Ms. Chang, please. Professor Fu, distinguished, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is really my honor to be here this morning. Uh, like uh, Professor Fu said, this is actually a very long time for me to attend a physical uh, uh, seminar or conference. Um, today's topic, of course, is a very important one. Um, one country, two systems, and cross-border legal harmonization. President Xi Jinping uh, address on the 1st of July, 2022, um, at the meeting celebrating the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR, and also, of course the uh, inaugural ceremony uh, of the sixth term government of the Hong Kong SAR was a momentous one. President Xi explained the success of the innovation concept of one country, two systems. It serves not only the interests of Hong Kong, but also the whole nation. The, this pioneering policy initiative is supported not only by the populace in China, but also the international community. President Xi stressed that there is no reason to change the one country, two systems policy, and that it must be adhered to in the long run. When there are different views on what is to happen after 2047, there's nothing more reassuring than such clarity of position stated in an official address by the president himself. Hong Kong SAR, of course, is the only city in China that adopts a common law system. President Xi acknowledged in his address that Hong Kong's previous laws, including the practice of the common law, have been maintained and developed. He expressed clear support of the efforts of the Hong Kong SAR to improve its presence as an international financial, shipping and trading center, to keep its business environment free, open and regulated, and to maintain the common law so as to expand and facilitate its exchanges with the world. If I remember correctly, uh, President Xi mentioned the common law twice in his speech on the 1st of July. This is most reassuring for uh, uh, the legal sector. President Xi's support of the common law system in Hong Kong came as a strong and firm reassurance. It is significant that we can become confident that Hong Kong will remain the only common law jurisdiction in our country under the one country, two system principle in the foreseeable future and possibly beyond 2047. Notably, 
What President Xi has said evidently shows the inherent distinctiveness of the one country, two system. Indeed, the coexistence of the civil law system practiced in China and the common law system practiced in Hong Kong are underlined in the basic law. The continual practice of the common law system in Hong Kong is firmly entrenched in the basic law. For example, Articles 8, Article 18 of the basic law, which preserve the common law after the handover. Article 84 is also very important. It provides that the courts of Hong Kong may refer to the precedence of other common law jurisdictions after the handover. In addition, there are notable socio-economic and legal developments across the border. It is therefore encouraging to see closer legal cooperation and harmonization. In point of fact, the process of legal harmonization is embraced again in the basic law. Article 95 states that Hong Kong may, through cons consultations and in, in accordance with law, maintain judicial relations and uh, with the judicial organs of other parts of the country. The following exemplifies the process of harmonization. The first one, the mainland judgments in civil and commercial matters, bracket reciprocal and enforcement bill, was passed in LegCo just last week. The ordinance provides for the enforcement in Hong Kong of judgments in civil and commercial matters given in the mainland, and for facilitating and recognition on and enforcement in the mainland of such judgments given in Hong Kong. The ordinance is a big step towards a more comprehensive mechanism on recognition and enforcement of judgments. It will reduce the need for relitigation of the same disputes in both places and offer better protection uh, to the party's interests. It will also enhance Hong Kong's competitiveness as a regional center for international and legal dispute resolution services. Apart from the passage of the mainland judgments in civil and commercial matters bill mentioned just now, there are other recent developments which are equally encouraging. Number one, passage of the mainland judgments in matrimonial and family cases, bracket reciprocal recognition and enforcement bill in May 2021. This bill establishes mechanisms in Hong Kong for the registration of specified orders in judgments given by mainland courts in matrimonial or family cases for the recognition of mainland divorce certificates and for facilitating parties in their applications to mainland courts for the recognition and enforcement of judgments given by Hong Kong courts in matrimonial family cases. So that's the matrimonial side of it. The second one I want to mention is the passage of the Arbitration Bracket Amendment Bill in 2022, uh, 2021. The main object of this bill was to amend the arbitration ordinance to fully implement the supplemental arrangement concerning mutual enforcement of arbitral awards between the mainland and Hong Kong. The supplemental arrangement enhances the special role of Hong Kong as the first jurisdiction outside the mainland where parties to arbitral proceedings are able to apply to the mainland courts for interim measures. If their arbitration proceedings are seated in Hong Kong, this is really advantage to our arbitration practitioners, making Hong Kong a unique place in the world. The third one I want to mention is the signing of the record of meetings and signing mutual recognition of and assistance to insolvency proceedings between the courts of the mainland and Hong Kong. That's again in May 2021. The arrangement fosters further legal cooperation between two places. Liquidators from Hong Kong may now apply to the mainland courts for recognition of insolvency proceeding in Hong Kong and bankruptcy administrators from the mainland may apply to the high court in Hong Kong for recognition of bankruptcy proceedings in the mainland. The implementation of the measure to allow wholly owned Hong Kong enterprises registered in Tianhai Cooperation Zone to use Hong Kong law as the choice of applicable law when they enter into civil and commercial contracts. This is an even more advanced, uh, in innovative uh, uh, measure. The Department of Justice uh, is seeking, as I understand, to further expand this measure to the whole of the Greater Bay Area. 
so as to contribute to the building of a law-based and internationalized business environment in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, just like uh, Professor Fu mentioned, I'm very optimistic that Hong Kong will become the legal norm in the Greater Bay Area, whether in the field of dispute resolution or deal making. Hong Kong plays a pivotal role in the national development of, of China. The 14th five-year plan of national economic and social development and the long range of objectives through the year 2035 continue to support Hong Kong's four traditional centers, namely International Financial Center, International Transportation Center, International Trade Center, and a Center for International Legal and Dispute Resolution Services in the Asia Pacific region. These are the old four centers. And to develop four new emerging centers, namely International Aviation Hub, an International Innovation and Technology Center, a Regional Intellectual Property Trading Hub, and a hub for arts and cultural exchanges between China and the rest of the world. As legal professionals, uh, professionals, we are a service providers to all these eight centers. Again, I see great future for the legal sector in Hong Kong. The ongoing Greater Bay Area development is of course a key development strategy, which demonstrates legal harmonization as it seeks to deepen cooperation among Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau, utilizing the advantages of the three places. The Greater Bay Area is the only Bay Area in the world that has three legal systems in place. Consistent with these national policy and initiatives, Hong Kong is an ideal hub equipped with sophisticated legal service capabilities required for multi-jurisdictional projects in the Greater Bay Area. There will be a huge demand for legal services uh, in these areas. At present, there are roughly 12 thousand solicitors in Hong Kong. On top of that, uh, uh, 1,500 barristers. But don't forget, we have roughly 1,500 registered foreign lawyer working in Hong Kong, even under COVID. And they provide a one-stop shop of legal services uh, to the uh, business community. I'm sure that in the discussion panels of this conference later today, the speakers will share their valuable insights in their respective fields. There will no doubt be inspirational exchanges of views and dialogues. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished speakers. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, President Chan, for your enlightening opening, uh, opening speech. Uh, President Chan has mentioned about the advantages of the city of Hong Kong in being the only common law jurisdiction in China and has enjoyed unique positions in China. So we are grateful for his insightful observations on the cross-border legal relationship and the agreements that have been reached between mainland China and Hong Kong. So thank you. And now we will pass the floor to the chair of the first session on cross-border data transfer, uh, Professor Angela Zhang, please. Yeah, please. Okay, I'm excited to be back to this room. My name is Angela Zhang. I'm the director of the Philip K. Chuan Center for Chinese Law. I haven't been back to this room for three years. So I'm very delighted to chair today's panel on data, cross-border data transfer. And we have an all-star panel, not including me. Um, so first we have um, on, on my left-hand side, Chen Li. She's a legal director um, leading a commercial legal team supporting Microsoft's China business operation and new development. She provides legal advice and develops creative solutions to complex issues in new businesses, lending in China, cloud services, software licensing, and marketing strategies. Um, and next to me is Richard, Richard Bird. He is the head of the Freshfield IP commercial and practice group in Asia with deep experience in commercial and transactional projects and contentious IP matters. And on my right hand side, we have Mark Parson, who's a well recognized expert in data, um, in data practice. And he's now heading Hogan Level's Asia Pacific regional, uh, regulatory practice. 
And uh, last but not the least, uh, we have another leading female practitioner here, Sandra Liu, who is now the global head of privacy from the London Stock Exchange Group, with many years of experience in global data privacy compliance. Sandra, are you our alumna? Turn it on. Yes, um, I'm actually a graduate from this university law faculty. So you got your LB from our faculty? Yes, so well, I'm very glad to be back. Oh, fantastic. Welcome back. What year did you graduate if you don't mind? We wouldn't I, gauge your age, I don't do worry. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A personal data, a good point. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have our panel have an hour and a half. And so we have plenty of time to walk through many uh, interesting questions here. Um, we will, uh, instead of doing presentation like you usually see in this type of um, uh, conference, we would do just short Q&A um, because I aim, aim it to be quite, uh, want to have more interaction between me and the speakers and also with you guys. So you'll reserve plenty of time for Q&A. So think about the question that you might have uh, along uh, our discussion. Now, data obviously is one of the hottest topics these days. And if you follow this area like I do, um, you will see an explosion of uh, things happening in, in the data practice. Um, it's just impossible to keep track of it. And in fact, I am thinking about introducing a new course. I am introducing a new course, not thinking about it. I'm doing it next semester on data pri uh, privacy and, and uh, regulation in China. So just doing my promote here if you're interested in this uh, area of practice. Um, now. But instead of spending a whole semester talking about this topic, I'm actually going to start by giving Richard a very challenging class, okay? You don't have a whole semester to walk us through the whole regulatory landscape like I do, but I'll give you five minutes. And you describe to us, uh, you know, what has happened with the regulatory landscape in relation to data practice, and particularly for today's topic, regard to cross-border data transfer, and particularly in relation to Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Okay, you can take off your mask if you. I, I may, I may uh, do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, thank you very much. There's obviously a lot of legwork to do in that uh, first question. I'll do my best to get through it in the next um, five minutes or so. Okay, I'm having a clock. Um, let, let me know when I get to two minutes. Um, it's obviously a very complex topic, uh, and there's many different facets to it. There's also a lot of terminology uh, that people may be unfamiliar yeah. with. Uh, so we have critical information infrastructure, uh, which is basically networks and systems, uh, essentially that are of material importance to national security uh, or national economic interests and the public interest generally. Uh, also important data, which is essentially data. Um, this is again of material importance to national security, uh, national economic interests, et cetera. There is some overlap between those two terms. Uh, formally, they are separate, uh, but in terms of the sort of policy themes that they encapsulate, uh, there's obviously some, some overlap there, which you'll see. And then we have personal data, which I guess people are more familiar with. Um, the cross-border data transfer regime touches on all three of those things. So CII, uh, critical information infrastructure, important data, and personal data. And there's various routes to get data out of China, uh, which are regulated to a greater or lesser extent. So transfers of any amount of personal data by an operator of CII, that has to go through a security assessment process uh, and receive the approval of the cybersecurity administration. Um, similarly, transfers of important data, any amount of important data, have to go through the same process, uh, also get approval of the Cybersecurity Administration. Now, when it comes to personal data, up to specified thresholds, and we'll look at what those thresholds are in just a moment, and they're quite low, but up to specified thresholds, it is possible to transfer data under a data transfer agreement, essentially. Uh, there are model clauses, which will become mandatory once they come into effect. They've been published in draft, but they're not yet in effect. Uh, that said, the basic obligation to have a data transfer agreement is in force already. I think the appearances are it's not really being enforced, but it is in force. Um, and then um, there is a system called certification, quite similar to the uh, concept of binding corporate rules under the GDPR, 
um, for transfers of data within corporate groups. Again, that system isn't really in effect yet, and the certification bodies have not yet been appointed. But then above those thresholds, again, you need to go through the security assessment process and get the approval of the cybersecurity administration. So those thresholds are of critical importance. Uh, and as I say, frankly, they are quite low. So the first threshold is um, the holding or the processing of personal data of more than a million individuals. I think anyone familiar with China will realize that's a very low number. Um, then there is, and, and, and by the way, that, that applies regardless of how much of that data you're actually transferring. So if you merely hold that quantity of data, you have to go through the security assessment process. And that's been enforced since the 1st of September. Then there is uh, the cumulative transfer of the personal data of more than 100,000 individuals, uh, essentially in the previous two years. So from the 1st of January of the year before last. Or the transfer of the sensitive personal data of 10,000 individuals, again, over the same sort of two-year counting period. And again, that's already in force from the 1st of September. Now, that, that security assessment process um, is still very unfamiliar to people. Um, applications are just being made for the first time now. We don't really have any basis to anticipate what the outcomes will be or exactly how the process is going to work. Uh, but formally, it's a two-stage process. There's an initial review, uh, a formalities review, essentially, by provincial cybersecurity administration, then a more substantive review by uh, national CAC in Beijing. It will look at things like uh, the regulatory environment in the destination country, um, the security protecting the data, whether that's adequate, whether it conforms to Chinese national standards, um, also generally the risks of leakage of data or unauthorized access, that sort of thing. Exactly how it's going to work in practice, we don't know. Um, formally, it's meant to be completed within 12 weeks. Again, we don't know if it's going to take that length of time. Uh, there is, uh, as you would expect, some ability for the authorities to extend in complicated cases, and we'll see how long it actually takes. Well, that's the, that's the sort of formality. Now, um, I said the system's in effect since the 1st of September. It more or less is. Um, there's a grace period to the 1st of March next year, and that applies to companies that were already transferring data on the 1st of September and pass any of those thresholds. So if you held the personal data of more than a million individuals and you had transferred any data before the 1st of September, you have to rectify by the 1st of March. Not really clear what that means, but it's understood based on uh, commentary from officials that essentially have to go through the assessment process, get approval by the 1st of March next year. Same if you pass the 100,000 threshold or the 10,000 threshold. You're giving me the side eye. Yeah. yeah. Hand it up. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's the essence of it. And there's lots of questions that arise from that, which we, I'm sure we'll sort of unpick over the next hour and a half. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I don't know how much you get it. I think after this five minutes uh, preview, you probably still need to take my class. Um, so I remember last year when China promulgated its uh, personal information protection law, um, the Wall Street Journal ran a big headline that you know, China promulgated the, the world's strictest um, uh, data privacy law. And obviously China is not the first one to have um, data rules. I mean, EU is a very big player. Um, one, one big question I, I want to pose to this, uh, this panel is, you know, do, do you see China as an exceptional player when it comes to data regulation? What, what features do you find is particularly distinct to China, um, you know, compared with other jurisdictions? Yeah, Mark? Sure, and I'll, I'll unmask myself a bit. So um, now, now Richard did a great job of presenting a very challenging um, regulatory environment. I, I would just like to pick out a few factors of what he's described that I think are relatively unique. And I see this from the perspective of, you know, we're helping uh, clients with security assessments. We're um, facing those challenges very, very directly. I think there's a few things. One is, as Richard mentioned, not just personal data. Um, we have this concept of important data, and that is a work in progress in terms of what that actually means. Uh, we have industry regulators, which are meant to be cataloging categories of data by sensitivity. Um, and again, it's not necessarily personal data. So we have that dimension. We also have the dimension of uh, cyber sovereignty. And I think we can't, we can't avoid this issue is that China's 
uh, direction with PIPL, cybersecurity law, data security law, isn't just focused on, uh, and as much as PIPL looks a lot like GDPR, you have to recognize that actually many of the provisions in there, the way they've been written with tweaks from GDPR, um, the way they're being uh, interpreted, uh, reflect China's vision of ensuring that its cyberspace is sovereign and secure. That, that's another dimension which we don't have with GDPR. So when we bring our GDPR compliance tools uh, to these exercises, which is what we're doing, they can help can you us. Explain what is GDPR? So GDPR is the European Data Protection Law. And in many ways, it's sort of the gold standard of data protection law internationally. And it's got a long history. It, it's rooted in European human rights law. And so the, the difference here then is, is, again, PIPL looks a lot like GDPR. You hold the provisions up. You know, Article 3 of GDPR looks a lot like Article 3 of PIPL. And um, you know, because of that, there's a temptation to see PIPL as China's GDPR. And it is to an extent. But the policies underlying it are different. And that's why when we come on to topics in more detail, like security assessment and so forth, you're going to see there's some differences there. You just can't apply the GDPR playbook. So I think those are some of the main um, differences that, that I see with the Chinese environment versus what we're sort of used to here in Hong Kong internationally. Sandra, you, you have anything to add? Well, I think it's very difficult to be the second speaker. You know, a lot of impact <laughs> upon. Um, uh, I think um, to me, um, um, the most difficult part of it is um, to ensure compliance because a lot of it is uh, the law come out and without guidance, without rules, and without specific detail. So um, let me play a little bit different. We do have a lot of rules. Um, I mean, but <laughs> but um, uh, as how to ground it for implementation, it's not particularly clear because um, just imagine the um, um, uh, cross-border um, uh, uh, security assessment measure uh, is set to be implemented very soon and uh, given the their short time frame and at the same time the online portal is not ready. So um, the template, how it has to be done, uh, the details, etc, the approval process, the operationalization, not particularly uh, transparent to a lot of the organizations. So um, I wouldn't say it's unique in the sense that uh, data protection is actually not just unique uh, in challenging for implementation just in China, but also in many jurisdictions in the EU, etc. The cross-border data transfer uh, in the EU regime currently, uh, strands, etc., uh, to ensure that there's a uh, adequate protection for the recipient country receiving the personal data is actually very challenging as well. So I wouldn't describe it as unique as such, but when it comes to the um, uh, um, all together, it's not just on personal data, but also on data itself as well. So, um, but when we look at the regime in EU, we do have a data act um, that is going to be um, uh, in, um, out very soon and then, but what will be in that act is that will, be, will it be the same as uh, what we see in China? Actually, we don't have a very clear view at all at the moment. So I think uh, all in all, um, it will be very difficult to say, definitely um, it is a very unique, but the implementation process, the focus of the government might be slightly different from what we see in other jurisdictions. Right. Yeah. So uh, Mark and Sandra already mentioned some challenges um, when it comes to data enforcement. So uh, uh, let me turn to trends. Um, you know, as, a, as an in-house expert, with so many rules in place this year, what, what do you think that are the biggest challenges facing companies with compliance this day? Yeah, thank you for your invitation, Angela. I think why we are here, because we are Microsoft, we are a global service provider, cloud global service provider. So I think most important is, um, as uh, Richard and also Mark and Andrew just mentioned, right? So there's um, unclear regulation and uh, uh, implementation rules is not issued, um, especially for the important data. And also for if you, you, you didn't meet the requirements for security assessment like by CC, you need to maybe choose the uh, SCC, the standard contract of course, uh, can be, not be issued. The final draft had not been issued. 
And if you go through the security certification, the implementation rule has not been issued. So there's a lot of unclear ambiguity. If you want to uh, choose one of the transfer uh, mechanism when you do the cross-border data transfer. So we always receive a lot of customers inquiry uh, as cloud service provider, right? So can you help us to do the security assessment? Um, is there any information you can provide to us? I think the most challenging part re response to your question. Most challenging part is for most of the company, uh, whatever they are a uh, multinational company or they have a very big um, basis uh, operation in China, or maybe they are domestic company, they go global, right? They are, they are also using very a large amount of global uh, cloud service, provide, service provider services. So they are all thinking about how I can com comply with this law. So the lack of the resources and knowledge, right? So their internal legal counsel, they may not um, e equipped with the full knowledge. They need to consult with Richard, they need to consult with Mark, right? So get some professional uh, advice. So and they, they also, they are IT staff and they don't have a lot of knowledge. So this is a training process, actually. We can work together with the legal profession, with outside counsel, with our, our internal counsel. We, we need to discuss how we can work together to go through the, their self-security assessment, even though you didn't meet the requirement, but you need to still go through your self-security assessment to do the data mapping to just um, um, identify what kind of system or what kind of data you transfer cross border, right? So this is most important and a uh, challenging part from my perspective. Right, I mean, um, do other panel speakers want to weigh in on this topic uh, regarding the challenges, Mark or Sandra? Um, well, while we look at not just China, but also uh, Hong Kong, but also globally, because uh, for, um, Global company compliance is not just about one jurisdiction; it's about multiple. And actually, we have to build a standard that works globally. We can't bother the business and functions to provide information each and every time for for a local compliance. So, um, the most difficult part, I think, challenging part, is to build a compliance program and also framework, or as Mark said, tool that work. Perhaps not just for China, but also for while we build the EU. Uh, assessment process, uh, transfer assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that the uh, complication uh, when we look at uh, data compliance, so it's not just one or two uh, jurisdictions, but how to build a global standard that is interoperable, that can be used across different jurisdictions. <laughs> do, so that, do you largely use the EU template at the moment? Um, well, Usually EU will be the global standard as we uh, try to develop it um, because while we see it, even though there are nuances between the different systems, say for example, China system and also the EU standard, we have a government-led security assessment standard. So what does it mean? Can we use the EU um, standard, say for example, the security um, standards and also the technology compliance and article 32 um, set of rules and standards to help organization to satisfy perhaps the uh, authority in other jurisdiction um, for the compliance. So this is something which uh, a lot of the organization are trying to push at the moment. Um, so um, a lot of uncertainty and perhaps that the reason why we need um, good um, students, lawyers, and also participant and practitioner to engage in the conversation with funds. Yeah, maybe just to highlight an example um, of what Sandra was discussing. Um, when you when you transfer personal data out of Europe, it's actually quite simple at the moment. It's slightly more complicated than it used to be, but there's a set of standard contractual clauses. You need to sign up to a contract with your data recipient that imposes a number of restrictions that are directed at ensuring that the rights that ind individuals have in their data will be respected even though the data is outside of the jurisdiction. Now that's, and again, I'm old enough to know when those standard clauses first came out, I had many clients who said, these are crazy, you can never sign these and flash forwards, you know, um, when you're as old as I am, you know, people sign those clauses quite regularly. And there are some snags that 
we can, nuances we can get into about Brems, but let's leave that out. Um, I think the picture is still fairly clear, whereas with China security assessment measures, um, yes, we have finalized measures that are effective out of the 1st of September. Um, but what we've been doing, and this, of course, my team in Beijing and, and Shanghai, is we're really trying to unpick what the checklist is. When those case officers receive the application, what are they going to look for? What boxes need to be ticked? And, and we, we've done this in many other contexts to try to understand the, the new Chinese regulations as they come forward. But one of the challenges we have is we're getting different answers from different CAC offices on issues. We're getting very different understandings. Um, the, the CAC in Shanghai has a very different view of how HR data uh, is caught by these requirements than the CAC in Beijing, for example. And the other variable is just you know, working with clients who, particularly ones in sensitive sectors who manage information security very, very closely, they worry that these requirements will will oblige them to disclose very sensitive information about their offshore infrastructure. And that in itself is a challenge. Um, and, and of course, we understand the overall objective of the security assessment is to understand is the data secure. Um, but GDPR doesn't go that far. GDPR um, requires the contract. It does require some assessment as to whether the contract will be upheld. Uh, but it doesn't require a deep dive into schematics of, uh, of security systems in the offshore jurisdiction. So this is a big problem. We're trying to understand how much is expected here. Again, we're getting different answers, um, but you know, there is a potential red line for organizations on this, where they, it's a security incident in, them, in itself to be disclosing their security infrastructure to, uh, to a foreign government. Um, and so that and that's a, that is a big difference to GDPR in Europe. And I think in practical terms, this is one of the biggest challenges we're facing at the moment. You, you want to say something, Sandra? Well, while we are on this topic, Mark, maybe I'll just add a bit like, um, so exactly what is required in the uh, technical standards and uh, the pack of information to be provided for the security assessment. Um, so there has been um, some development on the uh, multi-level protection fee. Um, actually, when it first came out, and even at the uh, zero uh, zero point two level, um, it seems not every infrastructure or IT system inside China has to be undergoing that sort of multi-level protection scheme. Um, if it's only level three, then it's kind of compulsory. Uh, but then um, what does it mean when it comes to security assessment? Uh, because um, it sounds like the uh, threshold now currently is quite low, I mean, in terms of the uh, personal information threshold. But when you go through the security assessment process, does it mean that um, you have to provide a MLPS um, report or certificate of some sort or uh, filing records to the authority? So I think that's just to add to Mark's point about the, uh, the uncertainty, the, the, the clarity that we need in order to make it work. Right. I mean, a couple of the panelists already mentioned that the uncertainty, the ambiguity. I mean, particularly, I mean, when I, when I read um, these laws, I mean, and there's a couple of big concepts like critical information infrastructure, uh, important data, uh, national security. I mean, these are key concepts that are never defined um, very clearly. I think there are some attempt to define it, but it's still very vague. And I wonder, you know, in practice, um, how do you, you know, advise your clients to navigate this ambiguity? I know it's, it's probably frustrating, but how do you deal with it, given this is the reality? R Richard? Um, well, it, it's certainly a challenge. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear Mark comment that he's getting sort of contradictory answers from different branches of the CAC. Uh, that's our experience as well. Um, you know, there's key questions that arise in particular in relation to the thresholds, how they're going to be applied across the corporate group. Uh, will they be aggregated? Will the million threshold be aggregated? Um, will the 100,000, 10,000 threshold look at all members of the corporate group and all the data they're transferring or any of the particular companies making the application? You'll get different answers from different um, branches. Well, you said different branches, is it from different region, regional office or is it from different branches within the Beijing? Well, in particular, there appears to be a schism between Shanghai and Beijing. 
Um, you'll get very confident answers from Shanghai, and you'll get completely different answers that are equally confident from Beijing. Uh, Beijing, of course, is the senior regulator. And the type the, of statement, sir. Yes, I mean, that's the, the sort of National Bureau. Um, they have told us they will be speaking to the Shanghai um, provincial branch to uh, correct their interpretation and see if that achieves alignment or not. Um, so you know, a lot of uncertainties. When it comes to important data, um, honestly, and perhaps um, one shouldn't be too honest around a topic like this, but um, all appearances are that that system is not really being enforced at the moment. Uh, in essence, it can't be enforced because no one knows what important data constitutes. Um, there is some limited guidance. Uh, it's mainly directed actually at the authorities that are supposed to be coming up with the more detailed catalogs. It is somewhat useful. It gives you some idea, um, but there's a lot of construction, a lot of interpretation required. Um, critical information infrastructure. Um, that system works basically by way of individual designations. So you wait for a tap on the shoulder, as it were. That, that, that itself is not particularly surprising. Um, the system in Singapore works in a very similar way uh, in terms of individual designations. And in terms of sort of why these terms have not been defined, um, they obviously arise in a particular geopolitical climate. Um, they advance policy goals that are not sort of purely economic policy goals. They are, to some extent, geopolitical policy goals. Um, you know, the system isn't, you know, the most important feature of the system is not necessarily to give parity and certainty to economic operators. I could put it that way. Uh, there are broader policy considerations um, at play. Um, they're also quite difficult to define. <laughs> um, and so one can understand why it's a, a process that um, you know, it requires a lot of discussion among um, different stakeholders in the Chinese government uh, and will take some time to formulate. How we're advising clients, um, it depends from case to case and it depends on what we you know, whether it's critical information infrastructure, important data, or some of these other questions around personal data. Uh, but it's never straightforward. And that's how you guys make a lot of money. Um, so, Chen, um, would yeah, you I just want to supplement two points, I think. Uh, Richard already is that very, very well, right? So I think the first point I want to make is um, for the important data. So maybe in, because we are dealing different industry customer, right? So it's maybe they're in the retail industry, they are in the auto automobile industry, maybe they are in the manufacturing industry. So in their specific industry, so industry uh, regulator, they have specific rules. So we always uh, ask our customers to maybe you need to also take a look at your uh, sector regulation and implementing rules and also consult with your uh, sector uh, uh, regulators to, to get more answer. What kind of things, will, what kind of data will be classified, uh, identified as important data, just like uh, mo automobile uh, mapping data, right? So if you collect any uh, generated or collected personal information inside of China is definitely, it's very sensitive data, right? So also the mapping um, ish, mapping data, so you need to use certified Chinese mapping uh, service provider, right? So you need to sign this kind of contract. So it's a very complicated issues. Uh, I think another thing I want to point out is um, a lot of company, they are using um, email, right? So email, you just go through the Outlook and Office 365, you using this kind of uh, email service. Uh, is there any uh, data transfer through the email um, to to your headquarter or any customer or plan oversee will be treated different? So we have a, a separate consultation with uh, regulator, and seems like um, they they don't they don't think there is um, any big difference. You you still need to go through the review and the approval process. But what we get from authorities, uh, they don't think um, the, the multinational uh, company, their internal uh, email correspondence, like headquarter or their Chinese subsidiary email correspondence, or they think um, their internal business operation data, they don't think this is the mainly focus or primary focus from their perspective. Right, so like Richard said, this is a national security issue, an important data issues, but they don't think that this kind of internal multinational business operation transfer 
will be treated as prim primary uh, focus from their perspective. Of course, there is no official guideline, gu guideline, right? But I just want to supplement. And also for the email, it seems like uh, GDPR also have a similar concept like unconstructed data, right? This is kind of unconstructed data. You cannot uh, search on just to find out what kind of data is important, especially for the cloud service provider. We don't have this kind of authority or access to our customer data, right? So our customer themselves, they may also serve another there and the customer. They also maybe don't have any access to this kind of information. So this kind of unstructured data under the GDPR and also even the uh, US the privacy data protection law, right? So they don't have any different treatment to treat the unstructured email, the, the correspondence. So this is two points I want to supplement. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me just come in. Um, thank you, yeah. very, very important clarifications yeah. and um, absolutely correct that there's a further layer of um, mm -hmm. sexual regulation we to look at as well. Uh, and there are some quite surprising um, Positions taken as regards important data in some of those regulations. Um, despite what I said about the system not really being fully enforced, um, clients, of course, are tiptoeing around important data with great care uh, because of the national security um, dimension to it, and in practice, looking for you know ways to avoid um, making a transfer of anything that may be considered important data, uh, and that's you know in in, in somewhat sharp contradiction to or distinction to attitudes to personal data where I think there's um, somewhat more of a risk appetite, uh, recognizing that, you know, given that the system does apply to some very trivial uh, intergroup um, transfers and a lack of clarity about um, the availability of some of the exemptions, and again, uh, contradictory guidance coming from different regulators. Um, Clients are somewhat more willing to be take a, a more robust view around transfer of the personal data, but are being particularly cautious when it comes to important data. There's also one further concept uh, that I didn't touch on of core data, um, which is briefly mentioned in the data security law, uh, briefly mentioned in the um, draft implementing regulations. It appears to be even more important, important data. Um, the guidance is extremely scanty. Um, but that is subject to a complete export ban. Uh, there is, in essence, no way uh, to, to get approval to transfer that data out of China. So again, with that overlap, uh, there's good reason to be cautious uh, when it comes to important data and whatever core data may be. Yeah. Right. I mean, w one company that wasn't that cautious last year was probably Didi when it decided it will go listed in the United States without going through the cybersecurity review process, although at that time, this this whole process was very new, and that's probably what our audience was very familiar with. But after this DD incident, um, the, the Cyberspace Administration of China introduced a security assessment regime, and this is separate from the cybersecurity re review regime. And I, I, Richard already mentioned that briefly at the beginning. I wonder if, Mark, you can walk us through a little bit about what exactly is this thing? Sure. Well. I don't think I'm going out on a limb with the other speakers to say that we don't quite know, but um, it still leaves the question for, well, how do we help clients with this data security assessment uh, process? Because you're also hearing us then um, that look, many organizations feel there, there must be something real to this. There, there's something there. There is a law uh, that um, people do expect at some point will be enforced in some way. There was, why is it there? Um, so let's start with what we know. And what you're hearing is we don't we don't know a lot, um, but we are drawing from tools we've used elsewhere. And I think the first step that we invariably recommend to clients is a data mapping exercise, just to understand factually, well, what data are you sending off door now? Because that that at least forms a perimeter of of what could be relevant to you in terms of compliance. And, and we actually use, we, it's, it's interesting, we've taken our GDPR tools for that. So we have these data inventory questionnaires and um, these are Excel spreadsheets that, um, and, and if you're on the receiving end of one of these, you're not very happy because it, it requires you to sort of list out all the types of data that um, you're processing, what systems is it in, did you collect it, what is it being used for, what is the retention period, and breaking it down into some of the, you know, the categories that Richard's mentioned are sensitive categories, there are categories of important data. And so the spreadsheet 
you know, gets to be quite large, but the, the benefit of doing it is that at least then gives you the facts because at some point this thing will become real. We think it is already real for a number of clients, partly because they're industry regulators, partly because of uh, pressures from their partners in the mainland. Um, but then you've got the facts. And so once you have those facts, then you can go about one assessing the threshold. So the security assessment uh, review is triggered by uh, having you know, a million more uh, data subjects in total, irrespective of the size of the transfer, uh, 100,000 data subjects uh, for transfers generally, and then 10,000. So this is a, over a rolling period looking back to the previous 1st January, a bit of a complicated rolling period. But you look back between wherever you are in the previous 1st January, and you look at how much data you've transferred in that period, 100,000 data subjects generally, 10,000 fifth benefit of personal data. And what we've had, the benefit, the other benefit of doing this inventory exercise is we've had a few clients who said, well, actually, do we really need this data? Do we need to be transferring this offshore? And this is just good data protection practice generally, frankly, is to look at your data retention periods, look at the data you have, because if you have it, it's a security risk. It could be hacked, it could be lost. And so one of the, the positive aspects of the inventory is not only preparing yourself for the security assessment, but also just doing a good housekeeping on, on data. Um, so the data inventory exercise, we definitely recommend and assess the thresholds, look at, you know, should we be getting rid of certain data? Do we need to transfer it? And then you get the task then of, well, what do we submit to the authorities if we are over the thresholds? And that's where we're involved in a number of these, where it's very slow going. We do feel the authorities haven't been fully briefed on what they're expecting. Um, and you know the typical areas that we see clients very, very concerned about is not so much what I described, you know, disclosing, well, what data is going off door. That's, that's actually fairly easy. The difficult part, as I alluded to earlier, is how do we persuade the authorities that once it reaches the destination, it is secure in accordance with Chinese standards. And that's where um, we're in a lot of back and forth with the CAC trying to judge, well, how much do we need to be disclosing about uh, the security environment where the data is going? Because part of that feels like a um, under GDPR, there's something called adequacy, where you look at the legal environment in the destination, you look at the laws, and are they adequate to protect data? But part of it, too, is very technical and practical about the, the information security environment. And that's the big worry area for many of our clients where they feel we don't disclose that to anyone, not to our home regulators. And if we disclose that to the Chinese authorities, um, that's going to cause anxiety for our customers, for our stakeholders, our regulators in, uh, in the home jurisdiction. So um, maybe I'll stop there. There's a, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot. There's, there's, um, but, you know, well, in my last life, I was an antitrust attorney. And um, what, what we have what we mostly do is advise clients to, uh, you know, obtain clearance before they go ahead with the merger transaction. Now, it looks like what you described is, you know, similar to merger clearance process that before you go, go with like a very big transaction, like an m and or even like in, in the DD case, like go overseas listing, you need to get clearance, uh, data clearance uh, from relevant authority. Although I, I I don't know whether the CAC have insufficient capacity to deal with all those uh, requests and, and handle it in a very efficient way, right? I mean, so um, I, I wonder, Chen or, or Sandra or Richard, would you, would you give us a little bit examples? I mean, in, in practice, how do you go through this, this, this data assessment process? Is it, is it a very big hassle? Yeah, let me chime in first, maybe Richard and Mark, you can. So I, I think, um, I think most important things is uh, one concept we need to take consideration is uh, who is data controller, who is data protector. So this is very important. For example, like Microsoft, we may no need to consider about customer data. We are processing the door for our customer during the, when the customer using cloud service, right? So what we need to consider is um, uh, HR, human resource. Uh, data because like a lot of multinational company, they're using HR system. They're they're one they're maybe sitting overseas in US, right? So it's like not only Microsoft but also another multinational company. The uh, the, the a lot of data, personal information, 
uh, collected from their employee may be need to transfer outside of China because they are using the HR system, right? So this is a one, one uh, factor they need to consider. So who is data controller, who is data processor? If you are data controller, you are eventually uh, subject to this kind of compliant obligation, right? And also um, when you do the analysis, you need to consider if, if you're doing marketing campaign, is there any um, information collected during this kind of marketing campaign we are transfer out of China, right? So I, I think also if you sign the contract with your customer um, or end customer, you collect some uh, contact information from the customer. So this kind of contact information may be transferred out of China. So this is basically from this concept, you need to really go through very detailed data mapping, like I, like I just mentioned, right? So to just establish what kind of system, what kind of data will be transferred out of China when you're acting as data controller. Um, like the data handler is the same concept under the PIPL. And another thing I, I want to mention is um, you really need to uh, identify which data transfer mechanism you will use, like Richard just uh, explained, right? So there are three, three ways. So one way, the security assessment led by CC. Another is a uh, uh, standard contractual course, uh, sign the standard contract at CC, right? And another one is security certification. So you, you really need to consider your own situation to just uh, identify which transfer mechanism you will use for your, for your enterprise. And then you will work together with your overseas data recipient to just get all the information about data over, overseas data transfer, the channel, and go, which, which uh, uh, data uh, processing rule you will go through and what kind of data you will go through to outside. So this is a very detailed plan. You really need to work, work together with a legal profession and to uh, go through your self uh, security assessment before you make decision which way you will choose. Yeah. Richard? Richard, do you want anything to add? Um, well, I can comment a little bit on the um, impact of the cybersecurity review for listings. Uh, we have some experience of that from our IPO practice. Um, that, that said, I mean, the DD decision has had a somewhat chilling effect on the market generally, so there haven't been that many successful IPOs over the last 18 months. Um, but to the extent, you know, there has been um, experience there, um, it does appear to be um, generally accepted both by uh, the authorities, but also by the exchange, um, that this cybersecurity review process does not apply to a Hong Kong listing. Um, the exchange and sponsors are generally happy to um, put on legal opinions uh, to that extent. Um, some sponsors will want that tested case by case with the authorities, but the um, general consensus is that the you know, Hong Kong is not considered to be a, a, an overseas country, foreign country for these purposes. Um, there is, however, uh, a further um, security review process where the listing may have a national security implication. Um, that is formally not yet in effect. Uh, it's in draft implementing regulations. Um, as, as people who have experience with China will know, that doesn't always necessarily mean that that will not be uh, enforced. Um, and there is some nervousness around you know, whether that will be or how that will be applied. It does apply, will apply to a Hong Kong listing. Um, but there's, you know, again, no, no real clarity as to um, what may be considered to be uh, or, or have implications for national security. When it comes to that, um, I say it's still formally in draft. Some listing applicants are approaching the authorities for um, confirmation assurance that um, you know they will not be required to go through that review, or it will not be applied to them retrospectively, as was essentially the case with Diddy. Um, others are preferring to not ask the question. Uh, if I could put it that way. If I um, well, um, law, yes, um, are all there, but what about compliance? Um, so um, a lot of times when it comes to compliance, we have to think about uh, a granular scheme and uh, cannot do it on an ad hoc manner. So um, I agree with Mark that we have to be very uh, clear about, and also the other audience about, you know, who are the controller and uh, when it comes to uh, data classification mapping, it has to be done. Um, but it, um, it all comes down to a program. 
what we called the compliance program, the data privacy compliance program that we built in an organization. Um, it is actually quite a complicated matter that cannot be explained in just three minutes or two minutes, but um, it can, it would be have to be, uh, um, a, I mean, tackled at multiple front. How you look at your vendor, how you look at your customers, uh, where you transfer the data, allow that data to be transferred to your vendors. What would have to be uh, put into the contract? Um, there are clauses, um, as Mark said, standard contractual clauses, where a set of uh, protection courses will be in, in place if you are uh, dealing with a controller. And, um, and at the same time, um, we can't just deal with one single security assessment report. Uh, there can be multiple. And, and also at the same time, country risk assessment cannot be just one country. It has to be multiple countries and jurisdictions. So uh, when you look at the whole grand scheme of things, you have to build a framework and uh, um, try to tackle it at sourcing, customer, contract, mapping, Excel, <laughs> and then try to understand the different classes of data and apply it according to the principle being published, which is yet to be interpreted, and then try to make sense out of the level of sensitivity and criticality. Uh, so this is a kind of program, somehow when you come to a point of time, it cannot be manual. It has to be perhaps automated and okay. annually set up a process where you have to make sure that there would be a process for annual attestation by the business, perhaps about a different business function like HR, uh, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. So again, two minutes, very difficult to explain. There, is, there are certificates for uh, data management. There are certificates for uh, students to go to, uh, to find out what a compliance program should look like. So um, much to learn and much to build. That's good. Um, Richard, you already mentioned that for Hong Kong, let's say, kind of like an informal consensus. have been formed that you don't need to go through a cybersecurity review. And after I do my homework, I, I look at the perspective of the <laughs> company that uh, for preparation for today's talk, I, um, because I have no idea what the practice looks like, I never practiced data law. I, I look at the perspectives of all the companies who came to list in Hong Kong in the past six months. And I'm surprised to find that none of them filed a cybersecurity review despite the DDK. And uh, all of them, uh, Admitted there is this risk. However, we uh, we think we, we don't need to file. And I also took a look at the, the New York <laughs> listing, and none of the companies file as either. Um, so you know, despite the fact that you know, there seems to be a different treatment between uh, overseas, you know, real real overseas in Hong Kong listing. So my question is. I mean, look. I mean, how how do companies reach this conclusion that they don't need to file for cybersecurity review. I mean, did they get informal assurance from the regulators or was it the regulators just don't have the capacity to deal with the thing? I mean, I remember in the DD case, seven regulators form kind of like an ad hoc team to walk into much into DD's office to conduct a cybersecurity review. Right? I mean, I guess, you know, if, if the, the review team is formed ad hoc, it's not like a routine practice. I mean, this thing, cannot be like a, you know, a, a routine assessment, right? I mean, so I have no idea what the uh, enforcement is actually like. Yeah, Richard. Uh, well, we do have, we do have um, some experience with the full side of peer review on a Swiss listing, in fact. Um, and you, you mentioned capacity constraints at the, at the CAC. Um, that process meant to take sort of up to three months. Again, I think there is um, ability to extend it in complicated cases. Um, it actually took more like five months. Uh, and for several months, um, it was a clear issue of a lack of availability uh, of personnel at the at the regulator. Um, they've been tasked with many other responsibilities uh, when it comes to national security and cyber security, so they're clearly quite resource constrained. Um, it, it was not a, how can I put it, a particularly transparent process. Uh, the process that um, took place at the highest level of the listing applicants management uh, and involve very direct 
interaction between management and the regulator. Um, it's not as if there is a formal set of you know, application requirements or a formal set of criteria for the review. Uh, and you can draw your own conclusions from um, you know, as, as, to, as to why that may be and what the priorities may be for the regulator. But uh, it is happening. Uh, I don't know why um, it was not applied to the, the sort of New York listings um, that you mentioned. When it comes to Hong Kong, um, it's a little bit more than just an informal consensus. I mean, there is a um, fairly formal uh, exemption for Hong Kong, albeit in, in, in draft implementing regulations. Um, but it is it is generally accepted um, that this will not be applied to Hong Kong. That said, um, National Security Review could essentially function in a very similar way uh, with similar outcomes. Um, indeed, again, in the draft implementing regulations, there is effectively an, an, an equation between uh, the holding of personal data of more than a million individuals and important data. And important data, again, has a national security demand to it. So the threshold for going through full cyber security review, which is again, a million uh, data subjects, essentially equates to important data, which equates to national security. So you kind of get to the same place anyway, the Hong Kong is. Uh, that process is not in effect yet. And um, to answer your question about how listing applicants are getting assurance, as I mentioned, some are approaching the regulators directly for that assurance. Others are not. Um, most opinions issued to the exchange will simply know that that, um, uh, that system is not yet in force. So that's how it's being handled at the moment. It's really difficult. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine, or I mean, um, how, how would the industry respond to, to, to all these ambiguities and, and uncertainty with China's data regulation regime? I mean, I don't know, Chan, would you like to wave in? I mean, have you heard yeah. anything? I think from industry perspective, we will see uh, two waves. And one, one wave from um, some multinational companies. So they are, uh, how to say, because we prefer using global clouds, right? So for their uh, cross-border data transfer. So they are um, actively preparing a self uh, security assessment by working together with outside counsel, by working together with uh, OSC recipients like uh, Microsoft, AWS, Google Cloud, right? So depends on which cloud they are using for data transfer OSC. So this is, uh, we can see one of the trend. The other trend that we can see because they are really worried about some kind of multinational company, they are dealing a lot of uh, uh, important data, like auto industry, right? Um, like some kinds of CIO, crit uh, critical information infrastructure operator. So they are worried about maybe they can't pass security assessment led by CC. So they tend to transfer their global uh, data, they're using global cloud services and transfer to the, migrate their data to the local cloud service provider, like Ali, Tencent, Right, so like Huawei Cloud and also for uh, AWS and Microsoft, we also have uh, our domestic cloud service provider in China. So they tend to localize and to do the data localization by using the domestic cloud service provider, CPM, right? So this is the two trends we can see. One side, they are actively doing security assessment and one side, they are transfer data, migrated data to the to the, the domestic C CPS, yeah. Uh, Sandra or Mark, would you like to weigh in? Uh, am I, yeah, oh, sorry. Lower your mic a little bit, lower your mic. Yeah, yeah agree with um, um, what was just said. Um, um, there are two trends and, um, and, and I think um, um, the, I mean, what it means for Hong Kong and China eventually, uh, and also to find a interoperable system, uh, I think is a, is a very key point because it, it's not just between Hong Kong and China, but also the rest of the world. So um, when I look at this topic, harmonization, I feel that a more suitable term I would use is interoperability. <laughs> <laughs> And it's very difficult for two systems to be completely harmonized. So um, how to recognize the differences between these two and perhaps with the rest of the world and try to build an understanding uh, what are the, whether the differences can be recognized. So 
um, because if if not, then we don't want to see um, uh, look relocalization and the flow of data is really key to uh, organization. Um, it's not just to facilitate the uh, digital economy, but a lot of the uh, activities, which is uh, particularly important for for organization like financial institutions, say for example, attacking AML, uh, KYC, this sort of activities, we need the flow of data between jurisdiction with speed in order to give organization a one uh, window and one page understanding of what is going on um, uh, about, say for example, particular person or particular institution. So I think um, that's the backdrop uh, that I would like to add. Right. Mark? Yeah, I would just quickly add on this point that um, you know the need for clarity is is urgent, and I, I think you're you're probably hearing that across the the board here. And um, this is speaking as someone I've, I've been here about 15 years now in Hong Kong, and right from my very first days, you get the question: We can't take our data out of China, can we? And 15 years ago, um, you know, it was easier to answer that question. The, the, look, there's for a long time, there have been particular types of data that are localized to China, map data, for example. Um, there are specific laws dealing with that. Uh, more recently, we've had uh, laws with autonomous drive cars. You know, those is a specific set of regulations which localize that type of data. But in the main, you actually, you know, apart from industry regulations, you could, you could take data out of China. And what's slowly happened is we've had cybersecurity law, now PIPL, DSL, all these laws have added to that uncertainty without necessarily resolving it. And um, you know, we spend quite a bit of time helping clients who are faced with a, a, say, a customer in China who's saying, no, 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 you must keep our data in China. That's what the law says. And there are cases where that's absolutely right. Uh, again, if it's mapping data or something which is um, localized, that's correct. Um, but the, the sense I have now is that balance is shifting, where we used to win those arguments a lot of the time and get people comfortable, of course, put in place a sensible agreement with sensible security around the data. That's, that's a given. Um, but the challenge we're getting now is, is a fear factor, a chilling of cross-border transfer, which I think is very unhelpful to, you know, Sanders mentioned some very good examples of where cross-border business, and for Hong Kong, I think this is very important. Uh, cross-border business depends on the free flow of data. That's just a, a modern reality of, of business. And so I think this, the uncertainty in itself is very unhelpful to, uh, to investors, to businesses, both sides of the boundary moment. So I think clarity is important. Is there any company that doing particularly well in response to this change or, or any type of, Mark, I mean, Follow up with you. I mean, some that struggle more. Well, I think we're all struggling. I think struggling is uh, there's no shame in admitting that we're struggling at the moment. But I think the organizations that feel more confident. I think there's two variables. One, they have an industry regulator in China who has been actively engaging the CSC to find solutions, and there are a few industry regulators who have, are doing that. And I think they they feel for their stakeholders this is a, a good thing to do to get some confidence that the practices and procedures they have that are long established are sufficient. And I think those ones, it's just a palpable difference when we get on uh, the phone with them, because I think they feel they've been given a direction by their authority in China, their industry regulator, that yes, this is fine. So those ones I think are, are in a better place. The other ones who are in a better place are ones that have been through the Excel spreadsheet before. Um, the businesses that are GDPR compliance, businesses that are, um, I think in Hong Kong, probably the best example is financial institutions, HKMA regulated financial institutions. They have a lot of technology risk management regulation, a lot of regulation of customer data. And so they feel that, well, look, we're doing a good job. You know, we've got these, it's much higher standard than PDPO. Um, you know, they're, they're complying to high standards. So I think they feel no matter what happens here, we've got a good answer that we should be able to transfer data out because we, we've got all this infrastructure in place. And But apart from that, um, those two examples, I think it's it, most organizations are frankly struggling with what might come from this. All right, interesting perspective of our struggle. So let's finally switch our focus to Hong Kong. I mean, Richard already mentioned uh, Hong Kong seems to have a little bit, um, enjoy some preferential treatment when it comes to listing. Um, 
I, I don't know. Did, does Hong Kong have received any other form of preferential treatment other than that in terms of data transfer? Do you think? Uh, not not formally. Um, I don't think there's any expectation that you know Hong Kong will not be treated as an outbound destination for the application of these rules. Uh, we may see uh, practice developing um, in terms of the willingness of the CAC to grant approvals uh, to transfers to Hong Kong. Um, whether that really materialises or not, I, I, I don't know. There aren't that many situations that involve purely bilateral transfers from mainland China to Hong Kong and going nowhere else. Um, and the authorities in mainland China, of course, will be aware um, that there are very limited um, restrictions on um, you know, further, further onward transfer of data from Hong Kong uh, of any, any kind, including personal data. Um, so, so no real expectation, I think, that Hong Kong will be treated differently. Um, there are some limited proposals to allow um, enhanced data sharing in the Great Bay Area, We're particularly focusing on medical research data and other forms of, of R&D. That's all quite tentative at the moment, but we'll see if that, um, see if that materializes. I think Mark makes a very good point on the other hand, that um, there's a lot of misperception um, about what the rules actually permit and what they do not permit. Um, there's misperception both uh, within you know, domestic Chinese companies, but also international companies. Misperception as to whether or not these rules actually apply to Hong Kong directly. And international companies have formed the view that they do um, or that they will be applied um, imminently. I don't think there's any, again, in, any real indication that, that is the case, but there is a general expectation among many international uh, companies that, that that will occur. Um, and as far as domestic Chinese companies are concerned, uh, again, similar to Mark, we hear very often a view that it's too risky to transfer our data, too risky to transfer our technology. We're not really allowed to do it. Uh, and even if we can do it today, you know, we might not be able to do it tomorrow. Um, so we just have to view this deal as a, you know, China for China deal um, and, and, and exclude the international component. So, so the uncertainty, um, much of which is planned um, and is strategic, uh, is having adverse economic consequences. There's no doubt about that. Uh, again, I don't think it's too controversial to say that um, these rules are not implemented um, to drive purely economic goals, but for broader geopolitical considerations. So that perhaps is a price that the Chinese government is, is willing to pay. Um, but certainly the effect is, is very real. All right. I mean, Chen, would you like to weigh in this question as well? Uh, I think the, the Richard already mentioned there's no preferential treatment, right? So for Hong Kong, but we also heard some kind of conversation between Hong Kong and China government, right? So it's a currently going on. So, uh, but simply maybe in the near future, let's see <laughs> if there any, any mechanism will be taking place. And also we heard from the third party um, institution and they are just promoting third party certification, right? So in Hong Kong, um, because Hong Kong really, we have uh, more than 40, uh, Hong Kong data center based in Hong Kong. And also we have more than 20 uh, data, uh, cloud service provider uh, in Hong Kong market. And also based on the research report, it's over two bi two, 20 billion US dollar market share in Hong Kong uh, in the past year. So this is very big market. So we really want to see, especially for the global cloud services, we have data center in Hong Kong. Is there any, any way uh, through the certification or through the one country system mechanism, we can get some preferential, uh, preferential treatment from uh, China government. So let's wait and see. Right. I mean, to delve into this question more deeply, we need to understand what is the rule for cross border data transfer in Hong Kong, right? I mean, because, because you, once your data comes to Hong Kong, you want to know what's the next. Um, so, Sandra, would you walk us through that first? Uh, go uh, section 33 of the uh, PTPO, we do have a provision in law that governs cross-border data uh, transfer, but um, it's not yet made effective. Um, 
now we still rely on a guidance uh, to govern that framework. Um, so it's yet to see um, the uh, ultimate effect of it. Uh, but when you compare the um, mechanism and also how it you know, compared with the EU and also the mainland regime, um, you can see some common feature like uh, the uh, whitelist. Um, uh, you can transfer data to whitelist jurisdiction. Definitely something you can find in the GDPR, and uh, it's similar to country risk assessment. But but then uh, own assessment regime is another regime where you can see in the uh, Article uh, Section 30, 33 of the PTO. And then, uh, well, this concept of self-assessment is also enshrined in the EIPL and also the GDPR as well. So um, common features, yes, uh, but uh, when it comes to the um, uh, due diligence part of it is Section 33, uh, Subsection 2F, if I remember correctly. Um, <laughs> oh, about the, all right. <laughs> the due diligence that being taken by organizations to ensure um, transfer of data will be uh, given adequate protection. Um, it, it is not particularly clear when it comes to the uh, uh, SEC being attached uh, to the draft, uh, sorry, to the guidance at the moment, whether it covers equivalently the, um, the four module uh, 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 um, uh, published by the EU side and the um, people, the draft uh, SDP at the moment is two modules. So um, the regime in Hong Kong, how it developed, um, whether it will be uh, officially implemented, uh, whether it, it will move from a guidance stage to an actual implementation, whether it needs to be uh, perhaps uh, amended to a certain extent, uh, say for example, to explicitly recognize um, um, uh, the uh, certification or perhaps to explicitly recognize uh, SEC as the measures. Uh, still, uh, a lot of these will have to be considered, um, I guess, in the policy review and the review of, of the overall of the PTBO, which I believe um, the CMAB um, has uh, made it um, quite public in the recent policy paper that they're going to look into it. Um, and also the fact that there is a, a digital economy development committee being um, formed in June this year, um, I believe that it will drive a lot of the changes, um, which um, this sort of uh, development committee uh, will usually be the foundation in a lot of the driving a lot of the data uh, economy and data law changes in other parts of the world, so including China. So I, I believe that there would be some development uh, in the law, um, so uh, a lot to be seen. Right. I mean, so as Sandra has mentioned, there seems to be very little going on in Hong Kong at the moment in restricting uh, cross-border data transfer. And you have this provision in place, but it's not really implemented yet. I mean, Richard, can you tell us more about, you know, what, what do you think is the process of Hong Kong tightening its cross-border data transfer? I, I guess that will put Hong Kong in a very difficult position being, you know, the leading financial center, you don't you don't want to restrict data transfer. At the same time, you might want to have more harmony with the the low the mainland regime. Yeah, I mean, it's been to Hong Kong's advantage to allow fairly liberal um, data flows, and Hong Kong's been keen to promote itself as a as a, as a regional data hub uh, and a and a sensible location for um, data centers. I mean, that that took a bit of a knockback. Um, after the enact enactment of a certain notorious law a few years ago. Um, but otherwise, you know, the, the policy in Hong Kong has been um, to permit cross-border data transfer. Uh, I don't really see that changing. Um, I think, you know, as Chen Li mentioned, uh, there may, may well be some moves to promote the certification regime um, for transfers between the mainland and Hong Kong. Um, that may be a relatively attractive uh, route. Um, there hasn't been that much focus on it yet because it's not not in force. But um, we'll, we'll see if that if that comes to pass. Ironically, of course, um, one of the reasons why Section Thirty Three was not brought into effect uh, was the you know, the whitelist is a bit of a political hot potato. Uh, ironically, of course, um, China has leapfrogged Hong Kong in terms of its former formal data protection standards. So. Um, 
successive commissioners have chosen not to tackle that issue <laughs> um, um, for reasons that one can be sympathetic to. Um, but if they chose to, um, I think perhaps there would be less controversy around that topic than there may have been in the past. Right. I mean, that brings me to the question of what, what do you think that Hong Kong will continue to receive more preferential treatment from the mainland? Because if you don't see Hong Kong tightening its restriction for data transfer, I see it less likely for Hong Kong to get proper exemption from the mainland regime and enjoy more preferential treatment when it comes to data transfer from between mainland and Hong Kong. I mean, Mark, do you agree? Yeah, I think that that in general must be right. Um, you know, the PDPO, just to put it in context, so it dates back to the mid-1990s. It's been amended twice on a fairly selective basis, um, whereas China has suddenly moved ahead with PIPL, which again looks a lot like GDPR, the gold standard of international data protection regulation. So the gap is, is very significant, and it is difficult to see, uh, um, however you want to call it, preferential treatment or an idea of adequacy of the standards here, uh, achieving uh, you know, that status without Hong Kong's PDPO moving forward significantly. And as, as Sandra mentioned, that you know, there's a, a white paper published back in January 2020 uh, by the Constitutional Mainland Affairs Bureau, uh, jointly with the, the Privacy Commissioner's Office, which did detail a number of changes which um, are planned for the, the PDPO. Uh, but again, these are fairly selective, and I don't think go to the root of the issues that we have on this question, which you know, one is, as Richard had mentioned, well, that look, there's, there's no international transfer restriction. So data will come to Hong Kong and then move out. Um, you know, of course, for many, that would be a great scheme to avoid the PIPL if, um, you know, if, if Hong Kong were uh, generally exempt and quickly we got things, you know, we don't think that's that's right. Um, but the other the other areas, you know, if you look broadly at PIPL and, and what, why is it so much more of a, a higher standard than PDPO, there's a lot of things in there. There's an idea of, of data governance, of accountability, of having an organization-wide commitment, which is endorsed at a senior management level to ensure that data is handled in accordance with principles. And so there's a lot there. And the other dimension um, going beyond GDPR is the cyber sovereignty issue, which again, I think is a important uh, differentiator for PIPL, the EN for data security law, cyber security law in China, that you need to recognize when you sort of line up PDPO and PIPL. It's not just about um, the, you know, looking at the European reference standards. So, so there's a lot to be, I, I think if, if the, the desired outcome is you know, equivalency, adequacy, um, there's, there is a lot of work, I think, to be done in Hong Kong to, um, to, to level up. Right. I mean, Chen, Chen would, you, would you want to wave in that question as well? I think another thing I want to just supplement is we can see very strong competition from other countries, right? So like Singapore, like uh, Japan, Korea, right? So the, there is, um, of course, from the cross-border transfer perspective, there seems like no different, but you can see it's um, uh, because a lot of um, company when they using Hong Kong citizen, um, from one perspective, they are worried about national security law, right? So this is one of the concerns from their perspective. So compare um, with uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, of course, and we, we uh, wait and see, is there any prefer preferential treatment? Between China and Hong Kong uh, under the one country, two, two system, right? My tendency, we can see. But um, I think we, we do see there's strong competition from uh, another country like Singapore, right? So, so we, need to, uh, we need to do something to, to, change, to change this kind of situation from, from country perspective. Right. Did TikTok move its data center to Singapore, right? Yeah. Central? Yeah. So there's a lot of movement. Right. So, so how, how can Hong Kong establish itself as like an international data hub? We, we, we are an international financial center. And Chen, you mentioned that Hong Kong already have a lot of data business there. Yeah, yeah. A lot of data different. business there. I mean, given what it is, given the, you know, the national security concern, you know, the, um, the geopolitics, realistically, what do you think? You know, the mainland government 
and the Hong Kong government can do to at least, you know, achieve better harmonization or like what Sandra described, interoperability between the two systems. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to, um, from our perspective, we will see maybe just to formulate a cloud first uh, mechanism, like I discussed, right? So like Richard, Mark, and Andrew mentioned. So um, to, to really establish some kind of um, um, treatment between Hong Kong and uh, China, um, we will just, uh, this is very important for the council as well, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, Mark or? Sandra, would you like to weigh in? Sure, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I guess what, in terms of Hong Kong's ambitions as a data hub, um, you know, look, I think, you know, you pointed to TikTok as, a, as an easy example in a way where I think in certain sectors that that ambition of Hong Kong being a data hub is, is a foregone conclusion that it won't be. Um, the, and it's not that these organizations are in on violating the national security laws, just they have concerns about user generated content, for example, that could. So in certain sectors, um, that is just a, a very practical risk, which um, those organizations uh, will not take. Um, but more broadly, I guess, and more optimistically, you look at the economic unit of the Greater Bay Area. And again, I mean this in an economic sense, the potential of that unit is extraordinary. And as Sandra mentioned, the free flow of data in areas such as transaction monitoring, money laundering, um, you know, playing to Hong Kong's strength with the financial hub. And that is still a strength that's, that's um, I think, recognized by all, uh, even when we're competing against Singapore and Japan. Um, and I think, you know, playing to that sort of strength, I think um, I would be focusing on then having, I, I'm a believer in, in standards-based regulation, because what we have particularly in this context, and these are personal views, um, we have this significant uncertainty around regulatory intention. We, we don't quite know what are the policies behind this, what is important data, what is critical. It, it could mean one thing one day and something else the next. Well, I think the only practical answer for, for clients who are reading this, trying, well, how do we plan our business? Where do we put our data? What, what do we do? Um, is, is a very clear standards-driven uh, mechanism, which then prescribes, oh, here's what you do in very specific terms. You need this level of encryption and this level of, um, and that way, you know, it just brings much needed clarity. It goes back to my point I made earlier. I think lack of clarity is a huge, huge challenge here. And, um, you know, again, if, if the focus is being a financial hub, a fintech hub, digital banking hub, and I think that that really is playing Hong Kong's strengths, you know, this is an area where very typically, the industry has been very standards driven. Um, and you know, I think turning to Chen's point about you know, cloud and having, and I think part of what is the solution there, actually, then, well, you recognize these standards. And that way, the cloud industry, they have standards, and the banks have their standards, and we have these standards. And that way, we can just focus on something very literal and, um, and easy to understand and follow rather than uh, having to worry, I think, about wider. Uh, policy uh, challenges that are very difficult for organizations to, to understand at a practical working level. Sandra. Well, I, I think uh, it, um, the um, yeah, low uh, gaps and things like that, um, uncertainty, yes. Um, I agree with Mark that uh, the standards and uh, that will help us um, to a lot of extent um, because when we look at flow of the data between jurisdictions, uh, it's not just about the data law, but also the technology standard as well. So uh, ISO standard, uh, what does it mean? And when you compare with the MLPS, et cetera, um, uh, whether a soft report can be considered uh, as an attestation and audit basis uh, and to be accepted by the China side. So a lot of these um, um, going forward will be an area of exploration, standardization, certification, and things like that. So um, one way which the um, perhaps we can consider uh, in here in Hong Kong is whether you accept some of these standards as uh, not just good practice, but perhaps being recognized as something that we should we should put in place when we look at the um, technology uh, standards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but another point about uh, whether how to position Hong Kong, I, I believe that um, when we look at the 
digital policy and digital economy, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's also about the soft component, that is the talent, the people here, whether we have the awareness, we have uh, the sufficient knowledge to build the accountability and awareness within organizations that make this sort of framework work. So I think um, you ha we have to look at it uh, from a, a hardware perspective and also software perspective. Um, so um, I think that part of it, uh, we haven't explored too much, but I think it's a key thing that we need to consider as well. Right, right. Um, look, I mean, a lot of the audience here today are students. And one key question they want to know is, is there a lot of business in the data practice these days? I mean, I mean, Mark, maybe I can ask you to first. I mean, did you see an explosion of um, you know, workflows in the past two years? Yeah, I think you're choosing well uh, in terms of uh, career planning. It's um, so my background, I started out as a technology lawyer where I really just focused on negotiating commercial agreements. I got into data regulation because I realized my clients wanted me to, when that started becoming a thing, uh, my clients wanted me to understand that so I could negotiate around those issues. And flash forward now, and we've got, you know, part of my team is full time dedicated to, to data. It's now a, a practice in the way that it wasn't when I arrived uh, 15 years ago. So, um, you know, looking, it's taken time. I think it's taken longer than people expect it to take off here in the region, particularly. But with PIPL, uh, the game changer with PIPL is organizations here in the region now have a very, very good reason to adopt sort of the GDPR program, which is a lot of work. It's lots of spreadsheets, it's um, it's lots of analysis, it's writing policies, evaluating, conducting privacy impact assessments. All of these things that have to be done to comply with that law are now much more reality here in the region than it was even, even five years ago. I think the last few years, it's been a real uptick in this, and that will carry on. So if you're studying now and looking for a, a career in the area, I think it's, it's a very auspicious time to be uh, studying what you're studying. Well, let, let me ask Sandra, because you graduated from here. Did you take any data law while you were here? How did you learn your data practice? <laughs> uh, well, uh, in my day, I think uh, we're not that advanced. I mean, in terms of courses, we don't have data um, courses, but it would be um, a, a good course and uh, um, subject to take um, because um, uh, that you can see the real prospect of. Um, monetizing data. Um, it can be, it means a lot of things, uh, the, the analytics, the insight that can be generated from even publicly available data can be can mean a lot. So um, don't just look at the personal data side because there are lots that's happening on the data side, non-personal data side. And also how do you relate to uh, intellectual property, a database uh, rights, etc. cetera. Um, um, I, I can see real potential if we can look at the circumstances, not just like master five years ago, maybe even two years ago is different. So, um, um, but one, one thing about um, having formalized and better recognized courses in Hong Kong, um, another point is about, do we recognize the profession under the law? I mean, we have uh, the appointment of DPO um, in EU law and UK law and the people as well, but we don't have that in the uh, PTPO. Is this something that we should think about? And also the accountability principle is not well um, explicitly uh, established under the law. So I think um, there are lots of things which uh, make the profession work, but um, honestly, this is something which I haven't thought about a few years ago, but um, this is, I think, uh, a, a very good development for Korea, uh, but um, honestly, it's not just about law. It's not just about interpretation of legal provision. It's about operationalization, implementation, and pragmatic solution. So um, when you build a team, it's not just lawyers. Sometimes it's about uh, data scientists, uh, data management practitioner, et cetera. So compliance side and lawyer side all work together. Great, fantastic. And thanks for giving me uh, you know, helping my, actually helping me to promote my course to the students. Thank you. Um, now, let, let me open up the floor for Q&A from the audience. We have about eight minutes left, so take the opportunity. Yes, Susan. Susan, would you like to introduce yourself?
It's okay. Even if it doesn't work, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, Susan Pinder, uh, so distinguished scholar and resident at the Peking University School of Transnational Law, fellow here at the law faculty. Uh, so, my question concerns uh, so, Hong Kong is the International Arbitration Center. So, what does this what does this all mean for Hong Kong's very important place, and arbitration? place for arbitration? But with Susan in her last life is a practitioner with question. Oh. <laughs> Any of the our panelists would like to take that when it comes to arbitration? No? Well, I I'll give it a go. It's not, not something I think I've given a lot of thought to. Um, I can see interesting arguments coming up around disclosure uh, on the sign of foreign disputes. Uh, whether or not it's permitted to make that disclosure. Um, there are other features of the um, data security law that prohibit uh, Chinese companies sharing data with regulators and law enforcement. Um, so again, that may be invoked to uh, resist disclosure orders, things like that. Um, yeah, there's provision in the PIPL in terms of the legal proceeding, particularly. Yeah, yeah, but again, we're not, we're not just talking about personal data in, in the context of an arbitration, probably less so. Um, so, that's, yeah, th those are possible implications. Right. Yes, our oh, Dean, following. All right, thank you. Um, we, we're talking about the important data, core data, national security. So China has another legal regime that is the state secrets. Uh, you know, we haven't mentioned that. And how do the, the two regimes speak to each other? In, for example, in some of the cases about the sort of uh, audit paper, everything is about state secrets, but now everything is about data. So we raised a very good question because in the, just for wider awareness, state secrets law goes back quite some time in China. That's, um, you know, for years and years and years, we've had um, cases around that. And we actually had a case, um, we helped the client, which was involved in an exercise of trying to understand, well, what state secrets do they have in their business? And it was you know, the memorandum we produced for that. And this is all before cybersecurity law even. This, this is an exercise we did back in about 2015. And it's a memo about the thick, which tried to define what a state secret is based on, you know, there's some industry classifications, there was some, a bit of jurisprudence and so on. Um, but ultimately it leaves you with a very open-ended answer. And I think the, the only answer I can give to you is it probably is overlap um, because we the state secrets regime, there are types of data which are subject to industry classification already. And I mentioned a couple of those mapping data, um, uh, the, the data that autonomous vehicles collect and there are specific regulations around those. And now could it be both a state secret or a, and a, a, you know, a critical data? I'm sure, I'm sure it could. Um, to give a, a real life example, we were evaluating a product for a client where there was concern that um, you know even real estate prices could be considered sensitive enough politically that well is there a chance that it's a you know a state secret and it seems extraordinary but you, the problem with the lack of clarity in the law you can't actually rule it out and so I think the, the upside to what data security law proposes is industry regulators will actually go through and I think classify with greater precision what data is um, you know, sensitive and which is, which is not, and of course, which is core. Um, but we're, as Richard mentioned, we're very early days on that. There are a few industry regulators who have started that cataloging process that we're aware of. Um, it, that sounds like a, a mountain of an exercise to do. So we're a long way away from that, but I actually think it, it probably would be better to have that sort of regime rather than an open-ended uh, state secret regime. But that said, I'm, uh, it's an open question as to whether the Chinese authorities would view having a closed set of categories would be sufficient for their purposes. Um, and I think the feeling would be no. And so we're, I think we're always going to have a state secret regime. We'll have classification under DSL. We'll have industry regulators doing their own classifications. It's going to be very messy. Okay, great. So let me give the floor to um, the last question to the lady wearing beautiful pink mask. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, 
Oh, good. <laughs> oh, thank you for this wonderful comment and the, the great, great timing for me to conclude the panel today. I mean, um, we we all we all see right. I mean, this is really difficult topic. Um, we have a lot of challenging issues, and but I think they also present a lot of opportunities. For our students here, we're giving them a lot of business, a lot of hours, right? A lot of money out there. So, uh, there are too many. Okay, yeah. So, so uh, come and take my course. Okay, and it, it it takes not just me, my effort, and I also want to draw in the talents on this panel here. If you have time, come and drop by and guest lecture in my class. It takes a village to teach this class. This is extremely difficult, and I learned a great deal from you guys today. So, thank you all. And we have the next panel coming up soon. Now is the tea break. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, thanks, Dean, for in initiating this event. And uh, mm. it's my great honor and privilege to um, moderate this panel of the uh, distinguished uh, speakers, who are uh, consisting of a government official in charge of IP matters, and also prominent IP scholars from the top law schools in Hong Kong and in mainland China, and also practitioners who are very experienced in IP uh, practice in a Great Bay Area. And they are going to offer their insight and the foresight about the uh, harmonization of IP regimes in Great Bay Area and also the associated uh, challenges. Okay, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, the first speaker of the, uh, this panel, that is uh, Professor uh, Chui Guobing. And our panel will be very different from the first panel. I will adopt the more traditional format that allows speaker to speak about 14 to 15 minutes and then uh, we'll have about uh, 15, minute, uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, discussion at the end. Okay, um, so uh, I'll also be very brief in introducing uh, all the speakers um, and you all have the, the, their bios um, so you can see the details of their background. Um, the first speaker, Professor Chui Guobing, who is a professor of law, also the director of the Center for Intellectual Property at Tsinghua University Law School. And uh, his topic will be on the um, uh, harmonization of arbitral award on patentability between uh, H8, uh, HKSAR and Mainland. Let's welcome Professor Tri. Okay. Thank you, Professor Li, for inviting me to be part of this great event. Uh, 
I uh, personally am very happy to see quite a lot of old friends here. Uh, today, I would to talk a little bit about uh, uh, in very relatively technical issue about the harmonization of the uh, Hong Kong and mainland China's law on the arbitration or patentability issue. Uh, okay, the first one I talk about the general introduction to the background. What means the arbitrability of patent validity issue? Uh, in mainland China, we have a arbitration law. The Article Three uh, defines the scope of the <clears throat> of the issues that could be referable for arbitration. Article Three say the arbitration law provides the party may not arbitrate issues that are not to be determined by uh, administrative bodies. Here's the the article say. Uh, the following dispute may not be arbitrated, uh, including the uh, two items. The first one is marital adoption, guardianship, all these kind of things are relevant to personality interests. So the law made it clear this kind of personality interests or personality rights could not be subject to arbitration. The second one is about the administrative dispute that should be handled by administrative bodies as prescribed by, the, by law. So here, Article 3 of the Chinese arbitration laws um, require if the, uh, the issue should be determined by the administrative agency, and then this issue should not be arbitrated. The law does not spell out the issue of arbitrability of a patent or IP dispute, but it's widely believed that the validity issue, validity of patent should be determined by the re-examination and the invalidated department of the Chinese Patent Office here, the China National IP Agency. So if we believe it is kind of a thing should be determined by the agency and then according to this article, it's pretty clear this kind of dispute on patent validity should not be arbitrated under the Chinese mainland law. And if you do ignore this kind of rule and do this kind of arbitration, and then this Article 35 may be applied. They say if the matters decided in a word exceeded the scope of arbitration, and then the court could uh, refuse to honor the decision, or could the one party could apply for uh, setting aside the arbitration award. That's the uh, Chinese law. And the second, now I move to the second one, I have a very brief introduction to the Hong Kong law. I, that's why I choose this one. I, according to my research, I only know there's a, a significant difference between Chinese IP law and the Hong Kong practice. So I choose this one. According to the Hong Kong law, arbitration ordinance, uh, I think it was, uh, I think the recent amendment is in 2018. Uh, the arbitration uh, ordinance allows a dispute on patentability to be arbitrated. Here's the, the, the section 103C, it clearly say a dispute over IP, including validity and ownership and other issue, and uh, make this kind of IPR dispute attributable. And also here, article 103D emphasize even the the foreign law or the Hong Kong law does not make it clear whether uh, IP dispute on validity is uh, arbitrable or not. Uh, even there's no keep silent on this. That does not make this kind of uh, dispute in, in attributable uh, under the, this kind of ordinance. So according, according to this kind of rule, even a foreign country's law does not say anything about the arbitrability of the dispute. I, I guess the ordinance will view this kind of dispute as arbitrable under the Hong Kong law. And interesting, uh, the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance also incorporate um, the article 40, 40, uh, 34 of the, uh, the model law, uh, the unicital uh, model law. According to this kind of model law, if an uh, agreement is uh, according to the, uh, under the foreign law, it's not uh, arbitrable. And then this kind of agreement to arbitrate maybe should be viewed as an uh, invalid. If the agreement is invalid, and then the party is could, one of the party could seek for setting aside the 
uh, arbitral award. I think that that means that Hong Kong law also allowed the party to challenge this kind of reward, right? If the agreement is to be viewed as a valid, an invalid one under the, the, the foreign law. So the Hong Kong law basically allows the, the party to arbitrate, the, arbitrate this kind of uh, validity issue. But if the agreement is against the, the foreign law, maybe I, I, according to this rule, the parties could uh, seek him for uh, judicial uh, court uh, decision to set aside this kind of decision. That's the, the, the difference between Chinese law and the, and the Hong Kong law. China, Chinese law, the mainland Chinese law uh, does not allow this kind of arbitration, but the Hong Kong law does allow. So, and then uh, most to the third one is a uh, very brief introduction to other countries practice. Now, I think many common law country allow this kind of attribution, including United States, UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, and also some, I think several law country like Swiss, Belgium, and France allow this kind of attribution. That's the, the first one is a background on the attributability of uh, patentability issue uh, surround this world. Here, we mainly focus on the difference between the mainland law and the Hong Kong law. The second uh, key issue is uh, attributability and uh, public interest. Under the Chinese law, why we treat the, uh, the validity dispute as uh, could not be arbitrated, I think the theory is pretty simple. Say, uh, according to the Chinese law, uh, once the, the decision has been made by the government here, the decision to grant a patent has been made by a government agency. And then all the parties, including court or private parties, should respect the court, the, the government decision, unless uh, the decision has been invalidated uh, through a legal process. Here, the legal procedure to invalidate the patent is very clear, right? You need to seek uh, to file an administrative appeal to the patent office. And then the patent office will determine whether the patent should be invalid or not. Only when uh, the government agency itself invalidates its own decision. And, and then this, uh, the, the whole society could uh, ignore the patent, right? Even the, before a patent office to do so, everyone should respect the, the government decision. That's so-called the respect for, uh, to the authority of the government agency. That's the legal uh, theory underlying this kind of rule. Uh, but actually this kind of rule is uh, a very technical one, right? why we should respect the court, uh, the, the government authority. That has another types of uh, expl uh, explanation. For example, if we say the arbitral award is only binding to the parties, so the patent is still there, right? So we don't uh, directly arbitration, uh, uh, arbitral award uh, does not directly invalid a uh, patent. We only bound the parties. So if you accept this kind of explanation, you could easily circumvent this kind of principle, right? We should, uh, under which we should respect the government authority. So the key issue is not whether the government agency's authority should be respected or not. It's, uh, it's easily to work around, right? The real problem is whether there's a public interest required uh, for us to respect a uh, patent, right? To avoid this kind of arbitration on patent validity issue. Here, I try to argue that that really has a uh, public interest concern. Uh, here, I use uh, US Supreme Court exam case as an example to show the public interest underlying the, this kind of dispute. Here's a very famous one, the Lear versus other case case. It's about uh, license estoppel whether the, the in a license agreement the cover the patent owner could restrict the license freedom or right to challenge the validity of the patent uh, before this civil court case uh, the, the, in the united states uh, license is uh, is toppled from doing so of course uh, according to this kind of theory say uh, a license should not be permitted to enjoy the benefit afforded by the agreement while simultaneously urging that patent 
which forms the basis of agreement is a void. I think that uh, the, the, the logic is pretty clear, right? On one hand, you probably rely on the license to get some benefit. On the other hand, the license might want to go to the court, challenge the validity of the court. So they don't want to the, 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 the license to benefit from these two, two perspectives. So that's the so-called license is topple doctrine. But in 1970s, <clears throat> 1969, the Supreme Court uh, overruled the, this kind of uh, license estoppel uh, doctrine, say the license may often be the only individual with enough economic incentive to challenge the patent, patentability of an inventor's discovery. If the, the licensee are muzzled, the public may continually be required to pay tribute to would be monopolist without need for or justification. I think the, the doctrine is pretty simple. Say, if we honor this agreement, uh, which uh, prevent uh, licensee from challenging the validity, and then probably no one else want to challenge the, the patent, right? So the public don't know that the, 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 the weakness of this kind of patent. So they probably keep paying this kind of right rate to the patent owner. So it's this kind of, uh, uh, rule will harm the public interest. So the court are now uh, ignore this kind of agreement on the, the non-challenge, the, 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 the patent of validity uh, challenge articles. So allow the patent licensee to challenge the patentability. Uh, so follow the same rule if we return to arbitration case, if we allow the party to arbitrate the dispute on patent validity, patentability issue, that means sometime Maybe a patent, if you go through a judicial uh, litigation, a court may invalidate this kind of a patent, right? But if you don't, you just go through an arbitration procedure. Maybe the arbitra uh, arbitration committee, the, the arbitral panel will probably affirm the validity of this kind of patent. So the public lose a chance, right? To invalidate the, this kind of uh, patent. So that's the follow the same logic, like in the court, in the, the Beckman case, the court say, we are, in, in awkward, uh, we are in accord with the district court view that such question of patent validity are inappropriate for arbitration proceedings. So they want to, they, to go through the, the, uh, the, the, the litigation rather than arbitration. That's the, the, the judicial practice in 1970s. But as we know, in 1985, the U.S. Uh, have a legislation. They abolished this kind of uh, principle, this kind of practice, and uh, started to allow the party to arbitrate uh, the patent validity issue. That's the <clears throat> U.S. practice. I use this two cases just want to show you. That's really a serious uh, public interest concern uh, relating to the arbitrability. Uh, of a patent of validity issue. Uh, so that's the, 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 the theory. Now we, why the, the, in Hong Kong, they choose to ignore this kind of public interest concern, right? Open the, uh, the validity issue to be arbitrable. I, I guess the Hong Kong may have a different interest. They, they don't have a, a manufacturing center and they have a relatively, Hong Kong has a relatively small market for patent owners. And also, uh, I guess uh, the arbitration is a very important business for Hong Kong, right? It's as a important arbitration venue. So they have a different public interest. So they don't uh, worry about the public interest in having an invalid patent. But in mainland China have a different policy. So uh, my third, uh, uh, to issue is whether China in the future will change its attitude. Uh, personally, I think probably it would be very difficult for China to change its uh, attitude. Uh, here I explain why. The first one, China have a very uh, large manufacturing industry. Uh, I have participated in some discussion with them. They oppose this kind of reform because they they probably believe the, the foreign uh, patent owners, especially SP owners, may force them to accept this kind of arbitration clause. And then this arbitration, uh, the, this kind of arbitral award may probably, to, most of the time, may prove this kind of uh, patent owner. 
So they are worried about this kind of uh, problems. He lobbied against for a legislative re reform. The first one is China has a manufacturing industry, which probably will prevent uh, the legislator from doing this kind of reform. The second one is a uh, uh, patent office uh, attitude. Uh, as we know, China has a dual track system. Uh, if you have uh, in a patent litigation case, you want to challenge the validity of the patent, you simply could not raise patent validity as a defense in a, uh, uh, infringement cases. You need to file a uh, case before the patent office first, right, to challenge the validity through administrative procedure. So the patent office has uh, this kind of monopoly over the, 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 the determining the, the, the validity of the uh, patent. Uh, that's the, the practice. Uh, in, in the past uh, two or three years, that's a huge uh, controversy over whether China would reform this kind of dual track system. Uh, all of, for example, we, whether we should allow a court to review a validity defense directly in a patent infringement uh, litigation. Uh, Supreme Court approved this kind of idea, uh, idea. They make some kind of proposal to the MPC uh, and uh, wish the MPC to reform the law, allow the patent validity defense directly in a litigation, but uh, th this kind of uh, proposal has been make the uh, patent office very angry. If uh, I think they, he organized um, probably five to or even more authors to write articles uh, to be critical of, of the Supreme Court proposal. So later on, the Supreme Court probably withdraw this kind of proposal. Uh, I just want to use this kind of competition between the patent office and the Supreme Court uh, to show maybe the, 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 the trends in the future. I guess if we want to reform the arbitration law, make this kind of dispute arbitrable, and this kind of attribution, attribution probably will become a threat to the patent office uh, monopoly over the, the patent validity issues. Uh, so probably, the patent office in the future will oppose any kind of the reform on this. That's my uh, personal case. The third one, because of when the, the agency or the manufacturing industry do this kind of lobby, they have this kind of uh, real, this kind of public policy justification, as I just mentioned at the very beginning, right? So if we really have a concern of public interests and also the super, maybe the super court also have some concern about the judicial sovereignty, they could probably become a barrier to this kind of reform in the future. So that's why I believe in, in the coming future, it's unlikely for China to abolish this kind of policy. Uh, now I will very, very briefly talk about my personal observation. Uh, I believe China's real interests probably uh, is not, a, uh, it's not to keep this kind of uh, uh, issue in attributable. Instead, I think that the Chinese real interest uh, is consistent with this kind of uh, arbitration. The first one, as we know, the, the arbitration could reduce the litigation cost for the parties, right? It's good for the parties. The second one, uh, because the private parties uh, have some kind of problem in trust uh, foreign countries, the, this kind of uh, judicial system. I think the United States have, the, have faced the same problem. Uh, in 1980s. That's why the U.S. later on removed this kind of ban on arbitration. So in China have the same concern. If we could help the private parties to reduce this kind of transaction cost, it's also in Chinese uh, long-term interest. The third one, if we really have some kind of public interest concern, I think that we could borrow the experience from the United States or other country to reduce this kind of negative impact to accept to an acceptable extent. For example, we require the party, we could require the party report their award to the patent office, right? If the pen, uh, you made this kind of uh, decision and uh, you want you in this kind of decision, you invalidate a patent and then we publicize this kind of decision. It could help the third parties, right? If they really have in incentive to invalidate the same pattern in the future through the administrative procedure, they could do so, right? So this kind of uh, publication of the 
uh, or re the arbitral award could help to reduce the negative impact. And then if you still have a concern, you could uh, keep this kind of rule uh, working, right? We, if necessary, we should allow a court to set aside an arbitral award in the name of the public interest, something like that. So the, I think negative impact on public interests uh, could be reduced to a uh, acceptable level. The third one about the, the last one about uh, public uh, the government authority, I have already mentioned uh, the harm is very limited. Where we simply say we even uh, arbitral award invalidate a patent is still only binding the parties for the third party. The patent is still valid uh, under the Chinese law. So the harm to the authority is very limited one. And the, the last of an argument against the, the current practice, actually it's pretty easy to circumvent this kind of ban. Uh, so if it is very easy to circumvent, why not just all, allow the party to do this kind of arbitration? Okay, okay um, Professor Chui, <laughs> can we leave okay. this question to the uh, Q and A? Okay, uh, no problem. We need to, yeah, we need to move uh, move on. Okay, so, um, uh, sorry. Thank you very uh, much. Just here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and I definitely ask that question. Um, our second speaker uh, will be um, uh, Mr. Thomas Tang, from uh, the Deputy Director of the Hong Kong SAR Intellectual Property Department, department. and he's going to talk about uh, Hong Kong at the IP Trading Center in the Greater, greater Bay Area. Um, good morning to all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for your introduction. Um, well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Faculty of Law of the University of Hong Kong for the invitation. It is really a pleasure to have the opportunity uh, to share with you the latest initiative of the Hong Kong SL government in developing Hong Kong as a regional IP trading center. My presentation, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to walk you through uh, three topics. Well, first of all, it's about the government policy initiative uh, on IP trading. That is a little bit uh, about uh, the historical background. Um, and second uh, is the one of the major driving instruments. It's outlined the 14-year, uh, five-year plan for the national uh, economic and social development and the long-range objectives through the year uh, 2035. This is, uh, in short, known as the 14 5 year plan of the uh, Central People's Government. And the third area which I would like to walk you through is the specific policy measures under the 2022 policy address, uh, which the chief executives has um, delivered uh, in October uh, before the Legislative Council. A little bit of his, uh, history, history about the uh, policy initiative of IP trading. Well, the um, policy uh, was driven um, back to 2013, so nearly 10 years ago, uh, when the then administration uh, decided to set up a working group on IP trading. Now, the working group uh, basically contains members from various industries, uh, 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 members actually came from, for example, the legal industry, uh, legal practitioners, uh, some of the uh, uh, members are from various uh, industry sectors, as well as we do have uh, um, academia uh, in that uh, working group. And uh, after holding um, various discussions, as well as meetings, as well as exchanges with various stakeholders, the working group published a report uh, on IP trading. Basically, the report contained our strategic recommendations as to how Hong Kong should promote itself as an IP trading hub. Um, the reports, uh, well, in short, the reports identified altogether four strategic areas, uh, which uh, the working group recommended the Hong Kong SL government should uh, consider and should uh, 
implement appropriate measures to advance uh, these uh, the objectives of these areas. Now, the first one would be uh, we need to enhance the IP protection regime in Hong Kong, SAR. And uh, the second one would be uh, we need to think about measures as to how to support IP creation as well as IP exploitation. The third area would be how we should uh, bolster the IP intermediary services and manpower capacity. Whereas the IP intermediary services that relates to uh, industry uh, sectors as well as professions relating to uh, facilitating uh, the conduct of IP transactions in the market or in the commercial world. Well, notably that will include uh, the IP practitioners as well as, for example, uh, the accountants, uh, as well as various uh, uh, um, um, IP owners because they are the uh, creators of IP rights as well as uh, in uh, the industrial sectors because they are the one who would would uh, be one of the important uh, chain in the ecosystem to uh, exploit the IP rights as well as the commercialized IP rights from ideas, turning turning ideas into actual products for commercialization. And the fourth one would be uh, we need to uh, devise appropriate measures to pursue promotion, education, internal collaboration. That would uh, mean that uh, we need to uh, raise awareness amongst the publics as well as amongst the stakeholders as to, for example, what is actually IP. And we need to appreciate them that IP is a very important asset which carries values and uh, they should take appropriate steps not only to protect the IP in their own intellectual properties, but also they should know the appropriate strategies to manage those intellectual properties as well as to think how they can exploit and commercialize uh, their intellectual properties in order to maximize uh, the economic values of the assets. Uh, recently, actually uh, in the March 2021, last year, uh, the Central People's Government promulgated the 14th five-year plan. And uh, in chapter 61, of the 14th five-year plan, uh, the Central People's Government gave its first time national support for the Hong Kong SAR to develop uh, itself as a regional IP trading center. So we have the Central People's Government support uh, uh, to the Hong Kong SAR government to advance uh, further policies in order to uh, promote Hong Kong to position ourselves as a regional IP trading center and also uh, to appropriate uh, to, to implement appropriate measures and strategies to achieve our goal. Now I would like to uh, walk uh, members of the audience through the specific policies measures under the recent uh, 2022 policy agenda. Uh, address delivered by the Chief Executive uh, in October. Well, basically, uh, since, nine, since uh, 2015, after the release of the report of, uh, by the IP, uh, uh, by the Working Group on IP Trading, the government has since then in, implemented uh, various uh, multi pronged measures and as well as diversified measures to champion Hong Kong as the regional IP trading center. And also in view of the boost given by the Central People's Government under the 14 uh, five-year plan, uh, the chief executive in his first policy address uh, identified three major strategies or approaches in order to uh, uh, help Hong Kong to further uh, develop uh, itself as a regional IP trading center. Well, basically the approaches more or less mirror the strategic recommendations given by the working group on IP trading. Uh, the first one would be, it is always the uh, one of the important as, as well as the determined measures of the government to promote IP trading is to continue to enhance our IP protection regime. Uh, the second one would be we would uh, take appropriate measures to further strengthen capacity building amongst the stakeholders, uh, meaning to 
enhance their knowledge, their professional knowledge uh, in terms of protection, management, and commercialization of intellectual property as a valuable, intangible asset. And the third one, we would also strengthen the external uh, promotion and education because IP is a, uh, uh, to be an IP trading hub, we must have an IP ecosystem. The, co the government is part of it. And we do acknowledge and we do treasure. We have partners in the private sector as well as in, for example, the tertiary institution, universities, uh, research centers. They are also part of our uh, very important stakeholders in uh, we need to collaborate with them uh, so that we can work together to advance our goal. For enhancement of IP regime, uh, the IP regime basically uh, protects various kinds of IP, right? The first one would be the trademark regimes. Well, obviously, the trademark regimes uh, seeks to protect brands. It seeks to protect trade origins, um, trademarks, and it is a registrable rights in Hong Kong. Well, uh, we will take forward uh, uh, take take forward uh, the the appropriate um, steps to implement the international registration system under the protocol related to Madrid Agreement concerning the international registration of parks. Well, that is actually an international registration system facilitating trademark owners to apply trademark protections in multiple jurisdictions. Under the Madrid Protocol, the trademark owners can file a single application designating various uh, jurisdictions uh, to apply for trademark protections instead of uh, filing individual trademarks application in uh, the relevant domestic uh, jurisdiction. So that is, a that is an international registration system helping trademark owners to save time and cost in acquiring multiple, uh, in acquiring trademark protections in multiple jurisdictions. Now, the government has passed the Trademarks Amendment Ordinance, uh, ordinance back in 2020 and uh, has been taking various steps uh, in order to implement the uh, international registration system under the Madrid Protocol. And one of the targets given in the policy address is we have to introduce a subsidiary legislation into the Legislative Council next year. And that, sub that subsidiary legislation would basically contain the relevant filing requirements as well as the procedures uh, for applying uh, or for, for seeking trademark protections in Hong Kong through the Madrid Protocol. And apart from the uh, introduction of the relevant subsidiary legislation, the Intellectual Property Department is also uh, taking various critical steps in order to have the system in place. For example, we are updating our IT system. We also need to enhance our work uh, examination uh, menus, as well as we need to conduct uh, promotions and publicities among the stakeholders so that they are aware of uh, the advantages uh, under the Madrid Protocol. Now, the second uh, very important IP regime is the copyright regime. Uh, as you know, copyright protects the uh, expression of ideas uh, known as the copyright works, for example, books, movies, uh, cable programs, television programs, um, sound recording. They also fall under the copyright protections. And the government, in, in order to in, in order to strengthen the pro uh, copyright protection in the digital world, the government introduced uh, a uh, bill, the Copyright Amendment Bill 2022, in June uh, before the Legislative Council. And uh, one of the mission or one of the uh, targets which the government wish uh, uh, to achieve is we strive uh, to assist the Legislative Council to uh, pass the amendment bill so that uh, the, 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 the legislative proposals for protecting copyrights works in the digital environment can be enhanced and strengthened. And I'm pleased to update you that the Bills Committee of the Legislative Council has already completed scrutiny of the bill. And it is expected that uh, the bill, uh, subject to uh, various uh, procedures and formalities before the Legislative Council, the bill uh, may uh, be ready for resumption of the second reading debate uh, in early December. And uh, we, we are aware that the uh, amendment bill uh, may not be able to address each and every new copyright issues. For example, open work, for example, whether the copyright protection term should be extended, for example, whether Hong Kong should introduce a registration system for copyright work. So we are aware of the importance that the 
review of our copyright system needs to be ongoing and we need to maintain our momentum in this area. So the chief executive, uh, uh, one of the very important measures is that we need to embark a new round of copyright uh, review upon bringing the amendment ordinance into the operation, which hopefully the amendment ordinance would be uh, implemented or would come into force uh, sometime next year. Now, patents regime. Another very important IP regime for protecting innovation, for protecting invention, for protecting uh, uh, creativities uh, based on uh, technologies. Uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, implemented uh, uh, our own original brand patent system back in December 2019. Uh, the beauty of the system is that the system enabled direct filing uh, of standard patent applications in Hong Kong uh, without actually need, uh, requiring the patent applicants to file a correspondent patent application in various uh, designated patent offices, which is we had been operating under the registration system back in 1997. Uh, the, one of the important uh, uh, objectives is we need to uh, enhance the substantive examination capacity because under the uh, uh, re-registration system, we only conduct format examination. We don't actually need to conduct substantive, substantive examination to determine the patentability of the inventions. And upon introducing the original grant patent system, we need to conduct substantive examination. And because of uh, the need to enlist uh, technical expertise in this area, we have uh, en uh, engaged uh, the uh, um, China Patent Office to, uh, to provide us expertise to conduct a standard examination. But we need to work on our own. So we would enhance our uh, standard examination capacity by gradually increase the manpower of the patent registry to conduct a standard examination. Hopefully, by 2013, we would be able to conduct a standard examination uh, with our own institutional uh, autonomy. And the other uh, measures is uh, because patent protection is territorial, which means, which means that if you apply for patent protection in mainland, that protection won't be automatically extended to Hong Kong. So basically, you have to apply for patent protection in Hong Kong, I say, our government as well. So this is territorial uh, uh, concept. But in order to assist the uh, Hong Kong applicant to uh, apply for patent protection in the mainland, uh, we are uh, working with the Chinese Patent Office or the known as the uh, CNIPA uh, to roll a pilot project uh, to work out a scheme to enable Hong Kong applicants to enjoy prioritized examination of their qualified patent application in Maine. Well, because of the uh, time, I would walk through the, uh, uh, the rest of my PowerPoints and I'm happy to talk more during the panel discussions. Um, well, another area is the registered design regime. Uh, the regime, basically, Hong Kong localized our own regime back in 1997, but uh, um, since 1997, there has not been a major review of that, uh, of the registered designs uh, regime. So uh, the government aware of the importance uh, of this area because it registered design basically protect uh, industrial goods, the designs of industrial goods, and uh, it would enhance the commercial values of uh, the industrial goods uh, for uh, enhancing their commercialization. So the target is to launch a, a thorough and comprehensive review of the regime in 2014, and hopefully we can conduct a public consultation uh, in 2025. Now, uh, for manpower capacity uh, building, uh, IPD has already uh, implemented or has already launched an IP training, IP manager uh, training program and um, under the program we provide the uh, training to these small and medium enterprises known as the SSMD because they need resources to update uh, or their knowledge in the areas of IP and the target is we will continue to provide training for these personnel uh, within this term of government uh, and we will also collaborate with the Department of Justice to continue promoting IP mediation and arbitration services that would be very important uh, or an alternative means for IP owners to resolve dispute other than uh, resorting uh, other than uh, through the formal court proceedings. And we would be continue working with the Law Society uh, of Hong Kong to uh, strengthen our cooperation to enhance the free IP consultation services that uh, we offer uh, one sessions, one-to-one -one 
uh, free consultations uh, to small uh, to SME to answer their questions about their IPYs as well as uh, to uh, give them uh, professional advice as to how to resolve uh, uh, disputes. Um, for promotion, we, in, we, we appreciate that it's very important to uh, appreciate the youngsters, the students, as to the importance of IP. So we need to promote IP literacy. So we're going to reach out uh, um, 100,000 uh, students within this term of government in order to enhance their awareness and also, most importantly, because they are uh, the pillars of our future youngsters, uh, to encourage them to uh, act actively explore and, uh, creativity as well as innovate. And the other thing we need to uh, do is to uh, liaise with the mainland authority as well as international organization uh, to promote our positions and our role as a regional IP trading center. And third, uh, a very important partner of uh, IPD is the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. We are going to work, continue working with the Trade Development Council to promote uh, IP trading and professional services through various means, for example, pay missions, uh, manners, uh, publicity program. <laughs> and uh, we are going to have uh, one of the uh, effective IP conference uh, in the event in December, known as the uh, Business of Asia IP uh, Forum, BIP Asia. And that will normally be held, uh, be held in, in December each year um, in order to uh, give a platform for various expert, experts in IP from the local as well as from the overseas uh, uh, jurisdiction to share their ideas about IP and to invite uh, participations amongst various uh, stakeholders uh, to uh, update uh, the latest position in the market and to update the latest uh, uh, changes in relation to, for example, law and regulations concerning IP. Well, uh, I'm sorry because of the time, so um, I can only manage to give you an overview as to the government's uh, uh, policy initiative in order to promote uh, uh, Hong Kong as uh, a regional IP trading hub in order to drive more economic growth. Uh, Thank you very much for thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. Our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Albert Waikid Chang, and who is the founder and the director of the US China Intellectual Property Institute and also the partner of the law offices of uh, Albert Chang. Um, so, his, uh, thank you very much for Professor Lee. Uh, I love to see the dean actually still sitting here for all the IP. I would like to take a poll first. How many of you actually take some introduction uh, pen card? Nobody. Okay, great. So when I come to a meeting like this, when all the speakers are running over time, it really tells you that because the issues are so urgent, I promise you that I'm going to finish my speech in seven minutes. If I'm over the seven minutes, you can expect. So it's very hard if you don't really have a pet concept. And pet is really one of the most powerful weapons you can have in, in this intangible world. Because you have the exclusive right, and it's very powerful. And as our country, spending all the time, we have a lot of resources. So you should go to the HKITV website and read about it. I'm very lucky. I'm a patent, patent, uh, patent attorney. I love all the high tech and everything. Here is a little bit. Like overall, we'll talk about all this region. Zhejiang, nine plus two, right? So, but we have three different systems. So it's a little bit chaotic for you. You have not really taken any pen classes, right? But it's okay. I think I did the Zheng Chu three, right? I saw the three consultations, we'll go through everything. So all the three districts, they actually have three diff totally different like jurisdictions. And as I probably talk about uh, all these harmonization, everything, so it's going to make you drowsy, but don't be afraid. Just the ball you go. Macau, look at the number. Is it important? Maybe, maybe not. Whole year you have a thousand. Who cares? Us, right? So Zhang Chu is a way that we better. We are better. Look at all the numbers. Here's the original thing that Zhang Chu is talking about, right? Thomas was talking about, right? We start the process. It's complicated. You first have to train the trainers, right? What are the examiners? We have to rely on big company law, 
So we're relying a lot in the in China and everything to do many things. But still, twenty thousand. Hey, here comes the baby. Look at China. Look at China. Look at the numbers. Right, fascinating numbers. Right. So IP. When we talk about IP, when we talk about intangible asset, we have the really thing. Right. This is the real player. Right. The whole world. We have 1.4 billion people. We have 1.4 pockets and the intangible asset. So three system complicated, right? We when you talk about the right, we have to talk about dreams. Dreams are defining your rights. And so when you're three different jurisdictions. You would have three different sets of claims. So, which is which, right? So, again, there are many terminology. Claim prosecution highway, meaning you can go in very fast. Thomas has talked about it. All the Hong Kong people try very hard to create pilot programs so that we go to China and do prioritization determination so we don't have to follow the regular queue. So, we would basically call it Team so that you can jumpstart all your rights, right? So, again, learn from that, right? So we, Hong Kong, are very innovative. A lot of people don't know that we are so innovative in terms of our protection. We create this wonderful system. It's called a short-term pattern, which practically have many, many features. If you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of resources, do a short-term pattern, please, right? However, very unfortunately, well, probably it's, there's no number here. But the rough number is that Thomas probably can tell us, right? 700, 800 last year, not even a thousand. So I always encourage all the people, if you're a practitioner, very interestingly, when I'm setting up my practice in IP in Hong Kong, being a US practitioner, I actually didn't know that all these IP practice is not all practice, even though we taught in the law school. So. With all this, I think that if you're open-minded, you want to enter the field, this is a wonderful place, right? Hong Kong short pattern. Finally, this is a very important slide, right? Go back, go back to China. Go back there, and then they have all the IP5, everything is very modernized over in China. So still, relying on this CNIPA, the Chinese intellectual property agents, people will really have to. So my overall plan strategy is that you can start in Hong Kong, do a short pattern, and then go to China. Now, of course, very unfortunately, I'm American, right? I believe in America and everything. So you can do the US provisional as well, right? So if you're familiar with that. But these, this will be final substantive slides, right? So you can start with Hong Kong short pattern, going through the so-called Paris Convention type of policy claim, then go down in this particular path, and then you can button it and go to all these three jurisdictions. Did I need the seven minutes? Maybe. Okay. So I don't want to rush everybody. So if everyone wants to talk with me during lunchtime, I would love to talk with you because I know that there's two more distinguished speakers. I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert, for saving some time for us. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be um, Professor Jian Li, who is a professor of law of Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong. And he's also the director of the Center for Legal Innovation and Digital Society uh, of CUHK. Um, he's going to talk about copyright protection for AI-generated works in uh, GBA. Um, welcome, Professor Li. Uh, thank you, Yang Hong. Hello, everyone here. Hello, uh, my friend Bo Bing in Beijing. Uh, so uh, Yang Hong reminded me many times that I need to be brief. Uh, so <laughs> probably I could not think within seven minutes, but uh, uh, I, I will try to be fast because uh, I understand that we have a full panel of five presentations and I am uh, actually presenting between you and lunch. Um, so uh, the topic today is about uh, uh, copyright protection for AI-generated uh, content. 
Um, so uh, we all know, so AI can do a lot of this nowadays, uh, including uh, creation. Uh, and in the Greater Bay Area, I would say uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen in particular, uh, that we put a lot of resources in AI development. Uh, so one of the major issues is that uh, uh, AI generated works, are they copyrightable or not? Um, so, um, right, my slides. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, if you take a more a comparative perspective, you will see uh, in the majority of the jurisdiction, AI uh, generated works are actually not copyrightable uh, in US, in Europe. Uh, but very interesting to see that here uh, in Hong Kong uh, and in mainland China, so we have a case uh, in Shenzhen, uh, which actually uh, recognized the copyrightability of AI uh, generated works. So I would just introduce this very, very quickly. So in United States, so the US Copyright Office made it very clear, uh, if a work is not created by human beings, uh, you are not going to get any copyright registration. So which is that uh, uh, you don't get any copyright protection for AI generated works. Uh, and in EU, so according to case law, as well as the EU directive, so uh, they actually reached the same conclusion, which is that AI generated work is not copyrightable because you fail to see the so-called human creativity or originality in the creation of the work. Uh, but that is actually uh, not like a, a case everywhere. So the case of Hong Kong or the case of Shenzhen, so we see something very different. So here in Hong Kong, this is our copyright law. Uh, so we have a very special type of a copyright work called uh, computer generated works. Uh, so that is actually a transplant from uh, UK. So in UK, they have the uh, CPDA uh, 1988, so which recognized the copyrightability of the so-called computer generated work. Uh, and most of the practitioners believe uh, this, this clause can be applied to the so-called AI generated work. Uh, and we have very similar uh, provisions in other Commonwealth jurisdictions as well, which includes uh, Ireland, New Zealand, India, and of course, uh, that comes from UK. Um, so uh, in UK, uh, if you recognize the copyrightability of AI generated work, who is exactly the author, so according to the law, uh, that is the person who makes necessary arrangement to the creation. Uh, and then here's the problem, who is the person that makes necessary arrangement? Uh, is that AI programmer uh, or the AI user? So in UK, we have a case, uh, but that is not for AI generated work. That is actually the uh, screenplay uh, uh, during a video game. Uh, and then the court made that very clear uh, that it is not uh, the user or the player. It is actually the programmer uh, that makes necessary arrangement. So in other words, if you apply the to AI generated work, so who write that uh, AI algorithm would be the author of AI generated work who can own copyright over that AI generated work. Uh, and in Shenzhen, so we have a very interesting case, uh, which was decided in the end of the 2019, uh, right before the outbreak of the COVID. Uh, and in that case, uh, so Tencent developed a very, very uh, interesting AI application, uh, which is the so-called DreamWriter. So DreamWriter can write articles automatically, uh, basically just analysis of the stock market. Uh, so you can basically set this uh, requirement of what stock market, what period of time uh, that you would like to uh, do the analysis, and they can also provide prediction. Uh, and in that case, uh, because uh, the article is generated by AI, so someone just took that uh, uh, without permission of Tencent, and uh, uh, that defendant basically argued this is not copyrightable uh, because in, United, uh, in China, so uh, the standard of originality mostly uh, translated from United States. And in US, this is not copyrightable, so this should not be copyrightable uh, either in China. Uh, and then uh, that was the argument made by the defendant. And then Tencent was trying to prove uh, human involvement and originality uh, in the production of that uh, uh, AI generated content. So basically, uh, Tencent tried to uh, categorize uh, the process of the production into these four uh, stages. And in each stage, Tencent tried to argue this is not decided by AI. So we actually decide a rule, and AI just follow our rule to do that. Uh, so this is where we can find a human uh, creation. Uh, so that is the litigation strategy uh, by Tencent. And eventually, so that actually surprised many people at that time. So which is that uh, uh, the court both the argument of Tencent and recognized the copyrightability uh, of this AI-generated content by Dream Writer, uh, and which, of course, take a very different approach, uh, different from the previous original approach uh, that mostly translates from uh, the US law. 
Uh, and uh, basically, the idea is somehow relevant to this concept of a compilation because uh, Tencent successfully argued uh, there is original selection and arrangement uh, of some raw material, uh, and there is where we can find human creativity. And then many people argue, so the Greater Bay Area, in particular, Hong Kong and uh, Shenzhen are ready to embrace AI uh, in terms of AI-generated uh, content because this is copyrightable only here in Bay Area, but not in other parts of the world. So uh, my question is that, uh, are we really ready for that just because that we can provide protection for AI-generated content? So I don't think that is that simple uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, I think it's about incentive. So if you don't need that incentive in our society, so the monopoly provided by AI to bring social costs, so that might not be uh, just by this kind of a social cost or a monopoly. Uh, so if you take a look at the investment in AI technology around the world, so uh, most of the countries, they don't provide that protection, but uh, the investment still uh, is going up in recent years. So that might be one of the reasons that you don't need copyright protection at all. Uh, number two, um, so if we have that AI work, so this is the process, we have programmers, uh, they write AI algorithm, and then these programmers can, uh, of course, uh, this AI software is so intelligent, so smart, and they can generate something like the poems, the article, like the article created by a dream writer. So what about IP? So uh, programmers can, of course, go copyright, sometimes pattern uh, over this uh, computer program. Uh, there is already one uh, set of IP uh, from that creation. And if you give programmer another IP over uh, AI-generated uh, content, so that it's actually another IP. So you basically, you can get two types of IP from one single uh, uh, creation. And then the policy issue here is that uh, are we provide just too much reward for a creator because uh, we actually are not going to give like too much reward that will be bad for the society, too much social cost. So we want to have the optimal uh, level of reward. Uh, and then in this debate, sometimes uh, I just think that uh, uh, in the history of copyright law, uh, we always repeatedly see this kind of a debate. Uh, so this is a, a decision by the uh, Supreme Court in the United States in the 19th century, so which was about whether uh, photos can be copyrightable. Uh, this is a photo of Oscar Wilde. Uh, and of course, this is a common thing for all copyright practitioners that uh, the photos, of course, are copyrightable. But at that time, so the argument made by most of the artists at that time was that uh, this is, of course, not copyrightable. You just use the machine, you press the button. There is no human creativity at all. Uh, but the Supreme Court in that case explained that, oh, uh, it's actually still some creativity. You need to pay attention to the angle, the shadow, the object. This is where we find human creativity. Uh, and we see very similar debate in uh, copyrightability of AI-generated content. Uh, and then I think everyone uh, know that uh, uh, the, the technology and education is changing very fast. Uh, in these days, so our kids are learning coding uh, in school. So probably the way that they use AI to create would be very different from us. Uh, and the other thing that we need to think about is there are some uh, doctrinal issues. So uh, if we say that the programmer is the owner of the AI-generated content, so is that correct? So that might be much more complicated than the British case Nova, uh, because in the AI-generated uh, uh, word process, there are a lot of stakeholders. They all play very important roles, such as investors, not only programmers, machine operators, uh, trainers for the so-called data providers. So among all these stakeholders, so who is the person uh, that can own copyright? So it's not that easy to uh, determine. And sometimes AI may collaborate with human beings as well. Uh, and if that happens, so do you mean that the pro programmer and the person who will collaborate with that uh, uh, AI should be uh, co-authors? So that is still uh, disputable. And this is actually happening here. Uh, Sony has this AI who can collaborate with the uh, human composers. Uh, and that will probably completely change our understanding of the so-called joint authorship. And not only that, uh, a lot of these uh, AI algorithms, so they are open source uh, projects. So which means that uh, uh, they are contributed by uh, programmers, contributors around the world. So there might be hundreds of thousands authors of a single piece of software. So are they all authors? If they are all authors, how could we enforce copyright 
Uh, and this is actually happening. A lot of the Google uh, AI projects are open sourced. Um, and then other than that, a more complicated issue is that uh, uh, AI, of course, can generate uh, software. So what about if AI generates software and that software generates another software and the software just keeps generating different software? So you have like different generations of the AI generated uh, works. And that is also happening. Google has its auto ML project, so which develop like different generations of products. It's endless production. And can you argue, are you feel comfortable uh, that uh, uh, the person who can develop this kind of software can just endless own all these different generation of uh, uh, different AI generated works? So these are all unsolved issues. So when we say that we are ready to embrace AI in our copyright law in Greater Bay Area, I do think uh, we are actually not ready because there are a lot of complicated questions that we need to think about. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jian. Uh, thank you for saving some time uh, uh, as well. Our last speaker will be the Dr. Haifeng Huang, who is a partner uh, of uh, John States uh, in charge of uh, intellectual property practice in the Greater Bay Area. Um, He's going to speak at uh, territoriality, extraterritoriality application and the harmonization of uh, IP from a uh, uh, GBA perspective. Uh, he's going to wrap up uh, about everything we are going to talk, talk about and uh, with the focus on the trademark. Thank you, Thank you uh, Yahong. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I saw some students attending uh, this uh, uh, conference as well. Good to see you guys. Your attendance has been well recognized by Yahoo and myself. Um, uh, the topic uh, about the extraterritorial application, uh, it, which is a little sensitive in the backdrop uh, of the uh, long arm jurisdiction uh, from the United States and also some recent um, anti foreign uh, sanction law uh, from, the, from China side. Uh, but the good news uh, from the IP perspective is this topic in this area. Uh, is uh, much less sensitive, uh, more technical, and much more fascinating um, for this for this sort of discussion uh, from the IG perspective. Um, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and also to a certain extent, uh, trade secrets, um, they're all called um, under this category of intellectual property. But if you look at the history, um, none of them has been treated as uh, property or has never been universally recognized uh, to be protected as a form of uh, property. Uh, in most cases, all this right, um, patents, trademarks, uh, copyrights, to, to the certain extent, trade secret as well, uh, they will be considered as the local rights. Um, they're granted by the government of you know, each uh, different jurisdictions. Um, and, and then, so that's why uh, all those rights um, are limited to the jurisdiction uh, where those rights have been granted, and they're only valid uh, within that jurisdiction. And also the uh, law enforcement authorities, uh, courts or other you know, agencies, they can only have power uh, to enforce the, um, the local rights, uh, have no jurisdiction to look at the rights of foreign countries. And also uh, in the same fashion, they, can only, uh, they are only able to address the infringement and then are committed uh, within the local jurisdiction. They are not allowed uh, to look at the infringement that are committed outside of the jurisdiction. So this is the typical uh, territoriality of intellectual property. Um, traditionally, this has been a uh, very well accepted theory uh, in most jurisdictions. And the law theory in China, I think this is very popular uh, in China as well. If you talk, talk to certain judges, talk to the scholars or professors in, in China, they all recognize uh, IP has to be uh, territorial. Uh, but nowadays, uh, there, there is no longer such absolute uh, territoriality uh, in the IP area as well. You know, with the uh, globalization and also digitalization, and uh, to the certain extent, uh, regionalization as well. Uh, so you see an increasing uh, flow of goods and service across the borders. Um, so that's why you, you have seen a lot of efforts you know, in the probably in the past, you know, 50, 80 or 100 years, people try to facilitate the procurement and protection of um, intellectual property rights across the borders. So that's why you see the Paris Convention, you see the Bernie Convention, and also you see CHIPS as well. 
um, for example, you know, one of the articles under the CHIPS agreement, you know, was saying, you know, even for a trademark, uh, which is not registered in a member country, um, but the red trademark is, you know, has been well known or famous in the other member country. And then that trademark own registered in your own country and needs to be protected uh, to a certain extent as well, but may not be as protected as a registered trademark right, but should be protected to certain forms. So that is the form of extraterritorial recognition of trademark rights uh, through CHIPS agreement. And I think Europe Union has done a lot of effort. You know, they have established a EPO, a unified you know, patent office, to look at all these patent prosecution issues, the process uh, within the union. And also, I think the last two or three years, they have established this UPC, uh, Unitary uh, Patent Court. Uh, so this court can also look at all this patent dispute within the member states of the uh, European Union. So that's why you see a lot of you know, extraterritorial extensions or discussions um, among different countries and among different uh, jurisdictions. So nowadays, when we talk about this territorial of IP, you will see absolute territorial clarity, which is related to registration and also validity and also the ownership of existing uh, IP rights in each different jurisdiction. But people will also recognize uh, the territoriality must be relative for certain other aspects of IP issues, such as infringement and, and also contract as well. Uh, in terms of uh, infringement, a lot of you know, jurisdictions, particularly US, uh, has um, uh, made a, you know, a number of different attempts uh, to try to see you know, what type of infringement uh, cases can be adjudicated uh, by the local court, but those at, at a dispute may have certain international uh, elements. Uh, in the, for example, in the trademark areas, uh, there are some cases. I think this morning I also saw news in Supreme People's Court. A Supreme Court from the United States has accepted uh, a case, you know, for a retrial uh, review. They look at, you know, if both parties are within the United States, but the other party committed tra trademark infringement in a foreign country, whether the foreign sales of those uh, infringement goods can be uh, adjudicated, um, you know, domestically by a U.S. district court. And that's the issue to be answered by the uh, Supreme Court. And also in the patent litigation areas, and um, you will see you know, some inbound or outbound uh, discussions. Uh, I think the uh, cases have been very clear to say, uh, if you make you know, certain components within the United States and then sell the components to a foreign country, but piece all those components together, that will be infringement of certain US patents. So even you don't piece them, put them together in the United States, but uh, if you make those components, you know, with the specific intention of putting them together in a foreign country, and then the U.S. court will have jurisdiction to look at that uh, dispute as well. And also, you know, from the outbound perspective, if, you know, you practice certain, um, you know, patented process uh, in a foreign country, um, and, and that process has been patented in the United States, and for that product to be imported into the United States, the U.S. court has also recognized uh, it has the power uh, to look at that case as well. And of course, in the contract scenarios, uh, we have similar uh, issues or discussions um, as well. So coming back to, uh, to, to China and Hong Kong, mainland China and Hong Kong, uh, in the past, all these years, you, have, you probably have heard a lot of you know, cases uh, involving the disputes that cross the border uh, between Hong Kong and mainland China. A lot of those cases happen to be uh, in the trademark uh, on-fair competition or passing off uh, areas. Uh, one very typical scenario is uh, you have some you know, men and Chinese parties who come to Hong Kong and set up um, a, a shadow company. Uh, that shadow company may use uh, international brand, maybe Puma, maybe um, you know, all this, you know, the, uh, different international brands. And then they may come back to mainland China and then they will use that you know, brand because they say I have a registered company, um, you know, from Hong Kong. And then they will say, I get a license from this Hong Kong company who allow me to use, um, maybe say, for example, Apple or iPhone uh, in China. And also they will have that, you know, Hong Kong setup company uh, to file applications uh, in China uh, to get certain trademark registrations. Uh, if those trademarks have not been uh, fully registered or, or, you know, in different classes, so that create, creates a lot of disputes about, you know, whether the Chinese court um, can 
um, take any actions against the setup and operation of those uh, companies uh, which are registered in Hong Kong. Or uh, if you do the, if you go ahead to bring the lawsuit in from the China side, and then if you bring the lawsuit from the Hong Kong side, then the question would be, you know, whether the Hong Kong court can issue an injunction against those Hong Kong local companies, you know, for the activities they may be doing, you know, on the China side. You know, they say they file those trademark registrations. You know, they they do all this promotion and all this marketing and do this licensing. Uh, you know, all this on the on the Chinese side. So that issue has been. Um, a real issue uh, for the past years, and also we were likely to see this issue be more prominent uh, in the future. Um, so that's why that push, you know, both sides, you know, to really consider how, you know, with the integration of Hong Kong uh, into the greater Bay Area, is there anything that should be done uh, from both sides, from Chinese side and also from Hong Kong side, to really look at this territorial principle uh, under the international property law on both on, in both jurisdictions. I think one of those efforts was this um, this uh, judicial um, uh, arrangement between Hong Kong and China on the mutual recognition and enforcement uh, of those uh, judgment in civil and, and commercial um, matters. Um, this is a very significant judicial uh, uh, arrangement because it goes beyond even um, the Hague Convention. Uh, Hague Convention does not cover any IT related issues. And Hague Convention specifically excludes all this IT coverage. Uh, but this judicial arrangement specifically covers uh, certain you know, IP uh, matters. Um, it covers copyright infringement, trademark infringement, and also uh, trade secret infringement as well. And for trade secret infringement, the, this judicial uh, arrangement even allow the injunction orders uh, to be issued from either jurisdiction to be recognized and enforced uh, in the other uh, jurisdiction. Uh, of course, it has excluded some other matters like validity or existence or ownership of IP. And also, for some reasons I don't understand, they, you know, this arrangement has also excluded uh, the disputes of those patent infringement. Um, but of course, the, those standard essential patent, you know, friend rent determination dispute has been ex ex uh, ex excluded as well. And also injunction for some long trade secret cases, you know, that um, has been excluded as well. I think this judicial arrangement was discussed back in 2018 and 2019. At that point, you know, China has not really looked at you know, whether it should play a more proactive role uh, in deciding those global uh, you know, rates for the standard essential panel. However, that's the reason um, this arrangement has included the, uh, the, the cases involving the uh, standard essential pattern and also friend rate uh, determination. But I think for the next step, it probably should look at you know, whether it should cover uh, those patent infringement uh, cases as well. Um, I want you to uh, to look at this article because uh, one of the uh, conditions for the judgment to be recognized and also enforced um, uh, for the the other jurisdiction across the border, uh, you know, you, the parties needs to show the original court handling that case has the jurisdiction. If they say you don't have any jurisdiction to handle the case, then you know even if you issue a decision, that decision won't be enforced across the border uh, in the other jurisdictions. So in the IP areas, I think this jurisdictional requirement uh, can be uh, looked at from the two, um, uh, two perspectives. One is they say this infringement needs to be happening uh, within your jurisdiction. Uh, so you have right to, 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 to decide on that case. And the other aspect is you, know, you have to show the local right, a local interest, you know, IP right, IP interest, that, uh, uh, require the protection from the local courts. I think naturally, then the question will come up. Um, will come up. Say, if you have two parties in Hong Kong, two Hong Kong local parties, and then one of the parties committed certain infringement acts uh, in 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 mainland China, and then Hong Kong court will have na natural jurisdiction of power to decide on the disputes on the two Hong Kong parties, right? And then the issue is whether Hong Kong court have power to cover or address those infringement being committed by the defendant on the mainland China side. If they do that, and then I think on the Hong Kong law, Hong Kong court have absolute power to decide on those disputes. But, but that judgment can be enforced you know, through this judicial arrangement um, in mainland China, then that will be a question mark. Um, so, so to a certain extent, people need to look at the arrangement you know, through this territorial and extraterritorial perspectives. The, you know, what else to make sure this sort of arrangement can be more effective 
to resolve all these dispute, disputes, you know, across the uh, cross border, given the future integration of Hong Kong into these larger uh, areas. Of course, there are some, you know, remaining questions as well. For example, if you have parallel proceedings in mainland China and also Hong Kong, um, you know, if one party bring an offensive action in, in Hong Kong and the other party uh, goes back to China to bring um, a, a, a de uh, declaration, of, you know, judgment action to say there's no infringement uh, from the Chinese court. Certainly, you know, if both courts proceed, you will see some conflict of the decisions from both uh, jurisdictions. And then the issue will come up as to, you know, whether one court should stay the proceedings because of, you know, you know, the forum is not so convenient. And also if both, you know, goes forward and then we talk about injunction from either side, you know, because they have each court from either side have the power to issue injunction against that party um, uh, residing in that jurisdiction, right? Then that injunction may have the cross-border effect. In that case, you know, whether one court may say, you know, I don't want the other court to move faster, you know, than my court, and then I would like to consider anti suit injunction. You know, this has been discussed in a lot of those uh, pattern cases uh, involving parties from US, from other places, but whether this type of disputes may come up uh, involving the parties you know, across the border here, uh, you know, within the mainland China and Hong Kong, that can be another issue. So the committee and also um, respect of the judicial sovereignty uh, for either side, you know, those issues will be discussed in this type of context as well. So I will, I will just stop here. Thank, Thank you, you very much, just on time. Yeah, great, great talks from all speakers. Uh, um, and I think, in, you know, some their speak, uh, their talk, we realized that the harmonization is very difficult uh, with, uh, you know, one country, two system, just like a driver on the right or on the left. Uh, or can we choose or can we choose the middle one, right? And so we are going to have a, a Q&A. Um, perhaps I, I request a from Dean. Uh, maybe five minutes more, depending on how many questions we are going to get, right? Um, because we have um, uh, five speakers for our panel. Okay, so I promised um, Professor Trey, because I caught him up, um, I promised to uh, ask him the question he's going to cover, but we didn't have time to cover, the how to avoid the conflict between Hong Kong and, and a man in China uh, in terms of uh, arbitration award um, uh, problem. Um, Professor Trick, can you okay. <laughs> maybe take a look? Okay, thank, thank you for your question. I'm sorry for using more time than expected. <laughs> um, yeah, as to how to avoid the conflict, I think the, the, I read several articles, someone have made some useful proposals. One of them is that the parties in the uh, Agreement could, could say the allow the arbitration uh, arbitral panel in the future to adjust, for example, the the patent the license royalty or other uh, license terms uh, in considering the likelihood of the patentability uh, issue. So the, the this kind of term will allow the uh, arbitral arbitral panel to review whether the patent quality is good enough, right? If they believe the one party has presented enough evidence to show it's very likely this kind of patent in the future will be challenged or be invalid by Chinese uh, patent office. And then the, the tribunal could adjust, I think the amount of uh, li license fee or the other license term. If you have this kind of agreement, I guess this kind of uh, arbitral of word that should be uh, respect or honored by the Chinese court in the future. Uh, I think that's also a common practice, right? In the SCP licensing area, uh, usually a license involves a hundred or thousands of patents and uh, it's uh, pretty common for the foreign court to determine a license global license, license rate for this kind of license. So if the, the, this kind of decision is, uh, could be honored by Chinese court, I guess the, the, the same decision from uh, arbitral uh, panel uh, should have the same effect if they only consider the likelihood of uh, 
invalidation rather than the validity issue directly. That's probably the most important strategy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tree. And I think I'll open to the floor. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but I, I would like to invite the audience to hold the question. Okay, yes. So uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Zhang, um, Mr. Zhang. So uh, it, it, it's nice to know that uh, the Hong Kong government is now uh, building uh, this place, a, uh, a kind of uh, trans transaction center, IP transaction center. Uh, actually, I'm doing a quite a lot of research on this area. And there are two, uh, and your presentation actually focuses a lot on establishing uh, IP protections and also uh, providing education and also consultant services. But there's two important uh, issues uh, uh, from my observation that is very important and it, uh, impede the transaction of IP. The first is the uh, uh, evaluation of IP asset because establishing IP protection not necessarily automatically transferred into a kind of commercially valuable asset. So it's, nowadays uh, we don't have a very good system uh, regarding the presentation of the commercial relevancy of the assets. And also uh, we know that uh, uh, IP, especially patent, uh, which covers technology. Technology is also uh, is really a, a part of the input of the uh, um, uh, innovation. And is, there's no a very good system to present the relevant complementary assets associated with that input. So I think uh, uh, my, my, my what, what, so one of my questions is, that, uh, is there any uh, system that the government is considered uh, that is creating certain kind of system to present the commercial relevancy uh, of the uh, IP asset to uh, the company's op business operation? Well, thank you very much indeed for raising this question. I think the question are uh, really focused on IP valuation. I think you are talking yes, about IP yes, valuation. Yes. As to how to value a piece of that asset, because we are talking about an intangible asset as opposed to a fixed property. Well, for a fixed property, valuation can be relatively easy because it always adopts a um, comparative approach to compare similar properties yes. to ascertain the, the values of um, an asset. For well, IP, the difficulty lies uh, uh, in the nature of the property because the property is intangible in the first place. Well, actually, uh, in in response to this question, uh, the uh, you recall I, I mentioned a report uh, given by uh, a working group on IP trading back in 2015. Well, actually, uh, in that report, uh, there is a uh, um, some discussions about topic as to IP valuation. And uh, we are aware of the difficulties and uh, we are also aware, we are also have our regular exchanges with different stakeholders as to how property should be valued. And actually we once worked with the professional body to see whether uh, there is uh, certain guidelines, I mean, uh, in uh, assisting the uh, industry or assisting the corporate, uh, assisting the uh, <coughs> IP owners as well as the users to evaluate a piece of property. Well, maybe I can, um, after this session, I can give you a link. There's a, actually, uh, we, 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 we have worked with, um, uh, we have collaborated with uh, professional bodies to uh, try to uh, lay down some uh, basic guideline as to how to evaluate intangible property. Oh, I, I, I cannot uh, say that, well, the guideline, uh, are exhausted because as this uh, uh, the concept of IP trading is not only, is not exclusive. I mean, in Hong Kong, Singapore is also promoting their their, yes. their, their, their city as uh, an IP uh, trading hub or IP or commercialization hub. Uh, this is uh, really not a very really straightforward topic, and uh, we need to work with uh, stakeholders. Uh, particularly the, the accountants, the valuation industry, to try to come across a guideline that is universally uh, uh, recognized by different uh, uh, jurisdictions, for example. So probably, we, 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 I, I, I can give a length of, of, that, of that piece of uh, guideline. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. any other question for other speakers? Okay, go ahead. Oh, thank you. 
Um, um, I have a question um, about the standard execution pattern. Sorry, can you speak? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, thank you for uh, the, all the uh, speeches. And I have a question about the patent licensing issues about the standard pattern, data execution patterns. Actually, there's a global rate setting trend in the different jurisdictions. Like uh, a single jurisdiction can set a global rate for a SK patent. And um, there is also a trend of that anti-suit injunction um, among the US and China and also UK. So like in the Unwear Plant uh, case and also Oppo case in China and Xiaomi case, like there, there's a, like uh, described by Professor Lee that's a ping pong style Olympic games between that anti-suit injunction, injunctions and anti-anti-suit injunctions. So uh, will that licensing rate issues be an arbitral, arbitrable issues and also Another side, a territorial issues um, mentioned by Kai Feng Huang. So will Hong Kong be a balancing point for them to settle this dispute by arbitration? That's my question. Thank you. Will you speak? Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I, I was surprised to be asked uh, this question because this is now the topic of my presentation, but you are right. I uh, had a number of papers about friend and FDP uh, license. So uh, you are certainly right. We uh, see the surge of the so-called uh, anti-suit injunction uh, in the context of SEP and friend in the past two years, uh, especially in uh, China. Um, so uh, I, we are actually trying to figure out so what was going on. So the approach that we used in that paper published in Michigan Technological Review uh, is that uh, uh, we argue because the SEP is somehow relevant to national security because you see all these 5G uh, is very important infrastructure. So uh, the, 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 the technological competition between US and China also uh, kind of like has the battlefield in, in that SEP. Uh, and Going back to your question, so you are right. Uh, there are a lot of advantages of using arbitration to resolve the SEP issue. So in terms of efficiency, in terms of uh, uh, professional knowledge, so it's probably easier. Uh, but of course, there are still some uh, suspicion about this proposal. Uh, so one of the major arguments mostly made by legal scholars, not practitioner, is that uh, uh, still, we have no idea what is the best approach to decide the so-called global rate or SEP rate. Uh, so if you use the court to resolve that issue uh, because of the transparency, so it might be good for the so-called patent jurisprudence to develop. It's easier for people to understand. And then we can uh, still scrutinize and uh, uh, subject that kind of a reasoning to debate. Uh, but for arbitration, of course, uh, this is confidential. Uh, you have no idea how that is decided. So uh, I think a main uh, criticism against that arbitration approach is that uh, probably at this stage, uh, that might not be good to develop the right uh, approach to uh, find the so-called SCP rate. But of course, this is not my personal perspective. So, uh, and it, for Hong Kong to do that, uh, I think probably just uh, going back to uh, Gobin's question, so why Hong Kong has this rule in arbitration ordinance, so I completely agree what uh, Robin just mentioned, uh, but I think there are probably two major points that I can see here from Hong Kong. Uh, number one, uh, because uh, Hong Kong has defined itself as an arbitration center, strategically, uh, it would be uh, good for Hong Kong to expand the scope of arbitration. Uh, and we can also see that in the so-called Greater Bay Area Initiative, so which also define Hong Kong as the center for dispute resolution. This is number one. Um, number two that I can see about the role um, played by uh, Hong Kong is that uh, uh, so as Ubin says, so Hong Kong does not have that uh, uh, manufacture uh, industry. Uh, the other thing that I think that might be relevant, but Ubin didn't mention, was that uh, uh, so before uh, 2019, uh, Hong Kong did not have that substantive review for patent application. So that might be the reason that the government feel more comfortable uh, that patent validity might be challenged in other proceedings.
I yeah, just want to add uh, anti-junction. Uh, in most cases, we consider as an evil, uh, maybe a necessary evil, uh, to uh, fight back and try to retain your own uh, jurisdiction on certain uh, cases. But it, not, it does not resolve any, any, any disputes. It creates additional disputes. Even disputes among the courts of different jurisdictions create all this judicial race um, and all this fighting among different, different um, you know, courts or enforcement agencies among uh, different jurisdictions. It causes a lot of uncertainties among the parties uh, being involved in those, in those disputes. Um, right now in China, I think this index injunction has been um, limited to uh, patent, uh, the essential patents in some, you know, some maritime cases as well. But whether that can be extended uh, to other areas uh, of dispute, that will be a question uh, to, be, uh, to be watching in the future. I think I'm coming back to this uh, GBA perspective, as we discussed, you know, we have three different jurisdictions three different systems. Um, and then in the IP context, there can be some tensions as well. Um, in the trademark disputes, on the competition platform law, a certain extent, uh, patent disputes as, as well. So, so, so when I look at all these issues, you know, one possible um, um, uh, scenario could be beside the arbitration, um, you know, proposed, you know, SCP dispute to be resolved through arbitration. You know, a possible angle, you know, just to think around these, is to look at the example being set up by European Union, right? They have this unified uh, court. So I think, you know, within this GBA, you know, Greater Bay Area, you know, whether in the future, uh, maybe uh, maybe the far future, you know, whether, you know, if we want to look at integration or harmonization, uh, whether there is a possibility of, you know, establishing um, a unified court within this region to look at certain subject matter, you know, those disputes can be, um, uh, can be, you know, filed through this unified court. Uh, for all for certain you know cases involving certain um, uh, features and then then courts can look at you know i think right now the china uh, hong kong court will look at the, the concept like double actionability right if you say if you have a case that is actionable in hong kong but also actionable in in, in, in other jurisdictions and then the hong kong court can issue a global uh, injunction you know injunction that has an effect uh, outside of the hong kong so that that sort of issue you know will likely come up in the future, you know, with you know Hong Kong being more important uh, as the uh, as the uh, you know scientific or research uh, uh, in this in this area or region. So, anything from other? I I my I find it fascinating with that young lady over there commenting on uh, Hong Kong IPD, and then the issue here is about evaluation. Still, when we talk about SEP standard, whatever, all these things relating to money, right? So. I think Hong Kong, we have a very unique position. And what we're good at, we're good at money. Right? So I think the law school should definitely really help to establish a more uni unified system. So when people would come to Hong Kong, they would know we know not only have the law, but we also would know your value. Right? So you come over here, we resolve all those issues with you, right? Back on your notion. And so it, I think it's fascinating, in particular with. Paul Chan is keep talking about with all these virtual assets, plus all these like financial tech that work together. So I think it's fascinating, but it's all up to all the younger people. <laughs> Thank you very much. And well, I just want to supplement my early answer to that to the question raised by that gentleman. Well, actually, you can go to our website, ip.gov.hk. There is, there, is, there is a section known as trading IP. And under trading IP, there is a section known as evaluating IP. And you can find some use, useful information on that. IP.gov.hk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we wrap up this uh, panel. Um, and I think you know, uh, from this, uh, this speech, we, um, we know that uh, harmonization is very difficult, but uh, uh, harmonization doesn't equal to unification. Uh, or unity, uh, the harmonization will also embrace the diversity or uniqueness of uh, each uh, jurisdiction. And then we will probably focus on you know, what are the strengths or uh, advantage of uh, each jurisdiction and put them together and then figure out whether we can find uh, something, <laughs> uh, I mentioned the synchronization of IT law. And I, I think maybe we can also think about some uh, technical neutral um, just uh, legislation on some very uh, you know technical area like AI uh, in the Greater Bay Area, and then we can also think about maybe 
EU's uh, model for uh, some directive, um, which is uh, you know, not going to be enforced, but to have uh, serve some guidance, right? So I, I think um, uh, it's great the panel, uh, everyone uh, contributed. Uh, I, I think it's a you know, very exciting and a very interesting uh, insight and uh, we can take forward to, to, to think about uh, for future development uh, in one country, two system. So yeah, let's uh, give a, a round of applause to each of our speaker and also thanks to Professor Trey uh, join us uh, remotely from Beijing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so welcome to uh, the session. Uh, so there are four of us speaking. So I'll speak first on, um, um, it's basically on how the Supreme People's Court um, serves and safeguards the Greater Bay uh, area strategy. Uh, then uh, second will be Jenny Fong uh, from the Department of Justice. So speaking from her, so as a person who's been involved in negotiating a, a number of arrangements with the mainland, uh, most recently the one with the on uh, matrimonial matters. Yes, so this is, we have the person with abs real, real experience. Uh, second, uh, Ed, uh, Edward Liu, a partner at Hagen and Partners. Uh, so speaking about the uh, mutual enforcement of judgments uh, arrangement and the arbitration-related arrangement. So should I, where do I go? Oh yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, Professor Tong. Hold on. He, so, Professor Zhang um, from uh, Sun Yat-sen University, from Zhongshan Daoche. So he he's speaking on Zoom on uh, conflicts of laws issues. Yeah. So hold on. Do I go? Yeah, so I can go up there. Already. Thank you. Let me. Timers, so I don't go over. Right. Um, yeah, so I uh, so guess the official title of my presentation is Updates in Judi Judicial Cooperation, but uh, I flipped it to be how the Supreme People's Court serves and provides safeguards for the Greater Bay Area strategy. Hold on, what is this? Um, hold on, how does the next slide is here? Okay, so my uh, it's basically three point roadmap. Oh, so why, why is the Supreme People's Court or the SPC serving the Greater Bay Area strategy? And how is it, how are, how is the, how are the SPC and lower courts uh, doing that? and a bit about the content of the strategy. So the, a lot of, of the other content will be presented by my fellow panelists. Okay, yeah, so why uh, is the Supreme People's Court serving the GBA policy and Belt and Road policies? Because Wherever the national strategy is deployed, the judicial service and safeguards of the people's courts will be there. So it's the Greater Bay Area is an important national strategy, and uh, therefore the Supreme People's Court needs to do its part in um, supporting the Greater Bay Area uh, strategy. Yes. Yeah, so this the yeah this is. Uh, Vice President uh, Wang Yangming and many others have, you know, ha have said this uh, when announcing various services and safeguards uh, opinion. 
Oh, it's not moving. Yeah. Not response. Can I do it on the... Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, how does the Supreme People's Court does it? By its, some of its uh, unique functions. Um, so, one very important one is creating judicial policy. That's a lot of what I'll talk about today is so or hearing cases, not so important. So creating quasi legislation, it, that's not an official term, but what creates so are creating judicial interpretation. Um, so those are uh, guiding the lower courts and cooperating with other institutions. So next slide. Yeah, so how is it being, uh, how does the Supreme People's Court implement the Greater Bay strategy? It's the principle of horizontal coordination and vertical implementation. So this, uh, so the quotation at the bottom part of the screen is from uh, comments by Judge Sienni, who's the deputy head of the research office and and the person who's leading uh, Maca uh, Hong Kong Macau related uh, judicial matters at the Supreme People's Court. So she said, the successful signing of the supplementary arrangement on arbitration is due to the strong guidance of the Legislative Affairs Commission of the Standing Committee of the NPC, you know, the following way. The Hong Kong Basic Law Com Committee the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, the State Council, and other relevant central authorities, as well as the strong support of judicial and legal circle. So you know, so this gives you an idea on the Chinese side that that what the Supreme People's Court uh, is doing involves, yeah, involves a lot of horizontal uh, coordination. Yes, yeah, so on the creating quasi legislation, as, as the, also another quote from uh, Judge's remarks, she says the effective implementation of the supplementary arrangement in the mainland needs to be transformed into a judicial interpretation. Yeah, and then, yeah, you know, on the Hong Kong side, it needs to be uh, passed as an ordinance. Yes, yeah, so the arrangements that my co-panelists will discuss on the, on the Chinese side need to become judicial interpretations so that they can be a source of law for, for local judges. Okay, yes, yeah, so the following is a list of the principal Greater Bay Area policy doc document. Uh, so they're implementing, you know, re related party and government document. So the first one is the, the opinion concerning the version of judicial services safeguard for the construction of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau Greater Bay Area. I'm not sure of the year. Um, it's Get full text is unavailable, and it, it, it is a neighbor one it's an internal document. So I'm thinking perhaps it's related to the framework agreement, but I don't I don't know, but it's it's not it's not transparent. A number of the other ones are transparent. The November 2020 opinion on uh, making Shenzhen a pilot demonstration zone. Yes, I won't bother to re read the long, the wrong title. So that's linked to the general office of the central committee and the state council for making, you know, making Shenzhen a uh, a pilot demonstration. So, yeah. So next slide. Okay. 
Yes, so some more. So there's like January 20, uh, so January of this year. So there's a opinion on supporting and guaranteeing or safeguarding the construction of the Guangdong Macau in depth cooperation zone in Hongqing. So that's it's also publicly available, linked to a related document, uh, Central Committee slash State Council document. Of September 2021, uh, similar one but for the relating to the Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong one. Also, the same time period related to a Central Committee State Council plan for deepening reform and opening up the Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong uh, modern service industry cooperation zone. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then so for anybody who's interested in this area, I I recommend um, reading the June 2020 report of the People's Court Servicing and Safeguarding the Construction of the Greater Bay Area 2019 uh, 2022. Yeah, it's public. It's yeah, full text is available on that one as well. Yeah, so what are, what are some of the takeaways? So there are kind of two branches. One is focused on the domestic courts. Uh, a number of reforms are contained in those documents. Uh, one is author, authorizing the Shanghai courts to take cases without an actual connection, which is a current requirement under the civil procedure law. Uh, it from my other reading, it's piloting uh, possible future reforms to Chinese civil procedure law. So seeing how that seeing how that works in practice before it actually gets incorporated sometime in the future into Chinese civil procedure law. Yeah, as was mentioned this morning, uh, so letting uh, yeah, so Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong Macau funded. Companies use non mainland law as governing law of contracts. Uh, yeah, so it's encouraging like a one stop mechanism for cross border commercial IP cases. There's a centralization or uh, uh, so a first instance Hong Kong Macau cases, also with the use of Hong Kong Macau assessors. This, this kind of centralization means, you know, having a like, dedicated group of judges hear that kind of case uh, it can be dedicated group of judges it can be a dedicated court in a particular area you know it's, so let's say Shanghai in Shenzhen Shanghai could be designated to be the court to hear first instance case Hong Kong Macau cases you know in within the Shenzhen area uh, so another, yeah, so Shenzhen is the pilot for natural person bankruptcy and um, pilot for other reforms and insolvency, you know, insolvency or bankruptcy matters. Also, it mentions coordination among the authorities in, in on the mainland. There's a lot of repetition of provisions in other of these opinions, such as Treating private business equally with you know with state-owned businesses. So next, yeah, some cross-border takeaways. So work, yeah, work further on establishing interregional judicial assistance. You know, so, um, and so consider an electronic platform for civil and commercial judicial assistance in the Guangdong. Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. So that means like service and process and uh, obtaining evidence. Uh, the service of process uh, piece is mentioned generally in the mainland civil procedure law. Yes, so the explore establishment of a unified qualification recognition system for Hong Kong, Macau, mediators to practice in the GBA area. I think that's already that's already in place. 
um, yeah, involving more Hong Kong and Macau legal experts as China International Commercial Court experts. Um, yeah, so that's that's happened in the, the last group of experts that were appointed to the China International Commercial Court with five is involving more Hong Kong and Macau legal experts as advisors to the Guangzhou IP court. I have, I have no idea there how, how it's working in practice. Yeah, and so a big thing is improving, you know, insolvency or bankruptcy cooperation. Yeah, and then we have that, what, yeah, so it's not an arrangement, it's a kind of meeting minutes uh, from, from last year. Yeah, so next. Yeah, and then uh, Greater Bay Area provisions also appear in other Supreme People's Court documents. Yeah, so this is the 2019 uh, document on providing judicial services and safeguards to the uh, Belt and Road initiatives. Yeah, so it mentions that the development of Hong Kong as a regional Legal service and dispute resolution center shall be further supported. Cooperation between uh, uh, HKI, so Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and mainland institutions shall be uh, increased and that HKIC shall be added to the one-stop dispute resolution platform. So that, that finally happened uh, in June of this year. Yeah, so again, the more expert members will be added to the CICC expert committee and Hong Kong shall play a more important role in the development of Belt and Road Initiative. I think this, this is linked to this uh, December 2017 arrangement between the National Development Reform Commission and Hong Kong as our government for advancing Hong Kong's full participation contribution to the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, so next. Yeah, so uh, Hong Kong, yeah, so basically like the same, um, a lot of the same content appears in the September 2020 Supreme People's Court document as well on uh, serving guarantee the further opening to the outside world, except that this one mentions um, Hong Kong and Macau lawyers be supported to participate in dispute resolution as mediators and then the pilot program for Hong Kong legal petitioners to become uh, Greater Bay Area lawyers. Yeah, so this is the vertical part that I mentioned a little while ago. Yeah, for the vertical implementation, the Greater Bay, there's a Greater Bay Area special work, uh, working small group, the Duan Shang Gongzhou Xiao Group. So jointly composed of the relevant People's Court Department and the Guangdong Higher People's Court. Yeah, and then there is, I guess, this, um, what else is related? Oh yeah, but I think this is, well, there are discussion minutes or, I'm not sure how DOJ has translated it. The Hui, Hui uh, Tang with Hong Kong and Macau on judicial and legal exchanges and cooperation. And there's a 2019 Guangdong High Court and Department of Justice uh, arrangement on uh, Greater Bay Area legal exchange and mutual cooperation. Yeah. But not, not all of these, I can't find all these, all the documents. Yeah, so going on, um, yes, let me see, there's, um, so one thing mentioned there is um, judicial legal rules, uh, convergence, conver convergence or harmonization and a mechanism, um, okay, mechanism harmonization. Yeah, so there are various measures, yeah, it's, improve the Guangdong courts and involve Hong Kong and Macau various, various areas. So three arrangements in one judicial assistance document with Hong Kong. Um, 
the Hong Kong arrangements were very thankfully often preceded by public consultation, but I have a, you know, a, a clip here from the consultation paper from several years ago. This is really brilliant if you're doing research on these things because the Department of Justice explains each clause. Not, not seen on the mainland side. Yeah, there are two arrangements with Macau. It doesn't seem they do consultation, but I'm, I'm less familiar with things on Macau's side. Okay, yeah, so next. Um, all right. This work. Yeah, so uh, there are more, more things to come. Uh, yeah, so per these discussion minutes, vigorously promoting mutual recognition, cooperation, insolvency, and bankruptcy. Uh, yeah, so investigate. So that means to look into that's at an earlier stage of improving service of process and obtaining evidence through an electronic platform. Uh, yeah, more language about promoting arbitration and mediation. Yeah, and uh, language about more exchanges, research on cross-border issues and judicial internships for greater Bay Area lawyers. You know, I guess that was concluded pre-COVID. Um, Judge Su in an academic article that she published be February this year. So she mentions, so she, she's, the article it was on uh, diversified dispute resolutions so a lot on uh, GBA mediation issues. So she mentions, you know, kind of eventually a kind of Singapore mediation convention. It's the convention for mutual enforcement of um, mediation agreements, having that kind of arrangement uh, to make it possible for cross-border enforcement of mediation agreements. But this is Judge Sula wearing her, whoops. Uh, this is Judge Sula wearing her quasi-academic hat. So she's not, she's not, it's not an official, this is not an official statement of Supreme People's Court policy, but it's indicative of Supreme People's Court thinking, or at least, you know, her thinking. Okay, anything else? Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so uh, I've listed articles I've, I've written on, sort of related to the Greater Bay Area. And um, yeah, so for those who read Chinese, and are interested in this area, I uh, highly suggest reading anything that Judge Anstiani publishes because um, she's the one leading the negotiations on Hong Kong issues. Very, you know, thinks, you know, she thinks about these issues a lot, you know, very thoughtful article. So thank you, thank you very much. I'll go back to sharing the proceedings. Yeah, so I'm very, very honored for Jenny Fung to, uh, to follow me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me. Uh, just as uh, Susan just introduced me, um, I was involved in the legislative process uh, of this ordinance. And I uh, explained the bill uh, before the bill's committee of the Legislative Council. And it's very happy now that it has come into operation. What I will do today is to give an overview of the background leading to this ordinance, the main provisions, and also the benefits that this ordinance will bring. The background. Uh, in 2017, um, the Supreme People's Court and the Hong Kong government, Hong Kong SAR government, signed the arrangement on reciprocal recognition and enforcement of civil judgments in matrimonial and family cases. 
And this ordinance, the CAP 639, is to implement this arrangement. And this ordinance took effect on the 15th of February this year. Um, the main provisions of this ordinance, there are three main components of this uh, ordinance. The first component uh, is to enable registration and enforcement of mainland judgments in Hong Kong. Second component is the recognition of mainland divorce certificates in Hong Kong. And the third component is uh, the facilitation of recognition and enforcement of Hong Kong judgments in the mainland. First, we talk about how um, we register a mainland judgment in Hong Kong. The mainland judgments given in matrimonial or family cases in mainland can be registered in Hong Kong under the ordinance. The scope of it includes dispute over divorce, dispute over invalidity of a marriage, dispute over annulment of a marriage, dispute over division of the property of parties to a marriage during the subsistence of the marriage, dispute over property after divorce, dispute over matrimonial property agreement. Some more examples. Um, this ordinance covers uh, dispute over spousal maintenance, custody or maintenance of a child, custody or maintenance of child arising from cohabitation, uh, access, guardianship, parentage, order for the protection of a person. And note is that adoptions in the mainland will continue to be governed by section 17 of the adoption ordinance. So this part uh, of the um, uh, um, ordinance, um, this part of the adoption ordinance will remain intact and unaffected by, the, by this new ordinance. If you want to register a mainland judgment under the ordinance, you have to uh, have the mainland judgment has to contain the specified orders. There are three main categories of specified orders. The first is status related orders. Just as the name um, relates, it relates to the status of uh, the parties. Examples are orders granting divorce, annulment of marriage. The second category is care-related orders. Examples are orders in relation to the custody or right of access, uh, etc. And the third category is maintenance-related orders. For example, orders in relation to maintenance of a person, spousal maintenance, division of property between the parties to a marriage. So these are the three categories. If you have a mainland judgment containing these three categories, uh, specified order, you can register that mainland judgment in Hong Kong. Application for registration. If you have a mainland judgment containing um, a specified order, you can make a registration application to the district court, family court in Hong Kong. And the specified order has to fulfill three criteria. First, it is given in a matrimonial or family case. Second, it is given on or after the 15th of February. That is the commencement day of the ordinance and it is effective in the mainland. When can a registration application be made? For status-related orders, generally registration can be made at any time after the mainland judgment has become effective. For care-related orders and maintenance-related orders, generally they can be made within two years subject to district court's permission to grant the uh, extension of time. And how the two years is counted depends on the type of order. For example, if you have an order that specifies a particular day for compliance, for example, the payment of maintenance on a specific day, then your time limit will be two years after a default of payment. 
And if the order doesn't specify a date for payment, then normally it would be two years after the effective uh, of the order of, of the judgment. Setting aside application. This setting aside application uh, fulfills a very important function. It provides effective safeguard to the rights of the parties. If a party applies for registration, the other party will be entitled to apply to set aside the registration if he can uh, satisfy the court that there are grounds for setting aside. The grounds, what are the grounds? Um, these are examples. For example, the respondent was not summoned to appear according to the law of the mainland or he was summoned but was not given a reasonable opportunity to defend. Uh, the, the mainland judgment was obtained by fraud. Uh, recognition or enforcement is manifestly contrary to public policy. Uh, when the order involves a person under 18, the court must take into account the best interests of the person. Also, if the mainland judgment has been reversed, or otherwise set aside pursuant to an uh, appeal or a retrial. Then these are the, if you satisfy one of these grounds, you, uh, you are entitled to make a setting aside application and the court will consider the merit of it. It is a requirement for registration that the mainland judgment is effective. And how do you determine whether it is effective? It means, the mainland judgment is enforceable in the mainland. And the judge, a mainland judgment is either given by the Supreme People's Court or is a second instance judgment given by the higher people's court or an intermediate people's court. Or it is a first instance judgment given by the higher intermediate or the primary people's court. And according to the mainland law, there is uh, no appeal is allowed or if an appeal is allowed, the time for appealing has expired. If, if the court is dealing with an application for setting a tie and in the process, an appeal against the mainland judgment is pending or the case uh, is ordered to be retried, then what should the Hong Kong court do? The Hong Kong court would need to adjourn the setting aside application to enable uh, the, the process to take its course. So after the uh, mainland uh, appeal or retry has been disposed of, then the Hong Kong court will, uh, uh, would, uh, can, can deal with the application for uh, setting aside depending on the result. When adjourning the setting aside application, the court may impose terms that it considers just. This, this is what we call the interim relief. This is um, for, for purposes of maintaining the status quo during the period of adjournment, ensuring the welfare and best interests of the person under 18 and preventing an irremediable injustice. Effect of registration. What is the effect of registration? For status related orders, the order is recognized as valid in Hong Kong. For care and uh, maintenance related orders, they are enforceable in Hong Kong as if the order is given by the Hong Kong court on the day of registration. So the effect would be uh, like you are having a Hong Kong judgment, you obtained a Hong Kong judgment. So you can proceed immediately to enforce. So the second component, I'm coming to the second component is the recognition of mainland divorce certificate in Hong Kong. If you, if a party to have divorced obtained a certificate uh, for divorce in the mainland, he can, um, use the mainland divorce certificate uh, and make an application before the district court, uh, family court under the ordinance. And like 
any other uh, matrimonial and family case judgment, the other party can apply to set aside the recognition order if you can satisfy uh, the grounds for setting aside. The grounds for setting aside are uh, the divorce certificate was obtained by fraud, it is invalid, uh, or the recognition of which will be manifestly contrary to public policy of Hong Kong. And the effect of registration is that um, the divorce um, certificate, uh, the, the divorce specified in the mainland uh, divorce certificate would be recognized as valid in Hong Kong. So you don't have to start a new proceedings. You just have to register. Now I come to the um, third component of this ordinance. That is, if I have a Hong Kong judgment, I want to enforce it in the mainland. It usually happens when um, the defendant has assets in, in the mainland. So may the other party, the, the party obtaining the judgment wants to uh, grab hold of the assets in the mainland. So he has to register the Hong Kong judgment with the mainland before he can uh, start his enforcement action in the mainland. A party to a Hong Kong judgment may apply to the relevant court which gave the judgment for a certified copy of the Hong Kong judgment. If, uh, if it is given in a matrimonial or family case, given or not after the commencement of the ordinance and is effective in Hong Kong. So it's like a, a mirror image. You can register a mainland judgment in Hong Kong on the contrary, you can also register similar uh, Hong Kong judgment in, with the mainland. And in order to do so, you can apply for a certified copy plus a certificate from the court. Um, certifying that your application, your going to be application in the mainland will satisfy uh, the criteria of the ordinance. So, um, these procedures appear to be relatively simple. You apply for a, um, a certified copy of the judgment plus certificate, and you follow the procedures set out in the arrangement. And uh, you uh, can uh, apply to register your main, Hong Kong judgment with the mainland court. Um, what are the... Uh, what are the judgments which, are, which, can be, uh, which can benefit from this ordinance? Um, these are examples. A decree absolute of divorce, a decree absolute of nullity, maintenance order, transfer or sale of property, adoption order, declaration relating to parentage or legit uh, legitimacy of a person, uh, injunction granted under the domestic and cohabitation relationship uh, violence ordinance. So these are examples which can benefit from uh, the ordinance. An order in relation to custody, um, these, um, uh, these orders made uh, under the various um, ordinances uh, are included as um, part of the uh, uh, valid judgments, Hong Kong, val uh, valid Hong Kong judgments, which can uh, utilize the mechanism uh, under mutual recognition and enforcement. These are uh, the matrimonial courses, the guardianship of minors ordinance, separation and maintenance orders ordinance, matrimonial proceedings and property ordinance, and in, res uh, in respect of a person under age of 18, yes, uh, he has been made a ward of court. So under these circumstances, uh, it satisfies the criteria. And one highlight I would like to um, uh, emphasize here is um, an order in relation to custody includes 
in order for the return and delivery of a child who has been wrongfully removed to the mainland or wrongfully retained in the mainland. This is a highlight because before the commencement of this ordinance, uh, when a party um, gets a Hong Kong order, he gets the custody of a, of, a, of a child, but the other party to the divorce unlawfully uh, brings the child across the border to the mainland uh, without um, a, a denied access of the person who has been granted access to the child. And before the ordinance, it's very difficult for that person to enforce that uh, order of access. And um, if, you, if you want to, uh, if you know that the child is in the mainland, you have to start a proceeding in the mainland. But now under the ordinance, if you have a Hong Kong court order granting access of the child, you can use that judgment and register the Hong Kong order with the mainland court. And you can benefit from the coercive powers of the mainland court to compel the return and delivery of the child. So this is a very powerful tool. The benefits of this ordinance. Before, for enforcing a Hong Kong judgment in Hong Kong, you have to do it under common law. And you have to prove the mainland judgment is final and conclusive. And very often you need expert evidence to, from China, China law experts to uh, provide an uh, expert opinion that the judgment is final and conclusive under the mainland law. So this process can be lengthy and costly. And if you want to enforce a Hong Kong judgment in the mainland, you need to commence a new action in the mainland. This, this is the before situation. And, and as I have explained, there are a lot of hurdles if you if a party encounters a situation where a child has been wrongfully detained in the mainland. So after the uh, commencement of the ordinance, these situations have greatly enhanced. Under the ordinance, you don't have to um, provide expert evidence. You just need a certificate from the Hong Kong court certifying that the judgment is given in a matrimonial or family court and is effective. And this is um, prima facie evidence subject to uh, a rebuttable presumption. So you under the ordinance, it, uh, it provides a clear legislative framework and the process is relatively simple and less costly. And also you don't have to relitigate you can just re, uh, register your Hong Kong uh, judgment. You don't have to start a new action. So to many is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a blessing because if you are a, a Hong Kong party, you, you have to instruct uh, a mainland lawyer to relitigate. It would be uh, a headache, sometimes a headache to, to the party. Now, um, the mechanism is relatively simple. And also uh, it provides better protection to uh, the parties as a Hong Kong order in relation to custody in, includes an order for the return or delivery of a child who has been wrongfully detained in the mainland. So um, the benefits are a lot and um, it's uh, only, um, the ordinance only uh, commenced uh, half a year ago, and we are studying uh, the cases, and uh, we hope this ordinance will give parties, um, will be more user-friendly to parties um, uh, experiencing um, divorce or, 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 or dis uh, encountering disputes in, in, the, uh, in, in the family or matrimonial situation. 
So in all, the arrangement and the ordinance enhance cross-border mutual legal assistance uh, in matrimonial and family cases by alleviating the need for parties to bring separate lawsuits in the courts of mainland and Hong Kong for the same dispute. It enables them to obtain timely and effective judicial reliefs and more effectively protect their rights. And it saves time and costs and reduce emotional stress. Thank you. Okay, it's my actually a great pleasure to be here um, with this uh, distinguished panel members here. Uh, and also thank you very much indeed for the Hong Kong Law Hong Kong University Law Faculty who invited me to join today's uh, conference or seminar. And my topic today is the, actually basically talking about how to enforce the uh, mainland award and the judgment in Hong Kong. Uh, of course, the uh, arrangement is for the mutual benefits of both jurisdictions, but uh, because of the limit of time today, I will only talk from one side, i.e., as I mentioned, the judgment from the judgment and awards from mainland to be enforced in Hong Kong. And I think the sequence of today's our panel speech is very good because Susan actually um, probably many of you actually knows that uh, uh, she is uh, one of the top advisors to the Supreme People's Court, uh, the China International Commercial Court. So what she just shared, the views are. I would say authoritative, then you can understand more about you know, why from a very high level, top level, uh, the arrangement has been, has been done between these two jurisdictions um, and the benefits given to Hong Kong and of course both uh, also mainland. And then uh, we have just heard the views from uh, Jenny talking about the arrangement on the family cases between the two jurisdictions. And I, as she just mentioned, uh, she was involved in the legislative process of that arrangement she just mentioned, and also the arrangements that actually I'm going to talk about. Uh, so her view, if not authoritative, but at least very persuasive, because we have heard uh, the person who is working in the Department of Justice and talking about you know, uh, how the ordinance is working. And as a practicing lawyer, then as a lawyer, the views shared by me is actually nothing. It's neither uh, authoritative or persuasive. So it's, it's, a, it's just introductory. So uh, I will not focus on you know, going through the each clauses of the ordinance or pretend to be very authoritative on this uh, arrangement that I'm going to talk, but basically, let you know what are these arrangements about and how do they uh, benefit Hong Kong to make Hong Kong as the international legal and uh, legal and resolution service sector. So two parts of my presentation, first is applying for enforcement of the mainland laws in Hong Kong. And the second part is talking about the enforcement of mainland judgments in Hong Kong. And because of today's uh, conference name, we start the conference name as one country, two system, and then with the cross-border legal harmonization. So I think it would be beneficial for us to see uh, why uh, there are cross-border jurisdictional uh, assistance between these two jurisdictions. And for example, as uh, Susan mentioned why there are, uh, you know, uh, the, the, China, the mainland China and Hong Kong authorities can discuss this arrangement and also like the DOJ, how could they, the, the, the basis for them to do it. So I quote there, these two uh, paragraphs here. First, actually, is from the DOJ's website is to pursue the objective of the effective implementation of the one country, two systems principle. The DOJ has taken steps to develop mutual legal assistance between the mainland and Hong Kong SAR so that disputes with cross-boundary elements could be dealt with more effectively. So that is the purpose, one of the purpose or major purpose for doing so. 
And for this arrangement, all the arrangement between these two jurisdictions to be made, it has the constitutional uh, foundation, not only the legal foundation, legal basis. It is Article 95 of the basic law, which provides uh, Hong Kong may, through consultations and importance with law, maintain uh, juridical relation uh, with the uh, judicial judicial organs of the other parts of the country, and they may render assistance to each other. So this may answer, I think, Susan, your question, why um, the arrangement on the civil and commercial judgment has been consulted in, in Hong Kong, but not for the arrangement between Hong Kong and Macau, because it says HKSAR may through consultation and in accordance with the law. So it either, it, it, I think it is within the discretion of the Hong Kong government whether they want to make the consultation with the public or not, and then uh, uh, to make the relevant arrangement to be uh, effective. That's my, again, interpretation, which is not persuasive and authoritative. Um, so first, talking about the enforcement of mainland laws in Hong Kong. Actually, the arrangement concerning the mutual enforcement of arbitral wars between the mainland and Hong Kong uh, that was signed in 1999, that probably the very first arrangement signed between these two jurisdictions. And from that time, making Hong Kong um, um, a, a, a be a more attractive, I would say, the arbitration venue for the disputes relating, uh, or I would say, the China-related disputes. And of course, back to more than 20, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 10, 10 more years, um, that arrangement proves to be, first of all, very useful. But secondly, there are a certain number of issues um, making the practitioners, and of course, also the court, uh, difficulties in enforcing the, uh, the, the, the awards in Hong Kong. So in two, uh, 2020, two years ago, a supplemental arrangement uh, on the enforcement of the actual awards was signed and then became effective in the, I think in the same year, oh, sorry, the next year, actually, because you can see the ordinance named the Arbitration Amendments Not Ordinance 2021. And under the arrangement, and of course, the uh, ordinance, there are basically two major changes. First is the removal of the restrictions on the enforcement of mainland laws under Section 93, allowing parties to enforce their laws both with mainland courts and the Hong Kong court at the same time. So that is the supplemental arrangements clause. And you would imagine what was the issue with the original arrangement is that for the winning party to enforce an award, he must choose whether he wants to enforce the award in mainland China or in Hong Kong. And because the time limit of the enforcement in the two jurisdictions are different, in Hong Kong, you have six years to enforce the award. award. Uh, either it's a domestic award or the award from mainland China or international uh, from the other jurisdictions. But in Hong Kong, in mainland, you have two years. And there was indeed one case causing the problem because the winning party was trying to enforce that award in Hong Kong and spent quite a, a, quite a few years and later realized that despite he received that uh, judgment, uh, the enforcement order from the Hong Kong court, but Hong Kong has no assets for, to satisfy um, the damages. So the winning party turned to Milan courts quite to apply for the enforcement of that award, but it found it already time barred. So under this supplemental arrangement, Nowadays, whether it is Hong Kong award or Milan award, there's no need for you to choose. You can 
enforce apply to in, apply to enforce a board in both jurisdictions concurrently. Of course, you cannot recover more than what you were awarded, right? Uh, if you awarded one hundred, you cannot apply to both courts and seek for the separate one hundred, but uh, in total one hundred. And you need to explain to the court that actually, despite you are applying, for example, the Mellon Court for enforcing the award, but you're not, it's not uh, sufficient to satisfy the awarded damages. And therefore, you are applying to the Hong Kong Court for the rest of the money. So that's a very uh, significant change of the supplemental arrangement. Secondly, it repeals the list of recognized mainland arbitral institutions published under Section. Uh, 97 of the arbitration ordinance. The reason is still being the case that in mainland, if you know arbitration, you must know mainland doesn't recognize the ad hoc arbitration. If you want to commence arbitration, you must commence within an institutional arbitration uh, or arbitration, arbitration institution within mainland. But in Hong Kong, or because of the development of arbitration. Nowadays, it's not really necessary to enforce the parties to must stick or adhere to a particular arbitration institution. And therefore, especially for the Hong Kong side, it is more beneficial actually for the Hong Kong side because uh, most of, quite a number of arbitration cases in Hong Kong, especially for the shipping cases, for the maritime cases, it is ad hoc arbitration. And therefore, it has removed the requirement or the list of the recognized mainland actual institutions. Um, the benefit is that later I will, I will explain, but I can tell you now that uh, uh, that um, if, for example, the foreign parties choose to arbitrate in Hong in mainland. But without an institution, without an arbitration institution, it will have less worry about whether that award can be enforced in Hong Kong or not. And basically, I would say it, it will be enforced in Hong Kong as long as it, of course, satisfies the relevant conditions under the ordinance. So let us see why I would say the arrangement on the enforcement of awards is the most successful arrangement between these two jurisdictions, between mainland, and China, uh, mainland China and Hong Kong. Uh, for the first two, uh, for the first 10 days of the original award, you can see that there are about or more than 94% of mainland awards were successfully reinforced in Hong Kong. And there were totaling 84 applications to enforce mainland awards in Hong Kong and 18 respondents sought to set aside the enforcement order and only five were ap approved, i.e. Uh, it was set aside uh, to uh, refused by the Hong Kong court to enforce the, Hong, uh, the Mellon award. And from 2009 to 2017, the percentage of the successful cases has, been inc has increased to uh, more than 96, and there were 85 applications to enforce Milan awards. And in the same time, uh, for the overall applications to enforce awards, whether it is Hong Kong award um, from China, from Milan China or from the other jurisdictions, were uh, about 250, and you could see uh, the Milan awards. Uh, occupies the, major, uh, the, the majority of, of the total applications. And there were only 11 applications were sought to set aside the enforcement order, and the three were granted by the Hong Kong court. So the key uh, takeaways, first of all, is that mainland laws are very likely to be enforced in Hong Kong. So. Uh, I know for today's uh, audience, most of you are the academics or students. Uh, and if it is before me, uh, as enterprises to cut from the business sectors, I've encouraged them actually 
no matter whether you choose to arbitrate in mainland China or not, will come as long as you find the other side has a size in Hong Kong, come to Hong Kong to enforce it so that lawyers can have more business. <laughs> and secondly, the close or cooperation in trade and capital between the mainland and Hong Kong has given rise to a series of civil and commercial disputes. And that's because we can see the application, um, despite that was only eight years, and the application numbers to enforce the Melanda Wars are already more than the first 10 years. Um, yeah, so that's definitely proof that actually the business relationship has been uh, closer and closer between these two jurisdictions. And the losing parties have properties available for enforcement in Hong Kong. That means uh, more probably Chinese companies uh, have business, have presence, have assets in Hong Kong. So that's the reason why the winning party would consider to enforce a board in Hong Kong. And last but not least, the Hong Kong is the most popular venue to enforce awards for Chinese parties to international arbitration and cross-border disputes. So that's again, make China, uh, make Hong Kong to be the most popular uh, venue for uh, China-related arbitration or this resolution. So I, I, will, I will very briefly uh, talk about the basic uh, procedures for applying for enforcement of unmelon boards in Hong Kong. Basically, that applicant shall submit application to the Hong Kong court, uh, that is a court of first instance, and leave granted to enter judgment. That means the board becomes enforceable. And if the application is dismissed, with leave can appeal to the court of appeal. And once leave is granted, the court order will be served on the party subject to enforcement, i.e. the debtor of that award. And then the title may raise objection based in 14 days, during which, during such a period of objection, the award cannot be actually enforced. Um, the implications on the enhancement uh, to made to the arrangement, I mean both the original arrangement and the supplemental arrangement, the parties to arbitration proceedings seated in mainland China and administered by a foreign arbitral institution, whether it is valid in mainland China or not, will have less vary, vary about when it comes to the enforceability of the arbitral award in Hong Kong, as the supplemental arrangement will apply to facilitate such kind of enforcement. And there are, there are a set of available boys for enforcement in both Hong Kong and mainland, the winning party in whose favor an illegible arbitral award is made will no longer have to choose between the two jurisdictions and will be able to apply for parallel enforcement in both jurisdictions. And certainly, the parties to an arbitration seated in mainland China or Hong Kong may apply to the relevant courts for interim measures, both before and after the arbitral award is made. The risk of dissipation of assets pending enforcement of the arbitral award is more manageable. Uh, in here, I would say, because I didn't have a chance to elaborate more uh, today, um, the most important arrangement entered into one of the, the most important arrangements entered into in the past five years is the arrangement on the intermeasure um, in out of the arbitration uh, between mainland China and Hong Kong. And that making Hong Kong to be a very unique a jurisdiction uh, which can apply for the parties in Hong Kong, complies intermeasures to the mainland court to freeze the mainland assets, okay, of the other side. Because only Hong Kong, well, not only Hong Kong, now Macau also has such kind of arrangement. But let's say for the most important arbitration centers worldwide, only Hong Kong has this benefit. And under that arrangement on the interim measures, that talking about uh, before and during the arbitration, i.e. before you come as arbitration and during arbitration proceedings. And under the supplemental arrangement, from now on, you will have, I mean, the applicant normally have the whole picture, whole process to secure his claim if the other side has the assets to be enforced or to be frozen 
in mainland China, because after you get the award, and when you try to apply that uh, award uh, for enforcement, you can also apply for the interim measures from either the Hong Kong court or mainland court. Um, the second part of my presentation is talking about the enforcement of mainland judgment in Hong Kong. The previous mechanism, it is, uh, I would say, the choice of court arrangement. Um, the arrangement was, um, was entered into between the two jurisdictions in the year of 2006. And then it became the law, the domestic law in 2008. And the restoration of mainland judgment must meet the following statutory requirement, which I will not repeat here and you can see, but I highlight the third one. Sorry. Oh, one more minute. Okay, sorry, I cannot finish my second part actually. And the exclusive jurisdiction clause, that is the hurdle for the parties previously to enforce the votes in either jurisdiction. And now we have the new mechanism, the new arrangement uh, signed uh, three years ago, and very happily that we have this uh, new law uh, just passed by the Legislative Council uh, last month. And I've just checked with uh, Jenny that is the, the DOJ is working very hard to make it uh, effective. Uh, and we let's hope it can be effective uh, very soon. Uh, and upon the relevant judicial, uh, judicial imputation to be issued by the PRC Supreme People's Court, and the new, new arrangement will then become effective very quickly, uh, Suzanne. Um, the key features, I will simply uh, skip it, but uh, just uh, I would say the removal of the exclusive jurisdiction requirement is no longer there. And there's no need for the parties to agree on the exclusive jurisdiction clause when signing the agreement, as long as the judgment meets the other basic requirements under the new arrangement. For example, if you have seen, uh, just one more minute. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Professor John, just wait on me on one, one, just one minute. If you, if you, previously, if you have the contract, you, the jurisdiction clause would say, uh, uh, the party A, no more, right? Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. That's it, okay. Uh, and the PPT is available, and if you want to receive it, you can check with the law faculty and get it. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's my turn now. And thanks, Susan, for your moderation. And thanks for Hong Kong U and Professor Zhao Yun's invitation. My topic is about resolving the conflict of law issues in civil and commercial matters in the GBA. It is widely acknowledged that although the mainland, Hong Kong and Macau are all parts of China, they belong to three distinct jurisdictions with different civil and commercial legal systems when it comes to a dispute involving two or more jurisdictions in civil and commercial affairs the question of which jurisdictions civil and commercial law sh should be applied emerges and the issue of inter-regional conflict of laws in civil and commercial matters necessarily arises as the uh, guangdong hong kong macau a greater Bay Area construction continues the conflict of laws in civil and commercial affairs between the mainland Hong Kong and Macau become an increasingly significant concern. The GBA's construction is not only a new attempt to support the formation of a new pattern of comprehensive opening up in the new area, but also a new practice to advance the cost of one country, two systems. As a lively world-class city cluster, the GBA serves as a, a demonstration zone for deep cooperation among the mainland Hong Kong and Macau. However, as stated in the outline development plan for the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay Area and one country, country, two systems, Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau have different social systems and legal systems. They are separate 
customs territories, market connectivity needs to be further improved, and、uh, efficient flow of factors of production has yet to be achieved. In this context, it is undeniably of greater practical significance to explore the approaches to resolving conflict of laws in civil and commercial matters in the GBA.、Uh, neither the constitutional law nor the two basic laws make specific provisions for resolving interregional conflicts of laws in civil and commercial matters. Moreover. Uh, there are currently no unified rules of interregional conflicts of laws in China, nor have the mainland, Hong Kong, and Macau formulated their own interregional conflicts of laws regarding the resolution of international conflict conflict of laws. The practice in the mainland has long been to treat civil and commercial relations. Involving Hong Kong and Macau as those involving foreign countries, and apply the rules for settling international conflicts of laws by analogy. It is expressly stipulated in Article Seventeen of the Interpretation of the Supreme People's Court on several issues concerning application of the law of the People's Republic of China on choice of law for foreign related civil relationships.、Uh, That issue concerning application of law in connection with the civil relationships involving the Hong Kong Special Administration Region and the Macau Special Administration Region are subject to these interpretations by by analogy. By analogy, Hong Kong and Macau, in contrast, deal with interregional. Civil and commercial conflicts of law in full account, accordance with international civil and commercial conflicts of law.、Uh, nonetheless, both、uh, basic laws provide that the special administrative region may, through consultation and in accordance with the law, maintain a juridical relations with the judicial organs of other. Parts of the country, and they may render assistance to each other. Okay, I I, I think everybody know that, so I will pass that. In September 2021, the CPC Central、uh, Committee and the State Council issued the Master Plan of the Development of the Guangdong Macau Intensive Cooperation Zone in Hanqing. We call the Hanqing Master Plan. The Hanqing Master Plan clearly states that the advantages of the principle of one country, two systems shall be fully leveraged, and the civil and commercial affairs regulatory regulatory system that matches with those of Macau and aligns with the international criteria shall be established step by step, and the a premise of Uh, preserving the constitution and the basic law of the Macau SAR. Also, the Hanqing Master Plan、uh, further mentions that the judicial exchange and、uh, collaboration between Guangdong and Macau shall be enhanced, and a well-established,、uh, diversified mechanism of commercial dispute resolution consisting of international commercial litigation. Arbitration and、uh, mediation shall be formulated. Moreover, the opinions of the Supreme People's Court on supporting and guaranteeing the con construction of the Guangdong Macau in depth cooperation zone in Hanqing, <coughs> we call the Hanqing opinions of the Supreme People's Ah、uh, Ah、uh, Hanqing opinions not only per. Proposes to improve extraterritorial law ascertainment and application mechanisms, build a diversified commercial dispute resolution mechanisms, and simplify litigation procedures for cases involving Hong Kong and Macau, and strengthen judicial exchanges with Hong Kong and Macau. But also expressly provides that the Hanqing Court share. Ah,、uh, be supported in applying for being author authorized to explore on a pilot basis 
the extraterritorial law application mechanism and Hong and Hong Kong funded, Macau funded, Taiwan funded, and foreign funded enterprises registered in the Henxing Cooperation Zone shall be allowed to choose by agreement the resolution of contractual disputes based on extraterritorial laws or the resolution of con contractual uh, disputes by applying uh, international treaties and uh, international practice and uh, international commercial rule rules on the premise of not violating the basic principles of China's laws or not jeopardizing state sovereignty and security and public interests. Uh, and in September 2021, the CPC Central Committee and the State Council issued the opening up of the Qianghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong Modern Service Industry Corporation Zone, we call it Qianghai Plan. The Qianghai Plan uh, proposes to establish an international legal service center and an international commercial dispute resolution center, explore ways to integrate uh, uh, different uh, legal systems and across border legal rules, explore the, improve the improvement of the mechanisms for applying Hong Kong laws in the Shanghai Corporation zones and choosing Hong Kong as a place of arbitration to solve civil and commercial cases, explore the establishment of a new mechanism for civil and commercial judicial assistance and exchange between the Qianghai Corporation Zone and Hong Kong and Macau, support the Qianghai courts and explore ring ways to expand the scope of, of accepting foreign related commercial cases and support Hong Kong legal experts in appearing in the Qianghai court to assist in the ascertainment of law to protect the legitimate rights and interests of enterprises and individuals engaged in cross-border business investments and build an international inter-regional commercial dispute settlement platform on which litigation, mediation, and arbitration are independent of each other and coordinated there between. Furthermore, the opinions of the Supreme People's Court on supporting and uh, guaranteeing comprehensively uh, deepening the reform and opening up of the Qianghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong Modern Service Industry Corporation Zone, not only states that the mechanism for the ascertainment and application of extraterritorial laws shall be improved, and as a center for the settlement of international commercial disputes shall be built. The litigation mechanism for participating in Hong Kong and Macau legal services shall be constructed. Judicial exchanges with Hong Kong and Macau shall be increased. And the exchange channels of judicial talents in Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Macau shall be in, uh, expanded but also clearly uh, stipulates, stipulates that Shanghai court shall be supported in applying for being, uh, being authori authorized to explore on a pilot basis, the actual territory law application mechanism and Hong Kong founded and Macau founded, uh, Taiwan founded and foreign founded enterprises registered in the Shanghai Corporation zone shall be allowed to choose by agreement the resolution of a contract disputes based on extraterritorial laws or the resolution of contractual disputes by applying international treaties and international practice and international commercial rules on the premise of, of not violating the basic principle of China's laws or not jeopardizing state sovereignty and security and the public interest. From the above, it can be seen that in terms of resolving interregional civil and commercial laws, conflicts in general, the mainland still follows the 
the past approaches, but it is, but it's ready or doing some, some beneficial exploration in the two cooperation zones. First, to expand the application of the laws of Hong Kong and Macau. Second, to build an international, interregional, diversified commercial dispute resolution mechanism and platform. Third, to strengthen ju judicial assistance between the mainland Hong Kong and Macau. And fourth, to increase judicial exchanges there between the these explorations are both significant and feasible. It is important to note that interregional civil and commercial legal conflicts between the mainland Hong Kong Macau must be resolved strictly with the constitution law and the two basic laws within the framework of one country and the two, two system. On the one hand, the high degree of autonomy Hong Kong and Macau enjoy should should be fully respected and firmly upheld. Under the two basic laws, national laws shall not be applied in Hong Kong and Macau, except for those relating to national defense, foreign affairs, and other laws, which according to the basic laws do not fall within the scope of autonomy of Hong Kong and Macau. This means that Hong Kong and Macau enjoy full legislative powers in civil and commercial matters, thus enacting a unified interregional conflict of law or substantial civil and commercial law is not yet feasible. On the other hand, the principle of one country must be upheld and the integration of Hong Kong and Macau into, into the country's overall development must be uh, activity promoted. Interregional conf conflict conflict uh, uh, law of laws in civil and commercial matters shall not become an obstacle to civil and commercial exchanges between the mainland, Hong Kong, and Macau. In light of this, it's of great practical significance to explore the expansion of the application of Hong Kong and Macau's laws in the two cooperation zones in the GBA to create a legal environment that converges with that of Hong Kong and Macau and thereby encourages more Hong Kong and Macau residents to live and work in the cooperation zones. And meanwhile, initiatives such as building an international, interregional, diversified commercial dispute resolution mechanism and a platform strengthening judicial system between the, uh, the mainland Hong Kong and Macau and increasing judicial exchange there between will also help for to resolve to, to a certain extent. Of course, in the future, with the deepening integration of the GBA and the further integration of Hong Kong and Macau into the country's overall development, attempts can also be made to explore how to enact, enact inter-regional conflict of laws through international collaborative legislation. Uh, legislation Spe specif specifically, the relevant legislative bodies of the mainland Hong Kong and Macau may collaborate in their leg legislative work and each specially elects in acts and interregional con conflict of laws with constant or mutually harmonized rules. Besides, the three jurisdictions may also try to formulate relevant relevant model laws for adoption by the parties in legislative, judicial, or contractual matters based on the specific circumstances or inter-regional civil and commercial law conflicts. For example, a model, a model contract law that embodies the basic recognized by the mainland Hong Kong and Macau can not only use it as a model in their respective legis legislation, but the contractual parties can also directly choose the model law as the governing law when they conclude contracts to agree on the applicable legal provisions. Uh, that's all for my speech and the thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, mutual uh, 
enforcement and, and recommendation for the those for professional health cases and also for other cases. My guess is the five products uh, will be for shopping and parallel proceedings. Of course, uh, we have maybe both to address uh, parallel proceedings. But my guess is the deeper reason is always the difference of the clinical and procedural between mainland and Hong Kong. For example, mainland clients may not be very comfortable with the idea of cross the nation expert with in certain cases, they like the idea of continuous speaking. They like the idea of third party funding. I'm wondering if there is any, if, if there will be any steps taken by government in addressing the fundamental reasons, for example, in relaxing our community of the brain by way of legislation, or we have campaigns to promote. Our common law practice, such as cross examination and employment, actual witness in mainland. You have rightly pointed out that uh, there are provisions as far as the matrimonial and family. Uh, uh, REJ ordinance refers. There are uh, provisions relating to. Uh, uh, preventing parallel proceedings. And um, you also mentioned about foreign shopping. Um, the scheme of the ordinance is that uh, we want parties to have the freedom to choose whether they want to litigate in, China, uh, in the mainland or in Hong Kong. And this ordinance retains that freedom. So uh, it's for the parties to the dispute to plan and uh, uh, organize uh, how uh, would best serve their interests, whether they would litigate in the mainland and in Hong Kong. And they can utilize the ordinance to um, do the reciprocal uh, recognition and enforcement. Yeah. Right. We're basically out of time. So if people have other... Do you have five, five more minutes? Okay. All right, other, other questions? Okay. Five well, minutes is for myself, so I'm sorry, just joking. Uh, so uh, the question is that you talk about, uh, both of you talk about the, partly your presentation about finality. It used to be such a huge issue in Hong Kong. So the Chinese judgment is final, uh, effective. So, it seems to me that is no longer an issue or uh, that will continue to be an issue. Just imagine, I cannot imagine lawyers will not argue the judgment to be enforced is not really final because uh, you know, there's a, a review process. Uh, so so how, you know, what's, what's the strategy to deal with that particular issue? Have built in that safeguard. Um, if uh, you want to register a mainland judgment in Hong Kong, you have to obtain a certificate from the mainland court. And uh, the certificate will certify that it is an effective judgment in the mainland. And effective judgment in the mainland, under the mainland law, means uh, there is uh, no appeal allowed. Or if there is an appeal, um, it has been finally determined. So. Uh, the certificate would serve as a rebuttable presumption that uh, it is final and conclusive. Uh, of course, it's subject to uh, rebuttable uh, uh, contrary evidence. If the other party can produce evidence that, oh, this judgment is uh, subject to uh, retrial procedure and after the registration uh, application has been lodged, then uh, the other party can produce that evidence to as a, as a basis for setting aside. So um, the main uh, is a, a simple mechanism. Uh, basically, is the certificate. If you have the certificate, then it's prima facie evidence that it's final and conclusive. Other questions?
Okay. Well, okay, then thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you to the panelists. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the uh, last panel session on the cross-border legal harmonization conference today. Um, I'm Stefan Lowe, and I'll be the uh, moderator for our uh, session this afternoon, which is on cross-border insolvency. Um, so if Hong Kong does not yet have a comprehensive statutory uh, scheme dealing with cross-border insolvency, but um, a major development uh, last year between mainland and Hong Kong was the uh, implementation of the new cooperation mechanism between Hong Kong court and mainland courts. And that is intended to uh, facilitate recognition of uh, mutual recognition between uh, uh, the insolvency uh, office holders from uh, both jurisdictions. Um, so uh, some of our speakers today will uh, talk about that as well as some other important aspects of the cross-border insolvency. Um, so we have a number of distinguished speakers on our panel this session. Before we start on the presentations, I'll briefly introduce our speakers to you. Uh, we have today Professor Bob Vessels, who will be speaking to us via Zoom from the Netherlands. Um, professor Vessels was formerly Professor of International Insolvency Law at the University of Leiden. Amongst other roles, Professor Vessels has been an independent expert counsel to the European Commission on Restructuring and Insolvency Law, and also Chairman of the Independent European Think Tank Conference of European Restructuring and Insolvency Law. We also have the pleasure of Dr. Uh, Judge Dr. Min Kyung Kim from South Korea. Um, Judge Kim is from the Daejeon District Court in South Korea. She has expertise in cross-border disputes, including cross-border insolvency. She has sat in the Special Division for International Commercial Cases at the Seoul Central District Court. Our third speaker will be Mr. Luk Chan Ho, Barrister at Devo Chambers. Mr. Ho has over two decades of experience in company commercial and financial law. He's practiced extensively in the area of restructuring and insolvency, and has also published widely on insolvency and conflict of laws. Finally, we have Professor Charles Booth. Uh, Professor Booth is the Michael J. Mark Distinguished Professor in Business Law at the University of Hawaii. He's the founding director of the Institute of Asian Pacific Business Law, a fellow in the American College of Bankruptcy, and a founding member of the International Insolvency Institute. And Professor Booth has published extensively in insolvency law in many jurisdictions, including Hong Kong. So we'll have our four speakers provide their talks first, and then we'll have a general Q&A session afterwards. Um, I'll now invite our first speaker, Professor Bob Vessels, to give his presentation. Uh, Professor Vessels' talk is titled Cross-Border Insolvency, between mainland China and Hong Kong, challenges and opportunities. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me via modern technology, just to give you an impression. In the Netherlands presently, it's around 10 degrees Celsius, which we call the beginning of winter. And luckily, the organizers and I found out that four days ago, Europe is on winter time. Therefore, I could be I could be connected to you. Uh, I, I recall uh, that my first flight to Hong Kong directly from uh, KLN Amsterdam, of course, took around uh, nine hours, but was in 1992. And at that time, I remember that we're not flights allowed to go directly to either Shanghai or Beijing, and you had to fly either via KL or, or Hong Kong. I had hoped uh, to celebrate my first coming by airplane to Hong Kong 30 years ago, uh, but it wasn't uh, uh, possible. And 
I'm sorry to say, so if I saw you just walking around in, in the break with all the, uh, you call it mouth uh, caps, um, it's, uh, maybe it's better that uh, this uh, Dutchman who is uh, in an age of uh, being at risk, I'm 73, that he won't come to Hong Kong. But intellectually, my dear friends, I am with you. Next slide, please. It's uh, 25 years of uh, basic law, and um, especially Article 95 uh, is of most importance. The Hong Kong Special Administration region may, through consultations and in accordance with law, maintain juridical relations with the judicial organs or other parts of the country and may render assistance to each other. Next slide, please. So on the most probably, you know, I'm just a foreigner looking in, uh, most probably that has been the sort of constitutional basis for what Mr. Stefan Lowe just um, introduced, the rules of 2021, which for ease of reference, I call the 2021 arrangement. And I studied together with uh, Dr. Shui Guo. Uh, Shui is presently an assistant professor at this China university, but he used to work in Leiden, the Netherlands for th four years, um, working on his PhD, which he defended, I think some three years ago, on the recognition of judgments uh, and, and other resolutions coming from uh, banks. So he's typically a guy from the banks. Well, this is the, the, the arrangement. There's a record of meeting of the uh, Supreme Court of China together with the uh, government of uh, Hong Kong. There are under two some procedures and there's the opinion of the Supreme Court on taking forward a pilot measure in relation to recognition and assistance to bankruptcy and, or insolvency. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you these very old uh, books from, I think it's uh, end of the 18th uh, century, beginning of the 19th century, uh, as an introduction to my own country. Next slide, please. please. Because Stefan Lowe, uh, the, the chairman, just said Hong Kong is looking for, you know, a better way of cross-border cooperation. Well, my dear friends, the Netherlands work still with a National Bankruptcy Act of 1896. Did he say 1896? Yes, 1896. And there is only one or two provisions um, in the Dutch Act. And we don't have any full-fledged or if you semi-full-fledged regulation with regard to insolvency, international insolvency law. And we get large cases, uh, Yukos oil uh, from Russia. It uh, lasted some 12 or 14 uh, years. Uh, there was no legislation, so there was a hassle. But I think there are some 50, 50 procedures, not only about recognition, but all other issues in the Netherlands. And all the judges are trying to, to uh, do their best. The same was for uh, the largest Brazil national landline uh, telecom company and the air, air carrier Jet Airways in India. So what does this mean for practice? There's always uncertainty for the judges, but also for what I've done for a long time, how, how to advise parties that are looking for certainty. There are a lot of costs for legal opinions, for procedures to clarify uh, what, um, what is happening in the Netherlands or clarify court cases. Additional costs for parallel proceedings. If there are assets in the Netherlands, you can uh, start 
parallel proceedings, parallel to uh, proceedings pending elsewhere. And if there's any case law, is it also um, adequate to deal with this ongoing trend, especially also in Europe, of having restructuring that are based on imminent uh, insolvency or the danger of becoming insolvency, only not pre-insolvency, many times based on negotiations, leading to what's called also the Dutch scheme. And of course, with all those costs, um, small businesses um, are not helped anyway, because you have to always um, uh, have on board um, and, and legal advice. Next slide, please. Uh, 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 I, I had to say, I'm advising also the Dutch ministry already since, well, uh, 15 or so years. And many times I say to, to the minister, this gives image problems for you. We think that the Netherlands is seen as a rather open economy and rather modern, etc. Strange language, though. Funny people, though. They're very direct in their... Uh, uh, communication, but nevertheless. But the legislator is seen as non-competent in this area. The whole legal framework is just weak. Our politicians, we, we've got around 16 or 18 um, um, political parties in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, if you ask about insolvency, let alone cross-border insolvency, it's not on their top 10 list. So if you are looking for legislation, you have to make a large case of giving it priority. Where business is a part of a global community, you cannot stay on this level of providing legal facilities to solve insolvency related business problems. And what politicians all, always say, and I, I know it is, for mainland China in some 30 or 35, you know, general um, treaties and conventions that are there, there's always the idea of reciprocity. Meaning uh, we as country assist the Netherlands if the Netherlands would also assist us in the same type of problems. We will later say a few words about the model law of UNCITRAL on cross-border insolvency which is a, a grand example and has been enacted in roughly about 50 states, including a few years ago also in, uh, for a large part in, in Singapore. But many of the states also apply reciprocity provisions before Mexico, for instance, will recognize a proceeding. It will check whether the country where the proceeding comes from, the Netherlands, for instance, always provides the same assistance, also provides the same assistance. I always wonder, you know, what's a justification? For me, it's typically a public law idea between states, and states should, what's the justification for states to look for reciprocity? Next slide, please. So if you look at the, uh, the 2021 arrangement, just uh, pick up a few things. If you have an, uh, an insolvent debtor, you must have a court that has international jurisdiction. And the opinion of the Supreme Court says the um, international jurisdiction is generally the place of incorporation of the debtor, which is the registered place of the debtor and the court shall consider other facts. And in the English translation, we found the principal office, the principal place of business, the place of principal assets, and also between brackets, etc. Well, you know, that is just something like, let's take all the things that are there and leave it to the judge to decide and the judge has no uh, common uh, reference to deal with it. The general definition of the, of international insolvency and, and the center of main interest, COMI, of a debtor 
is also whether the actions and the administrations being done by the debtor is ascertainable by third parties. And we don't find that element in the, um, in the arrangement. So it is rather typically corporate law focused and not so much on the contact with creditors focus, which you see in nearly all jurisdiction applying the Comey definition. The possibility of having a parallel proceeding in the other place where it's not the international jurisdiction, let's say it, it is in one of the three, I think you call them provinces in, uh, in, the, in China. Uh, and if there are operational activities of, of a certain extent, can you start secondary or non-main proceedings in that country? Um, we, I don't know what has happened there. Which law applies? If you, if you have uh, a proceeding with, uh, let's say, a Comey in Hong Kong that has um, operational activities and contracts with mainland China, which law applies? Is it the law that has been chosen by the parties or is it another law? So there, there are applicable law provisions missing. Also, the model law on cross-border insolvency law doesn't provide rules for uh, applicable law. <coughs> applicable law. Next slide, please. And then there's typically um, and the public policy exception, with this, which is rather common all over the world. Meaning, if there's a, um, an insolvency proceeding coming from the Netherlands, and it will be automatically under the EU insolvency regulation um, recognized in one of the other 26 or seven countries in the EU, for instance, in Italy, Italy can say we will not recognize it because it brings effects or the proceeding itself is against public policy or manifestly against public policy, which, which gives a, a, a larger uh, discretion for a court not to provide recognition. But this is a very wide um, public policy definition. It's not only uh, the basic principles of law of the mainland are violated, and I don't know whether there's a booklet with all those basic pr principles, but nevertheless, it, it's uh, the words that's presented, uh, or uh, the public order and good morals are fair. And also, when the comey of the debtor is not in Hong Kong, in the case of Article 2, when, look, when their mainland creditors not treated equally, when there's fraud and all other circumstances in which the people's courts consider that recognition or assistance should not be rendered. Okay, well, that brings in, it's not only what the Dutch call the goat part, but very small, no, it's a very wide field that the other country, in this case, China can say, mainly China can say, uh, it's against public policy. The next slide. Thank you. Um, and the last slide, ju just pick some elements from uh, the arrangement. Administrators, it says, in the two jurisdictions, should strengthen the communication cooperation in the corps, uh, courts in the pilot areas in the mainland, shall actively communicate and take forward cooperation with the courts. Okay, thank you. That's all. You know, it's very open, abstract. Oh, it's a, the slide says it's a very abstract rule. If you compare it to Article 27 of the model law, which has roughly the same provision between the 27 member states under the European insolvency regulation. And the forms of cooperation are, for instance, the appointment of a person or a body to act at the direction of the court, communications, coordination of the administration supervision of the debtors, uh, assets and affairs. Why don't we agree in the so sort of protocol concerning the coordination of those proceedings. And for instance, 
under F27F, the enacting state, which follows in its national uh, legal text, this model law example, may wish to list additional forms of e examples uh, of cooperation. Next slide. So without, you know, I've, be, I've been 10 times in, in um, Hong Kong and China, just fly in and out. So, you know, this is typically a foreigner, but I, I'm trying to use my imagination. What should be the step forward? I think there are five avenues to at least take a first step because this is in development. This is open for discussion. This is open for finding better ideas that can be used um, in the arrangement or as a, a new arrangement. Uh, and the elements I'd like to say are, uh, you can learn from other mixed legal systems, improve the alignment with the UNCTRAL uh, soft law model law proposals, create an own system, create a separate regime for smaller companies, and develop a hybrid framework. And I will explain that later. Next slide, please. The first is that, you know, in the books, um, the one country, two systems idea is seen as a mixed uh, legal system. So I thought, can we also learn from other countries that are using mixed systems in several ways of being mixed? Because they don't understand each other's languages or they the country itself just merged from two other countries now into one country or it is I think like Malta uh, partly Maltese national law with a large chunk of uh, basic UK law South Africa my dear friends I, I just wrote a book a year ago about the, um, the bankruptcy of Rembrandt that was based on Amsterdam city law of the 17th century city law with regard to insolvency. That law um, is the basis for the application in South Africa. Okay, so you can, I think if you dive into mixed legal system, especially in a group of students, there, there may rise the possibility of two or three elements on procedures, on substantial law, on communication, uh, you name it, that you can use. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, um, the proposal uh, itself, the alignment, should better align uh, with the key concepts of the model law, international jurisdiction, public policy, cooperation, because then people like me better understand what you can do within Hong Kong, China. I, I'm not going into the, the possibility that there will also be a, not a third country, but that it has a wider application. I think Article uh, 96 of the Basic Law provides some sort of a basis. But in the present situation, um, improve the alignment with the UNCTRAL uh, model law and also learn for instance, what Australia and uh, recently uh, uh, Brazil have learned from enacting the model law. Uh, by the way, the thing is 25 years old, so you, you'd like to have some new elements in it. And I think that uh, uh, Luke Jan Ho has uh, written a compiled a very uh, good study on it from I think some three or four years ago uh, as a first start to uh, to look at. And consider also the new model laws on judicial decisions in the context of insolvency and on enterprise group. Uh, and maybe you have seen that in July 2022 in the UK, a consultation has started and maybe already ended whether England that, who ha that has incorporated large uh, similarity of the model law of 1997 um, 
that England now is consulting, especially practice, shall we also consider the, the other two model laws? Next slide, please. Then a more structural approach. Um, uh, Xing Yi Gong has been my PhD uh, author, I think between 2012-ish and 2016. And she wrote her book on the China inter-regional cross-border insolvency arrangement. So she proposes, and I'm basing my idea on her proposal, of course, she is my doctoral candidate, uh, on creating a more structural, permanent standing framework, including a judicial committee or forum or what, you know, court to decide on matters. Next slide, please. Such an element would fit in this Article 27F of the model law, and it could base itself on the American Law Institute and, and the International Insolvency Institute global principles for cross-border communication in insolvency cases. And as uh, Professor Booth uh, knows, that was written by our late friend, uh, uh, Professor Ian Fletcher from London and by myself. And I'm still, I'm not an ambassador or a reverend, but I, I still, it's still worthwhile to look at those principles for the op overriding objective, for the better definition of international jurisdiction, recognition, relief, limited idea of public policy, how to formulate a stay or a moratorium, the use of protocols, but also in an arrangement, a standing judicial committee, the standing the dispute settlement uh, committee between mainland and Hong Kong, an interregional case register where these international cases are um, deposited, and also the possibility of using inter independent intermediaries, which is a possibility also. Next slide. So I said uh, five avenues. Uh, this is the fourth one. Um, why should we bother small companies with all this very detailed formal, uh, formal judicial rules? I think a uh, definition for an SME um, you can find in a recent study from the um, uh, American, uh, no, sorry, the Asian Business Law Institute. I think the study was from April, and I think there's also a definition of what in, in you know in the, in your let's say you know culture, including China, uh, is a viable uh, debtor or an enterprise to being a small enterprise. And I'm just referring to this dear bilateral treaty of 1925 between the Netherlands and Belgium. Belgium is a different country. Yes, my dear friends, it's a different country. We used to be together, but since 80, 1838, these are two countries, and a, a small part of the country speaks some uh, Valon, which is a French version. And the northern part of Belgium speaks um, sort of Dutch. It is Dutch Flemish. But there is automatic recognition. So why don't you have automatic recognition for smaller companies? Unless, and just the, 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 the four rules, uh, also item one, public policy, that it can be enforced in the other country. But also um, section four, that the parties have been lawfully presented so that you know uh, that it is. So there are bilateral treaties from narrowing countries uh, who are neighbor of each other, who have many times have economic ties across the border. And you should facilitate that, I think, much more easier, for instance, than the Netherlands that would work together with Venezuela because there are only incidental economic relations. And the last one, last slide, please. 
Thank you. A hybrid framework. Hybrid framework meaning you have some sort of structural um, kikia. We, uh, I used to say it uh, China inter regional cross border insolvency arrangement um, plus an agreement. And the agreement deals with a targeted approach. The case is upcoming, you know it is there. Why don't you write in a few days a protocol only for this specific case? And the instruments, basic instruments, are in the Kikia, but also already some sort of an idea of a model or a, a basic draft of a, a protocol. And then you can get inspiration of protocols that have been. Model protocols have been published. I think it was last year. Uh, I, I think I, I refer to yeah, I refer to uh, to my blog where you find some materials. So you focus on case specific circumstances and need, and you arrange for an individual cooperation. Maybe appoint an independent intermediary. Maybe appoint an information officer like that has been done in uh, still uh, in Canada or a mediator. Um, but my idea for today was, and that's my final remark, um, the present system needs coming from the best European advice, uh, needs improvement. If you want to go on the way of further cooperation, which is which gives certainty, uh, which is what many um, businesses uh, want. And then there are five ways to feed the new um, arrangement of 20, it's now 2022, 2023. Doesn't have to take too long. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Vessel. Um, I now invite Judge Dr. Min Kyung Kim to provide her talk on cross-border insolvency in the Korean courts, introduction of the Hanjin Shipping Insolvency Council. Thank you, Professor Vessel. Uh, good afternoon. It is an honor and pleasure to be here or to be able to speak at this distinguished event. Today, as a sitting judge in the Korean judiciary, I would like to share my knowledge in the area of cross-border insolvency. I would like to introduce the Hanjin shipping case, one of the most high-profile insolvency cases to date in Korea. I'd like to share what we learned from the case, but before I delve into the detail, let me briefly outline how insolvency work law works in Korea. The court-led insolvency proceedings in Korea can be divided roughly into two categories. Rehabilitation, which corresponds to the Chapter 11 procedure of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, and bankruptcy, which is similar to Chapter 7 proceedings of the U.S. Code. And both are covered in the Debtor Rehabilitation and Bankruptcy Act, which I refer to as the DRBA. The DRBA adopted the Amsetra Model Law on cross-border insolvency and is thus based on the principle of universality. Uh, it means that the foreign proceedings will be recognized on the specific requirements. And foreign creditors can participate in the Korean proceedings and are treated equally to domestic creditors. However, the DRBA deviated from the model law on particular points. The key differences are that one, the Korean Act did not adopt the concept of main and non-main proceedings, and two, that the recognition of the foreign proceedings does not entail an automatic stay order on the debtor's assets. The recognition order only confirms that the foreign proceedings are eligible for the Korean court's assistance, such as stay order or other reliefs. In this regard, the recognition order can be referred to as an admission ticket. 
Chapter 5 of the DIBA covers various aspects of cross-border insolvency. It provides inter alia that the Korean insolvency representative can seek recognition in a foreign court or participate in foreign proceedings and the Korean court can cooperate with foreign insolvency courts regarding parallel proceedings. I would like to address how these two unfolded in the Hanjin case. Hanjin Shipping had been ranked ninth worldwide and first in Korea in the shipping business. It operated 144 ships with more than 60 regular lines. But due to the global financial crisis in 2008, the demand for shipping fell, leading to reduced prices. And 2015 saw a dramatic fall in fares due to the increasing supply of ships. In June, in June 2016, Hanjin's balance sheet showed 5.6 billion US dollars in assets, 5 billion US dollars in debts, and recorded a net loss of 315 million US dollars. In August 2016, Hanjin applied for the commencement of rehabilitation, and the court issued a stay order regarding its assets. And the next day, the court granted the commencement order of rehabilitation proceedings, which was rendered in an unusually short period of time. However, after five months, the rehabilitation proceedings were converted to bankruptcy proceedings in which the bankruptcy of Hanjin was subsequently declared. Several factors made Hanjin's rehabilitation more difficult. First, Hanjin operated with container carriers with regular lines. And this type of business has more customers than bulk carriers and allows less flexibility in revoking existing contracts. Furthermore, Hanjin had sold its core business assets, such as the regular line to the US, Long Beach Terminal, and its American subsidiaries. Secondly, most of their ships were technically not owned by Hanjin, but bareboard chartered higher purchase, in short, BBCHP. I will return to this later, but stay orders in Korea are only granted to debtors' assets. Therefore, their BBCHP ships were exposed to ship arrests. In addition, a few of Hanjin's leading destinations, including the PRC, Egypt, and Panama's law, do not recognize the Korean insolvency proceeding and in causing an even greater risk of difference. Thirdly, although Hanjin was a subsidiary of Korean Air, it could not expect financial aid from the parent company. And this was because lending money to a subsidiary in need would be against the director's fiduciary duties to the parent company, which has criminal law implications. Now, I will turn to the cross-border aspect of this case. As Hanjin ships were traveled worldwide and had assets all around the world, cooperation with foreign courts was essential. The Korean insolvency proceedings were recognized in many different jurisdictions, such as the US, Australia, the UK, Germany, Singapore, Japan, and etc. In other jurisdictions, including the PRC, Hanjin did not apply for recognition order in the first place, as it was advised not to do so due to a low prospect of success. In Hanjin's case, the Korean court set out uh, an excellent precedent in terms of judicial cooperation. The U.S. New Jersey Bankruptcy Court recognized the Korean proceedings and allowed the proceeds from the state of Hanjin's U.S. assets to be repatriated to Korea. And this was action through the court-to-court -court communication. The New Jersey Court also granted an extensive stay order, including the BBC HP shifts, despite the objection brought by bunker suppliers who were maritime lien holders. The New Jersey court found that although Hanjin did not own the uh, BBC HP boats, in order to achieve the practical objective of moving cargo from Hanjin's vessels 
to intended destinations in the US, it was necessary to extend the stay order to that of charter to Hunton. And this logic led to stay orders on the BBC HQ ships in the UK, Germany, Singapore, and Australia. However, under Korean law, only the debtors' assets are subject to stay orders. And whether the court should grant a stay order on the BBC HP ships boils down to the question of who owns the BBC HP ship. As I mentioned, BBC HP means bare board charter with a higher purchase agreement by which the ship shall acquire the nationality of the charterer upon the expiry of the charter period. As shown on the slide, BBC HP ships are owned by the SPF, SPC, but the charterer in the present case Hanjin was to acquire their ownership upon paying full charterage. So there are conflicting views how to tackle this question. The prevailing view is that the SPC owns the BBC HP boat, focusing on the fact that the ship is still registered under the SPC and it can repossess the vessel in case of default. Others say that the BBC HP is akin to finance leases, so the charterer should be deemed the owner and the SPC as a secured uh, creditor. A district court in Korea took the former view. In this case, maritime lien holders who were bunker suppliers to Hanjin applied for the auction of one of the BBC HP ships and the application was granted. The court rejected the Hanjin's contention that the ship was owned by Hanjin, so the stay order should be extended to the boat. And this, of course, had a negative effect on Hanjin's rehabilitation. And this decision still remains controversial in Korea. And this is a question of how to balance conflicting interests between the debtor's rehabilitation and the rights of our secured credit. In my opinion, there are a few lessons to be learned from this case. First, Hanjin's insolvency was not a prepackaged plan. It took only one day from applying for a rehabilitation to obtain the commencement order. And once the procedure commenced, the debtor could not withdraw from the proceeding. And this did not allow Hanjin and the Korean government enough time to deal with the subsequent logistic disruption in the market. In this regard, in the aftermath of Hanjin's case, the Seoul Bankruptcy Court adopted a new procedural rules, providing that with sufficient time to consider a voluntary workout plan before the commencement order. Secondly, Hanjin case showed the importance and effectiveness of judicial cooperation, uh, especially in cross-border insolvency cases. The Seoul Bankruptcy Court is making its best efforts to enhance collaboration with its counterpart all around the world. And so far, it has joined the Judicial Insolvency Network and concluded MOUs with several uh, foreign jurisdictions. And I want to say that the Hanjin insolvency case presented the Korean judiciary with an important opportunity to refine its cross-border insolvency system. And this may have led Korea to be ranked fifth in resolving insolvency-related issues amongst 190 countries around the world, as set out in the World Bank's Doing Business Report of 2018. I hope this talk helped you to better understand Korean law and practice, and hopefully this sheds some light to uh, the cross-border insolvency issues between mainland and Hong Kong. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Judge Kim. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Luke Chan Ho, and his talk is on cross-border insolvency and restructuring cooperation between Hong Kong and mainland.
Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. So it's, uh, it's an honor to talk about the uh, cross-border insolvency arrangement or cooperation between Hong Kong and the mainland on this occasion, especially we are talking about one country, two systems. And the reason why cross-border insolvency is very important in this context is twofold. The, the first is that um, it completely highlights and accentuates the importance of one country, two systems. It shows how one country, two systems works. Secondly, the maturity of a legal system, in my view, is actually tested by its cross-border insolvency regime. This is um, how, what I mean and based on what I see in practice. In a market economy, credit is inevitable. When credit is inevitable, bankruptcy is inevitable. When credit crosses borders, cross-border insolvency becomes inevitable. Now, insolvency is always about policy because insolvency is always about how to manage a situation where you do not have enough assets to be distributed to different stakeholders. That means a priority is needed. Who gets paid first? Who gets paid second? Who gets paid last? So that is, in every country, a policy question. Each country would have its own policy. In China, we are talking about two systems. So each jurisdiction, each system would have its own policy. The policies would be different. The policies sometimes would be conflicting. So that's why when it comes to cross-border insolvency, the test would be your system, does your system have the courage to recognize policies from a different system? So when I, when I was at the World Bank, assisting various developing countries in the insolvency law reform, when it comes to cross-border insolvency, the recognition to be given to foreign insolvency proceedings, even when I was in the UK, uh, assisting the UK government on its implementation of the ancestral model law on cross-border insolvency, the, the question that came up all the time was whether, whether we should have reciprocity. In other words, as Professor Wessels explained just now, whether recognition should be based on the fact that we would only recognize proceedings commenced in jurisdictions that would also recognize our proceedings. The, the thinking is, if there is reciprocity, there is some control in order to avoid a situation where we would recognize and assist policies that are totally different from ours. The, the, always, the, the straw men always make in comments is um, insolvency proceedings were commenced in Timbuktu. Would we recognize those proceedings? So that, that is why when a country uses or enacts is cross-border insolvency regime. The strength of the cross-border insolvency regime is all, almost a litmus test for the maturity of that legal system. Now, turning to the mainland and Hong Kong. The mainland has, prior to the SPC arrangement that Professor Wessels talked about just now, a primitive cross-border insolvency system based in Article 5 of the Enterprise Bankruptcy Law. And that is unsurprising because in the mainland, the bankruptcy law uh, was only recently enacted in 2007. So the, the one country, two systems uh, allow the cross-border insolvency regime to develop, resulting in the SPC opinion. Now, many people talk about the SPC opinion uh, on the basis that it is an arrangement 
between Hong Kong and mainland to cooperate on cross-border insolvency. That uh, description is actually um, incorrect because that arrangement has nothing to do with any arrangement between Hong Kong and the mainland. That arrangement is simply based on a unilateral act on the part of the Supreme People's Court to give assistance and recognition to Hong Kong insolvency proceedings. Now, the, the significance is this. It, it highlights two things. It highlights the, um, the confidence that the SPC has in relation to the Hong Kong system. Because as I mentioned, when recognizing and assisting foreign insolvency proceedings, the recognizing jurisdiction always considers, would I be risking myself in recognizing proceedings from a different jurisdiction? So when the SPC decides that the mainland courts could recognize Hong Kong insolvency proceedings, that is a vote of confidence in the Hong Kong insolvency system. The second thing to highlight, as I mentioned, is that it is um, a unilateral act on the part of the SPC. Now, you may ask, why is that? Well, why is the SPC suddenly um, able to do that? Why is it not insisting on reciprocity? And the answer lies in how the Hong Kong court has been uh, treating cross-border insolvency. You can imagine a situation where the, in fact, the mainland courts did ask, did ask when we were in the process of doing the regime, uh, they asked, how does the Hong Kong court treat insolvency proceedings commenced outside Hong Kong? Would the Hong Kong court recognize and assist mainland insolvency proceedings? So they ask, they ask those questions. And the answer we could give is that well, the Hong Kong court does not have a statute that says we would recognize proceedings commenced outside Hong Kong. But our case law does. And we could show the, um, our mainland counterparts the Hong Kong cases. Now, in, it's good that uh, Judge Harris is in the audience. And I, and I can say um, with full, full confidence, and this is you can check the public record, that uh, Judge Harris is, has single-handedly reformed our cross-border insolvency regime in Hong Kong. And in fact, it is precisely because we have cases, in fact, decided by Judge Harris, that recognize mainland insolvency proceedings that the SPC could say to oh, their stakeholders that we do not need to have a signed arrangement the, the arrangement of the sort that you would have heard about in prior sessions today, that an arrangement that was signed by both Hong Kong and the mainland saying, uh, you would do this, I would do that. There's no need for that because um, what we say to them is, um, the SPC on the mainland part, you could recognize Hong Kong insolvency proceedings. On the Hong Kong side, you do not need to have a signed arrangement from the Hong Kong government. That is because our Hong Kong cases already give recognition and assistance to insolvency proceedings commenced in the mainland. So in other words, this cross-border insolvency regime that we see now is a manifestation of confidence given by the mainland courts in the Hong Kong systems, and also the result of actual practical cooperation granted by the Hong Kong courts to insolvency proceedings commenced outside Hong Kong. Now, let me now turn to the cases that show what I mean in terms of the practical assistance. The, uh, I, I turn to the first two cases 
first, namely CFC and stringent average. Now, those cases were the, the cornerstone of Hong Kong mainland insolvency cooperation. Because without those two cases, there wouldn't be, I can guarantee you, there wouldn't be the SPC opinion. Because it is those two cases that reassured the mainland counterparts that there's nothing to fear about cross-border insolvency. And, and those two cases show in a cross-border insolvency cooperation situation, what assistance you can grant and, and the benefits that you could get from the, the assistance to be granted. Uh, I'll just summarize the cases very briefly in view of the time. Now in the CEFC case, what happened was there was a Shanghai liquidation. Upon being appointed, the Shanghai liquidators found out that one creditor has got a judgment against the company already in Hong Kong under an agreement known as a keep well agreement. The judgment debt, as I recall, was about 79 million euros. The creditor was about to obtain a Ganeshi order absolute against the debtors IEC FC's assets in Hong Kong. The Shanghai liquidators, upon being appointed, found that out. Oh, of course, all, the, all this, of course, the judgment, everything, the application for the Ganeshi order was obtained prior to the appointment of the Shanghai liquidators. So when they found out, they quickly uh, came to Hong Kong, that I was involved, to apply for recognition in Hong Kong in order to stop the Ganeshi order. Because if you do not stop the Ganeshi order, the money in Hong Kong would be used to pay that particular creditor only. So therefore, it would be very unfair to all other creditors. And uh, Judge Harris, for the first time ever in Hong Kong, granted recognition and assistance to the Shanghai liquidators. And then so we stopped the Ganeshi order absolute from being made. And then the second case shows why cross-border insolvency is needed. In that case, liquidators were appointed in Shenzhen. The Shenzhen liquidators found out that the company had subsidiaries in Hong Kong. The subsidiaries had bank accounts in Hong Kong. However, the director of the Shenzhen company and its subsidiaries in Hong Kong was the same person. And he'd been arrested. And therefore, the, the, the subsidiaries in Hong Kong no longer had any management. Without any management, the subsidiaries would not be able to get the money out of the Hong Kong bank accounts. So therefore, the, there was a practical need for the Shenzhen liquidators to be able to control the Hong Kong subsidiaries, to manage its affairs, and in particular, to get the money out of the bank account. So that's why they came to Hong Kong to apply for recognition. And I was involved as well. Uh, again, George Harris uh, granted recognition to the Shenzhen liquidators and therefore allow the liquidators to control their subsidiaries and take money out of the bank accounts in Hong Kong. So those two cases show the SPC how cross-border insolvency and cross-border recognition and assistance would work. Then th that basically those two cases then led to the confidence given by the SPC in the Hong Kong system that then led to the uh, opinion that Professor Vessels talked about just now. And then after that, uh, in 2011, uh, 2021, 20, 20, we had the HNA case and the Noxie Capital case, or sometimes known as the Peking University Founder case. Now, those two cases are extremely important, which I will talk about later. Um, HNA um, is the first time ever where the Hong Kong court recognized and assisted mainland reorganization proceedings. The prior two cases concerned 
mainland liquidation. HNA was the first ever recognition of mainland reorganization proceeding. And the, one of the assistance, uh, a relief granted there was that actions in Hong Kong against the company HNA would be stayed which is a typical insolvency assistance. The, the second case, uh, again, concerns one is known as, known as the keep well arrangement. Um, the, the facts are fairly complex, but I'll just for present purposes, uh, all you need to know is the following. Peking University has signed an agreement known as a keep well agreement in order to raise funds through Hong Kong and offshore jurisdictions. Peking University became insolvent and went into and became subject to mainland reorganization proceedings. The Keywell Agreement was governed by English law and is subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the Hong Kong court. The beneficiary of the Keywell Agreement, i.e. the creditor, sued the company, i.e. Peking U, in Hong Kong. Peking U, as I mentioned, has gone into mainland reorganization proceedings. The mainland administrators then came to Hong Kong to apply for recognition and assistance using the example of HNA that I just mentioned. They say, they say, what, what they say is very simple. We are mainland administrators. We have a mainland reorganization proceeding. You have Hong Kong court, you have recognized these proceedings before. So please recognize us. Please assist us. Assist us by staying the action in Hong Kong against us. The Hong Kong court, again, this is Mr. Justice Harris. That's why I say Judge Harris has basically single handedly uh, reformed and developed the Hong Kong cross border insolvency system. The Hong Kong court said, fine, we would, we recognize your proceedings. We would assist you. We would stay actions in Hong Kong, but we would not stay this particular action um, because we respect our common law system, which is you need to show very good reason before we depart from exclusive jurisdiction clauses. So in this case, we will not stay. And we also we cannot see any good reason for staying it. Um, what, what the administrators say is there is a very good reason for staying it. Because fine, you, you allow the action here to proceed. You allow a judgment to be obtained. Let, let's assume the plaintiffs win. In fact, I echo the plaintiffs. You allow, you assume that the plaintiffs win. You get a judgment against us, picking you. But our proceedings are based on the mainland. Whatever judgment you can get is going to be useless. The Beijing court will simply ignore what you say. This is the, the argument made. Uh, in the end, um, the Hong Kong court's conclusion is that that argument doesn't sound right. We do not believe that the Beijing court would totally ignore the Hong Kong court judgment on English law issues. In a, a one country, two system situation, who do you think Beijing court or Hong Kong court would be better placed to determine issues of English law? Would it make sense for the Beijing court to say, Hong Kong court, you have decided issues of English law, we will ignore. But in order to determine the particular issue which is governed by English law, we would take expert evidence from different experts. But isn't it the answer that the best expert evidence you could get is actually the Hong Kong court judgment? And, and that, that's the reason that the Hong Kong court um, accepted. The Hong Kong court therefore did not stay the action. Now, what is interesting is that subsequently there was a letter right, written by the Beijing court to the administrators to be shown to the Hong Kong court 
the Beijing court said, uh, we look forward to more cooperation with Hong Kong if the trial proceeds. Now, what, therefore, what, what is interesting uh, for, for our topic, for the purposes of, of our topic, is that cross-border insolvency uh, is not just about recognition of proceedings, assistance to be granted to office holders in the form described by the SPC in the arrangement. It is also about how to manage the actual cases, the, the actual facts, actual problems before the court. The PUFG case is a perfect example. What the Hong Kong court does, uh, in my view, is, is um, the, the best illustration of cross-border insolvency cooperation. We would recognize to the fullest and assist to the fullest mainland insolvency proceedings. Now, the mainland administrators have their own domestic reorganization to manage. They, for example, need to determine whether the claims under the Cuban agreements are valid. They are governed by Hong Kong, uh, English law. In the end, in due course, the, main, the mainland court, i.e. the Beijing court, would have to grapple with this question. I need to consider whether these claims under English law are valid or not. So, the Hong Kong court, in the one country, two systems situation, would say, well, in fact, I'm helping by not allowing the actions to be stopped by not allowing the proceedings to be transferred to Beijing for determination. The Hong Kong court is actually helping the Beijing court to determine English law issues. So that I think, although that was not stated clearly in the letter from the Beijing court, that must be, I guess, the reason why the Beijing court said in the letter, said, saying that they look forward to more cooperation with Hong Kong. So this is yet another, the most practical example of how cross-border insolvency works and how, why one country, two systems would work to the best advantage of, of uh, the, the whole uh, Chinese ecological system. Um, I'll just mention briefly how the um, mainland courts have been helping Hong Kong insolvency proceedings under the SPC arrangement. There have been four cases, uh, I'm involved actually in three of them. Um, so what, what we need in order to trigger potential assistance in the mainland is that you need a letter of request from the Hong Kong court to be sent to the Mainland courts, and there are only three cities that are relevant, i.e. Shenzhen, Xiamen, and Shanghai. For the courts there to determine whether assistance should be granted or not. So far, four letters of request have been sent. All of them were sent by George Harris. Three letters have been sent to the Shenzhen court. One letter to the Shanghai court. Siamen hasn't happened yet. Out of the three letters of request to the Shenzhen court, one has resulted in an actual recognition order. That's Samsung paper. Uh, that, that case was fairly easy. It was essentially a uh, Hong Kong liquidator saying we wanted assistance in the mainland in order to control various assets in the mainland, including uh, various, various receivables, in the mainland, and also in that case, um, a, a flat in Beijing. In Osner Water, it was um, similar. Uh, there was a little request to the Shanghai court. There, the liquidators appointed in Hong Kong found out that some of their assets have been misused by the former management in Shanghai. So this is a, a, a water company, so water machine company. So the Hong Kong liquidators found out 
that the old management had been using the same technology, almost the same name, same logo in a different business in Shanghai. So that's why they wanted to, to stop it. Uh, Zhao Heng was a bit more complicated again, was re related to investigation in, um, main, in the mainland. Uh, Hong Kong freshwater was uh, very similar. It was uh, a situation where the Hong Kong liquidators wanted to take part in proceedings in the mainland against a company in order to protect the company's assets. So what, what we see at the moment is that um, the development is ongoing. What we hope is that uh, there will be more cases, more complicated cases, uh, such, uh, such as the Peking U case, allowing the mainland court to see how cross-border insolvency works so that the mainland courts would have even more confidence in the practical operation of cross-border insolvency uh, uh, and cross-border cooperation. So to conclude, so what, what, what I would say is um, Professor Vessels has um, very clearly set out the various types of various models, how we could use to improve the systems further. Regardless of what model we use, ultimately it depends on the actual individual judges approach to all of this. In Hong Kong, we have been very practical in, in uh, allowing assistance to happen despite the complete lack of legislation. In the mainland, uh, if the same approach could be taken, this is how we would show how the systems, uh, how the two systems we have here are truly mature insolvency systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ho. Um, I now invite our last speaker, uh, Professor Charles Booth, and his talk is on cross-border insolvency cooperation between mainland Hong Kong, a proposal to extend cooperation to personal insolvency proceeding involving Shenzhen in Hong Kong. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back at uh, Hong Kong U. It's been a number of, uh, number of years. And I'm glad that my presentation is last because it follows nicely on the uh, the framework laid out by uh, Professor Vessels and then the presentation we just heard that really lays the, uh, the, uh, the backdrop for what I wanna talk about. And that is to extend the current arrangement under the SPC uh, agreement um, to personal insolvency, uh, primarily to bring in uh, what Professor Vessels was talking about with SMEs, um, small and medium-sized enterprises and even micro enterprises. So at one level, it might seem, well, after we just heard about all these big complicated cases, why do we wanna waste time on all these small cases? What I'd like to do is to uh, give a little background to show why I think this is the time to move in that direction and to show to you that that is exactly what is happening throughout Asia. There's a renewed focus on, on SMEs. I was uh, living in Hong Kong when the 97 Asian financial crisis hit. Um, a year before, Hong Kong actually had the opportunity uh, to be the first jurisdiction in the world to sign on to the Institutional Model Law. And they passed at that time thinking that it was premature. And as we fast forward to the present, we can see how much has developed. And as we've heard, because Hong Kong had not signed on to the model law, that is the reason why we need so many court judgments, because it's those court judgments that sets out the framework in the Hong Kong law um, that we did not uh, we, the, we did not have previously because we did not sign on to the, to the model law. So why personal insolvency? Well, if you look back at the time of the um, Asian financial crisis at, in Asia, the focus was clearly on corporate reorganization. At that time, Asia was focused on liquidation models. There were few jurisdictions where restructuring uh, could occur efficiently. And if so, uh, even fewer where it could occur under the formal law. Over the next two decades, we saw massive, massive law reform throughout the region that improved the framework and the results in many, many Asian countries. Uh, but even at that time, there was still a general ignoring of small and medium-sized enterprises. All of that changed with COVID. 
when COVID hit, it was very clear worldwide that it was the small enterprises that bore the brunt of the problems. And then many organizations started looking at the data. And in many Asian countries, the, the engine of growth is the small and medium-sized enterprise. Um, in many countries, above 90% of new businesses are of this nature. It was also those enterprises that had a very, very difficult time getting funding from the governments when COVID hit. In many countries, much of that money went to the larger entities. So we see right now uh, in, in Asia is a renewed focus on small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, during COVID, Singapore and Australia both tinkered with their laws and brought in some temporary reforms to deal with problems, to streamline things along the lines of what Professor Vessels was talking about. It is very likely that those temporary measures might well become permanent. Uh, we see other jurisdictions like Myanmar, uh, the Lao PDR that did not have uh, uh, personal insolvency regulations or laws before enacting them. We're, they're starting right now. Um, the, the new Lao law came into operation not long ago. So against that, that backdrop, we said that, that within the region, with this focus on these smaller cases, that if Hong Kong and the mainland entered into an extension of the current process, it really would be a very good example for the rest of the, the region as to how to proceed in these, in these cases. Now, a second point about why this is helpful, and this in some ways is the opposite of the point just made, is that these cases are much simpler. These are easier cases. The, of course, personal bankruptcy law predates corporate insolvency law by, uh, by, by many, many years. So the, the, the general ideas and terms are more easily understood. And I think what that would help with if the extension of the agreement were made is that you would get more case flow. We, we've seen that right now we have four cases. And, and these complicated cases, um, with the, the complexity of these cases, they, they come along infrequently. So when we take a look at Hong Kong and, uh, and Shenzhen, they are perfectly placed side by side um, to have the possibility of greater case flow, of greater activity between the two jurisdictions. Now here, another point has to be made, and that is, well, will there be cases? Will there be personal insolvency cases? Now, why am I talking about Shenzhen now? Well, just recently, they enacted the regulations on personal bankruptcy. They're the first part of China to do so. The regulations came into effect about a year and a half ago in March of 21. So we are in the very, very early stages. But when one looks at the data on filings, one will see that with personal insolvency laws, unlike corporate insolvency laws, once that there is a sense that the, the discharge on an individual will, will work, you see a increase in the number of cases. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, unlike companies, which at the end of the day can be dissolved, individuals go on. So there has to be a mechanism for allowing an individual to get a fresh start and reemerge after insolvency and become a working member of society again. And I think there, Hong Kong is a very good example. Um, back in the day, before Hong Kong enacted uh, amendments to its law, and this was in the 1990s, there were only a few hundred personal bankruptcy cases a year in Hong Kong, 200, 300, 400. And then when the new regime for bankruptcy law came into operation in 1998, we saw a dramatic increase. Within a few years, the number of cases had gone up to almost 27,000. That was back in 2002. That's a huge, huge increase. Previously, there was a sense that this old law with a discharge that was very difficult to obtain would be of any use to them. And then you see almost 27,000 people filing. Now today, of course, the numbers are lower because what you see is that when you enact a new law, there's often an overhang at first. And then over time, you work off that overhang. But even right now for the last decade in Hong Kong, you see between 6,000 and 10,000 cases a year. 
Ironically, this year, even in the midst of COVID, looks like it might be the lowest number in a decade. But even so, that will still be close to 6,000. So when one looks at what's happening in Shenzhen, the law has just been, uh, just basically just been enacted, just come into operation. Talking to a judge from Shenzhen just over the last few days, I learned that there's roughly about 2,000 applications. Not, of course, that they've all gone forward, but 2,000 is a sizable number. That, that actually is a very significant number for a city with, depending how you define greater Shenzhen, 15 to 20 million people. And that's on par with what we saw in, in Hong Kong. Now, of course, for a personal bankruptcy law to prove effective, individuals have to see that discharges will be granted. So there's a lag. So as cases get accepted, as individuals uh, pass through that system, between five and 10 years from now, you will start seeing whether or not that process is accepted. Now, it's often been said that in Asia, that individuals will not file for bankruptcy uh, because of the stigma, because of the shame. Um, but my experience is that when you take a look at the development of consumer economies, really in every jurisdiction in Asia, when that, that, uh, the, the funds were available to consumers, we've seen an increase in insolvency laws. And that is even true in jurisdictions like Japan, where historically you had a cash-based cash society. So that is sort of uh, one factor focusing on the individuals. The other one has to do with entrepreneurs. And as I said, small businesses are the engine of growth. And that is also true in Shenzhen. There's a lot of innovation. There is a huge amount of investment of time and capital in technology. That is very, very risky. A lot of those ventures will not prove successful. A regime that focuses on finding a way for these small businessmen and businesswomen to move forward is very, very important. Now, the last point then is that we can take a look at the Shenzhen regulations. Hong Kong has its own personal bankruptcy law. Uh, what is uh, interesting, if we want to think of it as an experiment, uh, because my proposal is just for Hong Kong and Shenzhen, is we take a look at the traffic between those two jurisdictions. One, we have daily traffic. Two, even uh, before, uh, before COVID hit, we saw a lot of cross-border investment. Now with COVID, we've heard stories of individuals from Hong Kong moving to Shenzhen. I've seen other ones of individuals from Shenzhen wanting to come to Hong Kong. So individuals going back and forth. Oftentimes there are homes either owned in both jurisdictions or rented in both jurisdictions. We know of course of many small businesses in Hong Kong that have assets in Shenzhen. So you basically have all these factors that could lead to case flow. And one of the points that, that Look made is just, just so important. You want to build up confidence of each jurisdictions in of each jurisdiction in the other jurisdictions judgments. And what you need for that is to get the case flow. And my thinking is that with the area of, of bankruptcy, that we get there more quickly, that we could get more predictability that we could get more efficiency. And because the cases are simpler, that it would then give us a framework that we could then apply to the larger, more complex cases. And I will leave it at that uh, for now. Happy to have any questions answered later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Booth. Uh, so we've had some uh, very insightful talks from each of our four speakers um, on the panel just now. Um, we'll now come to the uh, Q&A session. So if anyone from the audience has any comments or any questions for members of the panel, um, then uh, please, please raise your hand and you can speak.
Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the uh, implications of uh, those uh, pioneering cases for the um, possible. Uh, uh, well, the, so the, the the Chinese property development industry is in trouble. A lot of those companies have uh, issued debts or bonds in Hong Kong or listed their shares in Hong Kong. Now, if uh, if the the uh, lenders of those companies file for bankruptcy petition in Hong Kong, the recent development um, the speakers have just described, what would be the implication for the success of uh, those potential petitions? Or maybe they're already going on, I, I don't know, uh, but is it, is it possible that those cases we just talked about will have implications for the resolution of uh, a foreseeable wave of uh, bankruptcy petition for the property development industry. Thanks. Yeah. Does anyone get yeah, chat with his booth? Yeah. more of a, of a formal record of in, in every insolvency case, one, whether there's property located outside Hong Kong, and two, where it is. And then given the arrangement that exists now with the mainland to even separate it into city by city. Uh, because I think one thing that could come from that is that, um, especially with the problems in the property market, you might find that you have more cases in one city than another city and then almost come up with, with an extension of this agreement just to that city for dealing with, with real property. And part of my, the, my, my thinking with, with, with looking into the SMEs is starting off there smaller, but what you're talking about is, 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 is a mammoth problem because in many of these cases, you're dealing with um, large property assets, but of course, one of the difficulties is they're not completed. So in terms of actually, you know, liquidating and making and, and getting money out is very difficult. And then secondly, for carrying on, you have the issues with uh, how new money comes into the, into the system. Um, but I think you, you've put your finger on an area where you'll see a lot of activity. Although I think given the nature of it, what we just heard from uh, the presentation on larger companies, that's where it's gonna be because you're dealing with some, some very large numbers and uh, many developments. There are um, two different angles. The, the first is you mentioned the um, petitions in Hong Kong. What are the implications if winding up orders are made in Hong Kong? Um, but before we get there, we, we have to think about two scenarios. Um, why is it that the Hong Kong court would like to make a winding up order? in view of the cross-border insolvency cases. Because let's imagine you make a winding up order. The liquidators appointed in Hong Kong will want to get to the mainland using the arrangement and say, I now represent the company. I want to control the assets. This brings up precisely the policy issue that I was just talking about. The Million Court would be facing a situation where liquidators from Hong Kong, acting like barbarians, wanting to control mainland companies, wanting to control assets of the company, maybe firing people, maybe stopping the projects in, in uh, half-built projects, just doing a fire sale in order to, to repatriate assets back to Hong Kong to, to pay the creditors. Now, this brings up a policy question. Would the mainland court allow that? Because this brings up a lot of social potential social instability. I think that, that issue remains unresolved because it's never happened. But the, the, the idea that recognizing Hong Kong proceedings would lead to 
um, unemployment would lead to operations being shut down has always been part of the discussion or, or the reluctance, potential reluctance of, of recognition, which is understandable. That's why I say cross-border insolvency regime really is the litmus test of the maturity of a legal system. Now, we don't have to get there if the Hong Kong courts behave in a sensible way. You might, the, the, the companies would say, well, this arrangement actually helped what we are trying to do. What we are facing is not, um, I'm speaking generally, the, the companies will say, well, what we are facing is not the result of misconduct or personal irresponsibility. What is happening is the result of the macroeconomic conditions. What is happening is a system-wide issue. Each company's problem is different, but it's a system-wide issue. Property prices falling, lacking demand, and so on. So what, what you need to do, the, what the companies can say to the Hong Kong court is, what you need to do is not to make a winding up order. Allow us to do a restructuring. Knowing the arrangement that, that is now in place, our restructuring can potentially be recognized in the mainland. Therefore, with also the mainland restructuring that, that we know is going on, because I've been helping a lot of these companies, uh, that the mainland operational restructuring and that restructuring can be combined with the Hong Kong restructuring, which can be recognized in the mainland by achieving a comprehensive restructuring. So therefore, the, the arrangement actually can be used to avoid the situation that, that you just described. How would the, what, what would be in the implications if the Hong Kong court makes a winding up order? I think the answer is that with this arrangement, there is more incentive for the Hong Kong court to behave in a sensible way and not to make a winding up order unless the circumstances really justify a liquidation. Okay, um, I'm just mindful of the time, but maybe we'll just take one, one more question if anyone has any. <laughs> the arrangements that have been entered into between the Secretary of Justice and the Supreme People's Court um, should, should be thought about. I think that that's really the big issue. How, how do we think about what's been going on there? The reason why, uh, well, let, let, let me start here. As Luke has already explained, the opinion that the SPC has produced is not an agreement, a protocol, or an arrangement with the Hong Kong government or the Hong Kong judiciary. It's an internal document and it's advice directed to three intermediate people's courts. I say three intermediate people's courts because it relates to the signed minutes of meeting that were made back in May of last year between the Secretary for Justice and the Supreme People's Court. And that only extends to three intermediate people's courts. And I was asking my colleague on my left, Judge Wang Shenzhen, how many intermediate people's courts there are in the matter. And we took a few minutes to calculate this, but we think it's approaching 300. Mm. So what we're talking about is not an arrangement between the mainland and Hong Kong. We're talking about something much narrower. Why are we talking about something much narrower? Well, in exploring that particular question, you begin to understand why a lot of the matters that Bob Wessel has referred to as things we might think about in the future are not included in what's been done so far. They're not excluded. They're not the result of people failing to identify them or identifying them, discussing them and dismissing them. It's simply that the kind of considerations that people are taking into account, mainly in the mainland, uh, are very, very general. And they come to uh, 
a consideration of the issues that we're talking about from uh, a standpoint which gives considerable weight to the different socio-economic considerations which courts in the mainland operate under. What they're concerned about, what drives them, what allows them to agree certain things are dramatically different from what influences me or what will influence the Department of Justice in Hong Kong when it's carrying out informed discussions on these matters with the SBC. And when I'm producing judgments, certainly the earlier judgments, I'm very mindful of that. So the first two judgments that Look was referring to resulted from applications which were made specifically to test whether what I had been explaining to the Supreme Court at seminars and meetings that I had in the mainland was in fact correct. And when it turned out that what I'd been telling them I would anticipate would happen, happened, that reassured them that there was reciprocity and they could trust what we were saying. So it's one small, one small but important step forward. So at the moment and for the foreseeable future, what we're really doing is allowing the mainland, and this uh, um, is re relevant to the point that Locke was making, uh, that cross-border insolvency involves a consideration by different jurisdictions of the extent to which they're going to recognize another jurisdiction's policies. Uh, the, the mainland exploring how the policies we have in Hong Kong can be reconciled with the policies that they have, which are significantly different, and how, in terms of these very broad, shapeless issues, um, we can cooperate. And it's only when the mainland is confident that the arrangement seems to be working in a way which they find acceptable between the more sophisticated intermediate people's court in the mainland, which have the benefit of having judges like Judge Wang in them, that they will begin to extend it to other intermediate people's courts. And once they're confident that at this relatively low, unsophisticated level of cooperation, it's working, will we get to the stage where we'll be able to think about the more sophisticated kind of protocols and models that, that academics are, are, are inclined to, to think of? So I think in, in, in understanding where we are and where we're going to be in the coming years, that's what one really needs to be, to be mindful of. Um, and if, and I'm not going to go into details about some of this because it, it's confidential, if you if you're familiar with the way the, the courts in the mainland operate, um, the, the idea of getting things agreed in a week, dealing with anything sophisticated, just, just seems silly because it just does not work like that. So, for example, the, the first two applications we had for, for recognition here, the second one was meant to be the first one. It was the second one because some people might think that the judge who was meant to be dealing with it just sat on the file worrying about it for months because they had general concerns which they, they were having difficulty reconciling. They, they weren't concerned with detailed rules. They weren't concerned with law because they, they didn't have it. They had much more basic considerations which, which were influencing their approach to things. So in trying to understand where we are and where we're going to be in the coming years, uh, I think that's really what you need to, to, to fully appreciate. Thank you, Judge Havers, for those very helpful comments. Um, so I think we'll wrap up the uh, cross-border insolvency panel now. And so uh, thank you again for each of our speakers. It's been very informative and illuminating. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bobas. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon.
The one-day conference has come to an end. It is my great pleasure to make concluding remarks. I would like to express my gratitude to all the speakers for their exceptional thought-provoking uh, presentations, as well as the moderators for organizing sessions and keeping things under control and on time. But most significantly, I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants who are able to join us today. We've gathered here today to share ideas and opinions on topics of mutual interest. I'm delighted that despite the short time frame, we were able to achieve our goals. One country, two system is a major topic. A lot of issues, a lot of topics can be put forward for discussion. Today, we're looking to the issues of cross-border legal harmonization, in particular in the four major fields, namely data transfer, IP, dispute resolution, and now the last session, insolvency. Even before the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR, Hong Kong has enjoyed close economic and social ties with the mainland China. Since the transfer of Hong Kong to uh, mainland China in 1997, Mainland China, Hong Kong, these two jurisdictions have reached various agreements to facilitate mutual assistance and cooperation under the framework of one country, two system. This helps to serve the needs of the Hong Kong community. The agreements include the arrangements for mutual service of judicial documents as early as 1999. Later on, both jurisdictions signed agreements regarding mutual enforcement of arbitral awards recognition and enforcement of judgments, mutual taking of evidence, mutual assistance in court order interim measures in 2019, and most recently in 2020 regarding mutual recognition and assistance in insolvency proceedings. Going beyond the areas of mutual legal assistance, we can witness even more cooperation carried out between the two jurisdictions. The Regional Trade Agreement, SIPA, which was signed in 2003, provides a major framework for the liberalization of markets between mainland China and Hong Kong in various areas, including trading goods, trading services, and investment facilitation. Mainly China provides more preferential treatment for Hong Kong as compared with the legal framework that were provided by the WTO. More important initiatives that was put forward in the last few years, in particular, the Great Bay Area. Hong Kong is increasingly integrated into a GBA. The GBA helps to consolidate and enhance Hong Kong's status as international financial, transportation, and trade centers, promotes the development of its professional services and innovation and technology industries, and establish a center for international legal services and dispute resolution in the Asia Pacific region. This can be further evidenced by the latest developments that an international mediation intergovernmental organization will be set up soon in Hong Kong. Against this background, our discussion today are most meaningful in helping us to have full understanding of the major cross border issues that we face in the process of economic integration and legal harmonization. I would once again thank all of you for your contributions to this wonderful event. I would like to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues, uh, Shelby, Flora, and, and many other colleagues, I think, for their hard work. And we look forward to seeing you all in the near future. Thank you very much. <laughs>